going on everybody and welcome to this course where we are going to be learning how to build out awesome websites with Django from the ground up. So we're going to start as absolute beginners where I'll first introduce you to what Django is and how it works. And then we'll move on to building out a basic website where we'll spin up a server, we'll render some templates and add a database to that. And we'll even learn how to work with that database. So we'll add in things like authentication and search and we'll really focus on the core features of Django and how things work. Now, in the second half of this course, what I'm gonna do is take the same project and we're gonna start adding features into it and turning this into a really cool application. So I'm about to demo this for you in a second, but this project is kind of like a Discord clone and a search engine for people that want to study and find other people to study with. Now, it's not specific for developers, but uh, imagine that you want to, uh, let's say, study Django. So you can go ahead and create like a chat room. People can find this chat room and then join in and communicate with you. So with that being said, let me just go ahead and demo the project and then we'll talk about the core structure and how things will continue from here. Okay, so this is the project that our website will eventually turn into as we progress through the course here. So if you actually want to see a live version of this website, go to studybud.dev and you can check it out and actually see the site for yourself here. So in this website, we have a basic feed here of different study rooms. So we can see this list right here. It kind of looks like a social networking feed where you just see post. Anybody here can create a room here. They can set up a topic here and they can see their room posted out here. So let's say I go to this website and I see this room right here and I wanna learn about Vue here. So Vue is an awesome front end framework, so I wanna check it out. I can see how many people have joined. I can see five people there and when it was posted. So the host here is Praveen, so I can see his profile. So the host does get credit for sharing the room. I can click on this room and I can see the conversation. So. On the right side, I see all the participants here and I can see the chat room right here. So this is supposed to kind of look like Discord here. So uh, it's like a Discord server where anybody can hop in and they can just message something and I'll just say anyone here. So I'll ask a question, see if anyone's on and my message appears right here. So it tells me when it was posted, anybody can click on my account and they can view my profile. So we'll go back to the homepage here and on the side here, we have multiple ways of searching. So we have a search bar here where I can just say uh, C sharp, for example, I wanna see if any topic or any room has this topic or uh, maybe has C sharp in the title. So if I type that in, I can see C sharp developers right here. So I can clear my search here. I can use this search bar or I can go in here and just search for all the topics with Python here. I can see all the designers and so on. So this is going to filter my rooms down by the topic and it's also going to filter down the activity feed so just to create more engagement on the website i thought it would be cool to add in this activity feed here so you see how i just commented something well i added this in where we can always see activity based on certain rooms here so i can see that dennis replied to Vue.js developers and here is my message so it creates a little bit more engagement here so that's pretty much the application here. So anybody can go and view my, my profile here. I can see all of my posts here. So if I go to someone else's account, I can see their post. We can modify our application. We can go here, upload pictures here, and it's, I'm a little bit too zoomed in, so that's why it looks like that. So we can edit our account. There is authentication, so we can log out here, log back in or register, and we are good to go. So that's essentially the site here. So we're gonna start from the beginning and this is what the project will morph into. So we're gonna learn a lot throughout this process. Let's take a quick look at some of the things you should understand before taking this course. So the first thing is, is you should have a basic understanding of the Python syntax. So things like variables, if and else statements, functions, loops, classes. If you know these things, then that's enough to move on with Django. As far as the front end, you should have a basic understanding of HTML and CSS. We are going to be working with templates here. So if you don't know HTML at all, well, it's going to be pretty difficult here. We won't write too much. We are just going to install a theme, but you will need to understand what's going on in order to install that theme. So those three things, Python, HTML, CSS, and you should be good to go. So before we get started, since this video does not have an official sponsor, I guess I'll be the sponsor here and tell you about my new Django course that recently went public where I cover Django from A to Z in 19 hours. So in this course, I go into detail on a lot more topics. I cover certain topics that we don't address here. So if you want to become a better Django developer and enhance your skills, 
go ahead and check that out. There is a promo code in the video description for 50% off. So it's going to be $9.99 and use a promo code Brad. Now, this course from the first month that it was launched on Udemy also. So I have it on my own platform and on Udemy. This was a top seller immediately. So there's a lot of good reviews on it. People really like this course and are learning a lot from it. So definitely check that out. Okay, so before we get started, I just wanna run through a couple of slides here, get you introduced to what Django is, and then we'll move on to setting up our environment. So what is Django? So Django is a Python-based web framework, and it is a backend framework, so it's on the server side. And this just means that we can use Python to build websites. So Python is one of the top programming languages. Django is one of the top frameworks for Python. It's actually the number one used framework. So it's an absolutely great choice, great for beginners and it makes for building websites super fast. I absolutely love it. So it is more of a heavyweight framework, so it uses a batteries included approach, and that means that it really is more opinionated in how you build out your application, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, we'll get into that later, but with this, you get more packages, libraries, and modules, and you follow a good design structure, where uh, in Python, a lightweight framework might be something like Flask, and some people may like it because it's not opinionated, but because of that, you're typically installing a lot of packages yourself. If you're newer, you may not follow the best design structure. So you may not have a good, I guess, framework or structure in how you're building your application. So the fact that Django really forces you to do things a certain way, I think is a great thing. And it does not mean that you cannot customize it. Companies customize this all the time. A lot of big organizations that have great engineers completely bend Django to their will and how uh, they actually want things structured. So, uh, if I were to compare Django to another framework for another language, I'd probably say it's more like Rails, Ruby and Rails. Um, with PHP and Laravel, it's more like Laravel, whereas Flask is more like uh, Express for Node.js. And I'm trying to think of another one. I'll just use that one as the last reference, but it's more lightweight. One, you can do whatever you want. Django kind of forces you to do things a certain way, but I think that's a great thing, especially if you're newer to web development. So it uses the MVT design pattern. A lot of people may have heard of MVC, Model View Controller. For Django, it's Model View Template, and we'll get into that in a minute. So what is a web framework? So for those of you that don't even know what this is, a web framework is simply a collection of modules, packages, and libraries designed to speed up web development. So it's just kind of like a package, if you can think of it in one way, where you're not having to use Python code to do absolutely everything it really pre-configures a lot for you and is designed for one specific purpose, in this case, for building websites. So uh, I would strongly advise against you hand coding absolutely everything by yourself. So it's gonna make things a lot easier. So backend frameworks versus front-end frameworks. Uh, I already mentioned Laravel, but on the left side there, we have our backend frameworks. We have PHP, which is the language, Laravel or Laravel, however you say that, that's the framework. For Python, we have Django. There's also other ones for Python, obviously. I mentioned Flask. For Node, we have Express. So you have the language and the framework. Now, there are front front end frameworks, so client side. Uh, these actually work well with our back end languages. So uh, we have React, Angular, Vue. Uh, I actually used Angular and Vue with Django. So they're not in competition to each other, they handle different parts. Front end frameworks handle all the front end logic typically. Uh, we would probably build out some kind of API to connect to one of these, and that's how we would communicate. It doesn't mean that we need a front-end framework. Django has its own uh, templating engine, but if you wanted to use a front-end framework, that would absolutely work. So what can you build with Django? So this is one of my favorite topics here because I like to just show the companies that use Django and let them validate the power of what Django can do. So uh, if I were to mention a few things myself, I would say an e-commerce website, a social network, uh, you can build out an API for a mobile app. Now, Django can't actually build a mobile app for you. You can use part of Django to build one, though. So if you want to provide some API data, uh, you can do it. That's a topic for another day. So uh, in these companies, we have Pinterest, we have Spotify, Udemy, Dropbox. All of these companies should validate whether Django is the right choice for you or if it can do what you desire it to do. So this is pretty much showing that it can do pretty much anything. Doesn't mean that it's always gonna be the best option, but it can do a lot. I know Instagram relied heavily on Django in the beginning. Um, I'm not sure what version of it they use or how much they've customized it, but I know a lot of these companies uh, used it at some point and probably modified it to whatever they needed. Now, YouTube, 
I can't really confirm whether YouTube used it or not. And the reason why I put it here is because I read a lot of articles on uh, YouTube using it. A lot of people saying that they did, but I couldn't find anything that validated it. So I put it here just to say that there's a chance that they used it, but this is something that you can build with Django. So there's no reason why you couldn't build something like a YouTube website or a YouTube like website. So building APIs, a lot of you might be wanting to learn Django just to learn how to build out APIs. And that's totally fine. If you want to build out a mobile app or use some kind of front end framework, you need some API data. Django makes this absolutely easy. They have something called the Django REST framework, which is built on top of Django. And the REST framework helps you build REST APIs or just APIs. So this makes this really fast. Absolutely love it. We'll get into this towards the end of the series. I'm super excited for this part. So I did want to mention some other frameworks before we get started, uh, just to kind of let you do your own research. I mentioned Flask earlier. It's a Python based web, web framework. It's more lightweight. I would recommend you check it out. I personally think Django is much better. I don't see why you'd want to use Flask, but uh, in some cases it could be useful. Cherry Pie, Web2Pi and Pyramid. I've never used those, but I would say check it out, do your research. But I really think the competition here, if there is any, is between Django and Flask here. I wouldn't probably even mention the other three, but still don't take my word for it. Do your own research. So the MVT model structure or design pattern. So Django follows the MVT structure. There's a model view controller structure, which a lot of you from other frameworks may be familiar with. Uh, Django follows the MVT. And the only difference here is that Django takes care of the controller aspect of things. So for those of you that are completely new, MVT, we have model, the data access layer, that's your database, that's how we model data. This is gonna be your database tables built out in classes, your templates, that's your presentation layer. This is what the user sees, that's gonna be their page, their web page. And then the view is the business logic. So if you were to look at an example here, we have facebook.com, and when someone goes to facebook.com, they're gonna be going through some URLs here. We're gonna find a URL that matches some kind of function in the back end, and that's gonna be our views. Those views right there in the view layer, that's gonna go ahead and get some data probably from the models, and it's gonna render some kind of template to us, and we send that back to the user. So that's the flow here. We're requesting data, the views of business logic, and we just get this and send it back to the user. So that's the MVT design pattern, very similar to MVC. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We'll start setting up our environment and in the video after that, we will start setting up our project. Okay, so let's first start off with some helpful resources for this course as you go along with the tutorial here. So the first thing is, is the source code. So that is up on GitHub. It's in this link right here and it will be linked down in the video description. So I would highly recommend you clone this project, check out the source code and review the code as you're coding along and look through areas where you have any questions. All the code here will be what I coded up throughout the tutorial. Now, uh, if you wanna clone it and set it up locally, there will be instructions in the readme file on how to do that. So that way you can get a feel for the project and use it, maybe tinker with the actual source code and just see how it all works. So after the source code, I would highly recommend you use the Django documentation. I will reference this throughout the tutorial, but Django has some of the best documentation I've ever seen and I would highly recommend you use it. Now, I understand that it could be intimidating for people uh, just to start with the documentation, so that's why you're watching a tutorial like this, so I can guide you, but once you have a question on maybe how something works or specifics, reference the documentation, please. It will help you a lot. So let's go ahead and close that out, and let's talk about my environment setup. So I'm gonna be using VS Code. You can use whatever text editor you want. If you have Atom, uh, Sublime Text, even Notepad++, any one of those will work, but I like VS Code. So if you're using VS Code, I wanna show you my setup, the theme, and some extensions that I will be using. So uh, if you're not using VS Code, I still want you to watch this because I am using some extensions that are gonna change up how things function. So I wanna make sure you see that and understand why it's happening. So. Uh, Atom One Dark Pro is the theme I'm using. So if you want to use the theme, everybody asked me about it, uh, go ahead and use Atom One Dark Pro. It's a really cool theme. And for some reason it's not set here right now, but that is what I'm using. So that's the theme. And I'm also using an extension called Prettier. So Prettier is really cool because it auto formats my code here. So if I use the Prettier code formatter, 
this right here will basically format my code anytime I save it. So if I write out some HTML code and it's not perfectly formatted, if I hit control S or save, you'll see my code just kind of jump into place. So when you see my code jump like that, it's because of prettier. It really helps me. It's absolutely amazing. I love it. I'm also using something called auto rename tag. So auto rename tag, this basically allows me to rename a opening tag and the closing tag will also rename. So it's auto renaming it. So if you look at this example right here, uh, when this tag gets renamed, you see the closing tag get renamed and it goes vice versa if you rename the closing tag. So you're not gonna see me edit both HTML tags as I go through that. So that's it. I would recommend you check out the documentation, the source code. These are the extensions that I have. If I forget at any point, I'll try to mention those throughout the uh, course. And let's go ahead and get on with installing our project and setting up our uh, Python download and Django installation. Okay, so before we get started here, I first wanna make sure that you have Python installed on your computer. And if you already have it installed, I also wanna make sure that you have the most up-to-date or compatible version of Python in order to work with Django here. So if you already have Python installed, what you could do is simply go ahead and update it to the latest version. That way, once you're installing Django, it's gonna make sure that you have the latest versions of both and those two should be compatible. Now, if you don't wanna update it, maybe you need Python in a specific version or you think it's up to date, uh, just go ahead and go to this link right here in the Django documentation. Uh, just look up Python Django compatibility if you can't find this link and it should show you this section right here. And this simply tells us the version of Django that's compatible to specific versions of Python. So. At this point in time, the latest version of Django is 3.2, and this is compatible with Python 3.6 all the way to 3.9. So these are the latest versions. If you're watching this video maybe a year or two out, you might wanna check this. Uh, maybe just make sure that you're either in the latest versions or that whatever you're using is compatible. So I already have Python 3.95 downloaded, so I'm good to go. Uh, but if you're wanting to update or download for the first time, go to python.org and then go ahead and click on the downloads link. And in here, go ahead and download the installer. Make sure you get whatever you need for your operating system and then go ahead and click on that installer. I'm not gonna do this because I already have it, but this should take a minute or two maybe just to go through and install Python or simply update it. So once you have that complete, let's go ahead and move on to the next step here. So my entire project is gonna be on my desktop and I am using a Windows machine. So let's go ahead and open up our command prompt here. So Later on, I will switch to VS Code, but just to get things started, I'm gonna use the command prompt and you can host your project wherever you want, but I'm gonna host mine on my desktop. I cleared it for everything and I just wanna make sure everything's here so it's easier. So we're on our desktop and if you just downloaded Python or you wanna check the version, go ahead and do that. That's gonna tell you the version of Python. In my case, I have Python 3.95, I'm good to go. And let's go ahead and hit exit. So at this point, we'll clear that terminal. Uh, what we could do is go ahead and just install Django globally. So if I do pip install Django, this is gonna install Django on my computer. Now, I like to use a virtual environment in theory. You don't actually need one, but it's really good practice to use them. It's gonna separate all your installs from your global machine or uh, any other environments that you have, and that way there's not gonna be any conflict. So uh, you can skip this step and go ahead and install Django directly, but I'd recommend you follow this. And we're gonna use uh, virtual env, so we'll do pip install virtual env. So I always have a hard time spelling that one for some reason. Okay, so I already have it installed. It tells me I'm good to go. There's also a pip env that you can use. So this is just a package that allows us to set up virtual environments. So virtual env is installed, and now I can just run the command virtual env, and I can call my environment whatever I want. In my case, I'm just gonna call it env. You can call this my env or whatever name you want. And because I'm running this from my desktop, so make sure that wherever you're running this from, you know that file path, go ahead and hit enter, and that's gonna create your environment. So this should take a second. So on my desktop, I can now see this file right here, or this folder. So I'm pretty zoomed in, you should be able to see that. So we have a folder called ENV and that's our virtual environment. We're not gonna open it up, we're not gonna deal with it. The only thing we're gonna do here is go ahead and activate it. So make sure the file path is there and on Windows, I can just do ENV scripts. So whatever I call the environment, scripts, and then we'll just do activate. 
So on a Mac, it might be a little bit different. Just look up the difference here. It's not too much. Um, I don't remember exactly what that was, but we just activated our virtual environment. So now we're inside of here instead of our global machine. Now we know it's activated because we can see the environment name right there and we can always deactivate our environment. So we can just do deactivate like that. That's going to turn it off. So now you don't see that right there in the file path and we can reactivate. Now, the reason why I show you that is because I've had people set this process up and then turn off their computer, log back in and they don't know why Django or all the commands aren't working. That's because they forgot to turn on their environment. So every time you open this up, you're gonna to have to turn on the environment because all the installs and other packages that we set up will be in here if you set this up here like this. So now let's go ahead and clear that. So we created the environment, it's active right here. Make sure you run that script and let's just do pip install Django. So that's all we need to do. And this is gonna take a second or two. It's gonna install Django for us. We can do this now because we have Python installed. Let's see, maybe I need to hit enter again. So that's gonna take a second here, so give us some time. Okay, so we have Django installed. And at this point, it looks like everything's successful. So if you're seeing this, we're good to go. We have Django and at this point, I'm just gonna clear this again. So we'll do CLS and I'm gonna do Django-admin. So now that I install Django, I have access to this command. If I hit execute or enter, I'm gonna see all these commands that I can now run from Django-admin. And in here, we're gonna focus on a few here. So the main ones that we're gonna see are gonna be make migrations, migrate. These are commands that we're gonna work with or use to work with our database. We're gonna use run server. That's gonna start up our development server and we're also gonna use start project or start app and start project. So we now have access to this. We know Django is installed. So let's go ahead and clear this again. And now let's go ahead and just do Django dash admin and we'll do start project. So once we do start project, we need to give our project a name. So let's go ahead and call it study bud. You can call it whatever you want. So this is gonna be the project name and what this command is gonna do is it's gonna create my boilerplate files to set up my Django application. So it's gonna give me my core configuration and basically my project here. So once I run this on my desktop, we're gonna see study bud right here and we can see our virtual environment. So these are the two things that we created and we're gonna go through the Django files in a second here. But at this point, if you're running this from your command prompt, just go ahead and CD into study bud. So CD into your Django project. We'll look at the files in a second. And now let's just go ahead and run python manage.py run server. So we're gonna start up the Django development server and we're gonna take a look at what we currently have. So at this point, it looks like we're all good. We see this, this note right here that tells us we have unapplied migrations. We'll get to that once we start working with the database. And we also see that we are currently running on port 8000 right here. So we can go ahead and just copy this so on the command prompt, it's a little bit harder. I can highlight that. And I typically have to go to this bar right here and hit edit and then copy. So you could just write that out manually, but once you have that copied, uh, you can just go ahead and open up your browser and paste that into the browser. One thing I like to do is paste it in. And I also save that as a tab so I can always hit this shortcut here. So I could do this manually like that. Or if I open up a new tab, I hit that shortcut and there we go. So I like to save it there. So every time I'm working with it, I'm not having to copy and paste. So we just started up our Django server and this is the project that we currently have. So we actually have something running right now. We have a server on and the boilerplate configuration that Django gives us. So if you see this, we're good to go so far and we can move on to the next step here. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and actually close that out. So I turned off my server, we'll have to refresh that. And everyone can store their environment in a different way. What I like to do here is take the virtual environment and drag that into my Django project. So I'm gonna open up my text editor. So in this case, I'm using VS Code. If you're using something else, you'll still just use the command prompt uh, unless it's already built into the text editor. In VS Code, it's already built in. So at this point, we'll go ahead and open up the folder. We'll go to the desktop and let's just go ahead and go to the project files. So we see study bud and we see all our boilerplate files along with the virtual environment I just dragged in. So I like to have it in here and if I open up the terminal, we could open it up by just going to terminal right here and do a new terminal, or we could do a shortcut by just hitting control and then tilde. So it's that weird back tick looking thing on 
the top left of your keyboard typically. So go ahead and uh, open up your terminal that way. So at this point, my virtual environment is already activated by default. You might have to run env scripts activate. In this case, the file path is inside of the project folder. So here we see it and it's activated. So make sure that you do that and that's all set up. So I'll turn on my server right now again. So we'll do python manage.py and then run server. And if my face is blocking it, we'll uh, go ahead and move that. So we just ran run server and yeah, that was all the commands. So it just blocked that last part there. So we see these unapplied migrations. We're not worried about those right now. It's not going to give us an error. We'll go back to that server, refresh it, and we're still good. So let's do a quick breakdown. I'm not going to go into too much detail in my full Django course. I really try to break down as much as I can here, but we'll just go over the core Django files here. So Python manage.py or the manage.py file, this is where we execute our commands from. We're not going to touch this. Uh, that's something that allows us to execute those commands. We do get a default database with Django. So SQLite is a default database. In production, you typically use something like MySQL, Postgres. You can even use no SQL databases uh, with Django, but we're gonna stick with uh, the SQLite database here. So we're not going into the virtual environment here. That's our different file. Inside of our project, we're gonna see some more here. So we have a WSGI file. This stands for Web Server Gateway Interface right here. This is the actual server. And then we have a URLs.py file. So this is gonna be all the routing, the URL routing to our project. So when you go to a specific, uh, specific page, so if you're going to the home page or the about page of a website, this is where we configure all the URLs here. So this is gonna be just a list of different URL paths like this. So one would be something like home and then you'd have about and so on. So it's just a Python list of URL routes. So that's how that's gonna be configured later on here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of that comment right there. So we'll save that. Then we also have a ASGI file. This is gonna be for asynchronous, um, I guess uh, asynchronous calls here. We can actually change that up. Django does have async support. We won't deal with that. And at this point, the main file that we're gonna work with is gonna be settings.py and URLs.py. So settings.py is like our core project configuration. This is like the command center to our entire project. If we go through it, I'm not going to go to every single item, but here we have things like all the URLs that are allowed to go to this website or to point to it. We see all installed apps, which we're going to get to. We see all middleware configuration, templates, database configuration. For example, we see the database and this is pointing to the base directory, which is the root directory right here and it's pointing to the SQLite database. So this is how we can actually see how it's connecting to everything. So we have templates, databases, URLs, and everything like that inside of our application along with static file configuration. So think of settings.py as the core project configuration. Okay, so now we actually wanna work on rendering some things out and changing that default template that you saw where we're just getting that boilerplate file in Django once we see our server. So. In Django, we are going to work with something called apps here. So we already see default apps configured. There are apps that handle different parts of our application, things that handle uh, sessions in our inside of our application, user management, and so on. And basically, apps are little components of our website that handle different parts of a website. Now, imagine it this way. So if you had something like Facebook.com, imagine that was built by or built with using Django, uh, you would have an app for handing, handling all your users. Then you can have an app for handling uh, all the groups inside of Facebook. You can have an app for handling all user posts. So these are just broken down into different parts. Now the application that we're gonna have here is not gonna be that big. So we're just gonna stick to one app. And this app is where we're gonna configure all of our models, which is our database, all the URL routing and all the views that are gonna handle uh, basically the business logic of our application. So done talking just wanted to give you that overview let's go ahead and move on so in order to create our first app here we're going to go ahead and uh, you could open up another command prompt or another terminal if you're using the command prompt or you could just go ahead and hit plus here that way we're not turning off our server and we're just going to open up a new terminal and then run a command here so we're just going to do python manage.py start app so just like the start project command, we can now run start app, and this is gonna be able to create an app for us. And I'm gonna call this base, it's gonna be like our base application. So we're just gonna hit enter. 
and we're gonna see a folder get generated in here. So at this point, the Django project doesn't actually know about this app yet, so we're gonna have to connect it. All it is is a folder inside of our Django project. So inside of base, we see our views, and this is basically what happens when someone goes to a specific URL. These are gonna be functions or classes, and these are gonna fire off things like uh, any kind of queries to the database, any templates that we need to render. This is what's gonna be called when someone goes to a specific URL. So those are gonna be our views. We have our models.py file. This is where we're gonna configure the database and then different parts like our admin panel and core app configuration. So let's go ahead and go back to the main project file. So study button here and let's go back into settings.py. So we need to let this project know about this new app that we just added. So inside of installed apps, what we could do is we could just go ahead and add in base like that and it will know about this folder here. Now, what I like to do is I like to specify the direct file path to configure it to the app. So what I'm gonna do is go into base, we'll go into apps here, and this is going into the base folder. So pay attention to the file structure. We're going into the apps.py file and we're going to the base config class. So this is gonna connect it to the app directly. So we're just gonna go ahead and do dot base config. And now this project right here knows about this new app that we just added. So I'll just go ahead and install some defaults that VS Code wants me to install. Run that installation, we'll close that out. And there we go. So now Django knows about our app. So let's talk about our URL routing and our views. So typically all of our views are gonna be handled inside of the views.py file from that app that we created. So I wanna show you a quick shortcut because I wanna show you how this logic works. So let's go ahead and go into urls.py. So this is our core URLs file. Now we can have multiple URLs files here. Uh, we're gonna actually use just two here. We're gonna have a root URLs file and then one for our specific app. So to create a view, we're gonna use function based views here. So we're gonna create a function and we're gonna call this home and let's go ahead and pass in the request object. So the request object is gonna be the HTTP object. This is gonna tell us what kind of request method is sent, what kind of data is being passed in, what's the user sending to the backend here. So we have a request object, which we'll print out and show you later. And then what we need to do is simply return something. At this point, I'm just gonna return back a simple HTTP response. We're not actually gonna render a template yet. So we'll just do from django.http import HTTP response. That's a capital H and a capital R. So we're just gonna return back a simple response here. So we're just gonna go ahead and say home page. So it's just gonna be a string that we're gonna render out. And now we're going into our URLs and we're gonna say when someone goes to the home page, so we're gonna set a path here. So that's imported right here. We're gonna set a path here and then the home page is gonna be the root domain. You can see a path right here. We have an admin file. We're not gonna work with that yet. So when someone goes to the home page, which is an empty string, so that means that that's just a core URL, we're gonna send that user to home. So we're gonna trigger this function and that's it. So we're just gonna tell it which function we're gonna trigger and we're gonna return back this HTTP response. So we'll go ahead and save that. And let's open up our website. So now when I refresh this, we don't have that default, we see the home page. So that's a simple HTTP response right here. So we'll zoom in a little bit and there we go. Now I wanna show you one more page. So we'll create another function. Typically we won't create our views here. I'm just doing this for practice. And uh, let's just say, let's see, what's another route we're gonna do? We're gonna do rooms. So our website is gonna have rooms. So we're gonna have rooms for different conversations. We're gonna pass in the request object and this is gonna return a specific page for a room. So we'll just go ahead and do return and we can pass in HTTP response and we'll just say room like that. Now, in order to specify the path, we would specify it like that, set the route. So we're gonna have a few parameters. This one is gonna be the route that we're going to. So we'll just do room forward slash and then the function that we wanna call. So. In this case, because we're using function-based views, it's just gonna be a function. We'll throw in the room function. Now, if we go to this route, you can guess it, it's just gonna return back that call. So we can go to forward slash room, and I accidentally added in an extra parameter, and there we go. So we have a room, and we have a home page. So views 
trigger or URLs trigger views. And that's what the user gets back in return. That's going to be an HTTP response. That's going to be a template or when we're setting up our API, it's going to be a JSON response. So this isn't the best practice. If we create a really big project, it would be really messy to have all our views here and our URL patterns, because there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of logic in these views. There's going to be a lot of functionality and this is going to get really messy. And this is why Django creates apps for us and they give us a structure to separate all of our code. So let's go ahead and take these two views. We'll copy those, we'll remove them. I'll remove HTTP response, save that. And then let's go into our app, which is base. And let's go to views.py. So in views.py, we are gonna paste in the home page or the home view and this room view right here. Now, this isn't gonna work. So we have our functions right here and this file doesn't know how to call those. So what we're gonna do is we're going into our app and we're gonna create a URLs file just for this app. Remember, if our project gets really big, we're gonna have to have different apps. So we want a URLs file just to handle all the routing for this app. So let's create a URLs.py file. So this will be our app URLs file and this will be our root directories URLs file. So this is gonna be for a full project this is gonna be for a specific app. So in here, let's go ahead and make a quick import. So we first wanna import the path function. That's what triggers these URLs right here. So we'll actually remove them and we wanna make this import. So from django.urls, let's import path. So from django.urls import path. So we have the path function. And in here, because the views are gonna be in their own file, they're in the same folder. So we see views and URLs. Let's go ahead and go into that file. So we'll do from dot, and then we'll import views. Okay, so now we need a list called URL patterns, and we're gonna specify all the URL paths that a user can go to. So we're just gonna go ahead and go, go to URL patterns or add URL patterns, set that to a Python list. And we're gonna set the routes here. So we're gonna use the path function right here. And the path function can take in three parameters at this point. So we're gonna specify the direct path. So for the home page, it's gonna be an empty string. We can leave it like that. Then we need to go into the views file here. So we're going into views and we need to get the home view. So we'll do views.home. And then we can actually give our view a name and we'll talk about why this is good later, but uh, we're just gonna call this home. So later on, we can actually reference a view or a specific URL by its name. So that's gonna be convenient and it's gonna make things more dynamic. So we have our home page, and we also want a room page. So we'll just do room forward slash and we'll do views dot room. And we also wanna give it a name. So we'll just go ahead and do room. And there we go. So we always wanna add in a closing comma there and make sure that's correct. And now we have our two views, which we also need to import HTTP response because that's gonna give us an error. So from django.http, import HTTP response. Okay, so that error is gonna go away. And look at this. So we have two views and we have two URLs. And if I go to the page here, so let's go to the home page and let's check this out. If I click on this, we're gonna get an error. So what's happening here is we have not configured our URLs to the app's URLs file. So what's happening is we have all these URLs and we see some kind of error. Let's actually fix this first. So we have home, what's going on here? Maybe I didn't save the root URLs file here. So let's try that one more time. We'll save this one and we're gonna save this one. So it looks like everything should be good now. Let's try that one more time. So we'll go to the website. And now we have the default Django template that Django already has prepped for us. So what's happening here is we have two URLs, but Django does not know about these. So we need to go back to our URLs file and we're gonna include or import a function called include. And then we're gonna tell Django, when we go to the website, this file is gonna handle all the core URL routing. But instead of adding all the URLs in here, we're gonna create a path here. And this is gonna be an empty string. So every URL that matches an empty string, go ahead and use the include function. So we'll do include and send the user to base and then URLs. So we're going to the base app and we're going to the URLs file. So let this URLs file take care of all the routing. So the user is gonna to go to this page, it's gonna match this route, then it's gonna to go to this URLs file 
and these routes will be matched. So I hope that makes sense. So now if I go back here, it's gonna remove the default Django template and now we can go to room. So it's actually a lot faster than that typically. I'm just doing a lot of explaining, but we just configured all of our URLs and our views and now we're ready to render out some real templates. So let's talk about templates. So we have simple HTTP responses and these aren't dynamic. We can't add our own HTML to that. Uh, there is a way to do it, but it's gonna be very messy. So let's go ahead and add our templates. So in order to add templates, we're just gonna go into our main project files here and let's just go ahead and add in a new folder. So we're just gonna add in a folder called templates and this is where we're gonna store our templates and there's a few ways to configure these so we'll talk about that in a second here. So we'll go ahead and uh, pay attention to the file path. So now it's in the same directory as the app. So in here, let's create a template called home.html. So now we can actually write some HTML code and we won't worry about the HTML semantics just yet. So we'll add in an H1 tag and we'll say home template and that's gonna be it for now. And we also wanna add in a room.html and we'll just do H1 and we can do room template. So now we can actually add in markup instead of rendering out a simple response. We have two templates and we need to return these inside of our views. Now, the first thing we need to do is let Django know about this templates folder. It doesn't know that this exists yet. So we're going back into our uh, main project folder in settings.py and we need to go into templates here. And this is where we're gonna let Django know that we have a new folder for our templates and it's gonna tell it where to look. So we're gonna use a variable called base dir that stands for base directory and it's set right here. And this just sets the file path back to the base directory of our project. So it basically goes all the way back there so we can access any folder from that area. And we'll go back to templates. So we'll set base dir and we can just do forward slash and then we'll just do templates. So we're saying go back into the base directory and find the templates folder. And now Django knows we have templates in this specific folder. So in order to reference these templates, we need to go back to our views. We can actually get rid of our HTTP response. So at this point, we can use the render method. So this is imported by default. And the render method takes in two parameters that are needed and then one optional here at this point. And the first one is gonna be the request object. So that's gonna be the HTTP request. We need to pass that in to render. This is how we pass data back and forth. And then we're just gonna specify the template name. In this case, it's gonna be home.html. Now I can also do that for the room here. So we'll just go ahead and do render, pass in request, and we'll just do room.html. So that's how we know about the templates. Now, if we go back here, we see the room template and we see the home template. So now we actually render the templates and we can do a little bit more with it. So let's go ahead and remove the HTTP response. And I wanna talk about template inheritance. Now, just rendering a template isn't the best thing if we're uh, maybe adding in like a navigation bar. Imagine having to code in the navigation bar into every single template, adding in all those tags, all the styling. And then if we change out one link of the navigation bar, we're gonna to need to go back to all the templates and update every single template. So there's something called template inheritance and we can also include sections of templates inside of other templates. So let me show you what I mean by this. So we're going back into the templates folder and we're gonna create a file just to contain our nav bar. So this is gonna be our navigation bar and we're gonna call this navigation and all we're gonna do here is create a link here and this is gonna be a link to the home page, like a logo. So we'll just say href. That's gonna send the user back to the home page. We'll just direct it to a forward slash. And then we'll just say h1 and we'll say logo. So imagine this is our website logo. And we just wanna add in an h1 tag here. So we'll just do h1 or not h1 tag, but just an hr. So like a line break. And this will be our ugly navigation bar until we fix this. So this code needs to be seen on every single page. So what we could do is we can simply go into our home.html page and we can use a template tag and don't worry about these curly braces and percent symbols. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. So we can use these and at this point use two curly braces and two percent symbols and then write in include. So we're gonna add in include and then in single quotes, we're just gonna say nav 
bar.html. So we're gonna include this template inside of this template right here. So if I go to the home page, if I refresh that, now we see this logo. Now, if I go back to, or if I go to the room, we don't have it. So what I could do is just take the same template tag and I can move that to room and simply include it in the top section here. So I can refresh that. Now we have a home page and the logo up there. We have the full navigation bar and we can include this multiple times. So we can do something like this and that's just gonna add it in all throughout our template. Okay, so we need to go to room for that. I think I did that in the room page and there we go. So now we see that navigation bar. So we're including sections of templates. Now, what we could do is we can also talk about template inheritance. So instead of including it, what we could do here is go ahead and create a main template. So we'll do main.html. And this is gonna allow us to create like a wrapper around all our templates. So every single template that we have uh, by default, our application is gonna have different styles or a main theme and then different styles per page. And we wanna be able to simply include like one style tag and uh, little sections into our main theme of our website. And we want that to be displayed all over and simply uh, encaps encapsulate all the templates in our project. So let's go ahead and in main, .html, let's start typing out HTML and most text editors, if you start typing that out, it's gonna give you the boilerplate HTML. If not, you're just gonna have to write all this out. It's just a doc type, two HTML tags, a body tag, an opening and closing tag, and a head tag with some metadata. So let's go ahead and give it a title. So we'll just do study bud. And let's go ahead and remove the JavaScript file. We don't want that at this point. And we also don't need the CSS file because we don't have one yet. So we have our main template and this is the template that we want to inherit from or all the other templates to inherit from at this point. So in the body tag, what we need to do is we need to create these things called tags. And again, we'll talk about this syntax in a second, but let's go ahead and create a block. So we'll do block and then we'll say content. And then we're gonna need to close this block tag. So we'll just do end block. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell our website where to add all these child templates when we wrap a parent or another template in our website. So in our homepage, we're gonna have our main page and then all the homepage content will be in here. Then when we go to our uh, room page, all that content is gonna be inside of these two tags. So it's in, this, in a sense, just wrapping that content. So what this is doing for us right here is instead of having to include this navigation bar in home and then inside of our room page, I'm just gonna copy this, remove it, and then add this into main.html. So I want this at the top of my page inside of every page. So I'm adding that above my block tags. And now we have our main template and I can go into home here and I can simply extend that template. So instead of include, we're gonna use these tags here and we're just gonna do extends and we're just telling it which template are we extending. So we're extending main.html. Now in order for this content to be seen, we need to use these two tags right here. So inside of main.html, we need to specify where this content is inside of our template. So we're just gonna say block content and then we're just gonna do end block, end block like that. And then we'll just do content. Okay, so now not much is gonna change. We're still gonna see our navigation bar, but the nav bar is no longer inside of this template. We're no longer having to add it to every template, even though that was pretty simple to do. Uh, we just wanna be able to add it to our main template and that's it. We need it there once and that's gonna be good for us. So if I go in here, We'll refresh it. The room doesn't have the main parent template yet, but the home page does. So we see that the nav bar is inside of the main template and we see the home template underneath it. Now let's go ahead and add this to our room.html. So you might be using Django just to create APIs. Uh, so if you're not worried about the template syntax in theory, you could just go to databases and not worry about this, but a lot of people still use the Django templating engine. So we're gonna stick to that for now and make sure that we cover it. So We'll just do extends here and we can go into main.html. We're specifying the template that we're extending and then we need to wrap the child content. So we'll just do block content and we can do end block. 
Okay, so the nav bar is now only inside of main.html, but if I go to room, there we go. We see the room template and the home template. So that is including and extending a main template. So let's go ahead and actually pass in some data into the template. So how do we pass in data when we query a database? So first of all, I wanna talk about the Django templating engine here. So Django actually uses its own templating engine. It looks like Jinja. So uh, let's just do Django, wow, I can't spell. So Django template engine. And let's talk about tags here. So first of all, uh, I just wanna point out two main ones. We can add in variables. So inside of our template, we can pass in variables, any kind of data. And in order to do this, we just add in two opening and closing curly braces around the variable and that's gonna pass in the dynamic data. So if my first name is, and then whatever first name was, that's gonna get passed in the template and then last name. So variables are simply two curly braces. Now, we also have tags here. So there's different types of tags and this is basically a way of passing in Python-like logic into a template. So uh, at some point we might have to, or we will have to loop through data and pass out like a list of uh, rooms or users that we want to display. And these tags are simply a curly brace with a percent symbol like you saw. So there's different types of tags. So we can create for loops, if and else statements, and so on. So we can add in a lot of logic. So imagine that we have a user and we wanna change uh, like a hello message. So in this case, we're gonna check if the user is authenticated, go ahead and render the username, and then we have to close the end if statement. So in Python, you just have to write if, in the templating engine, we have to close that if statement. So we have different types of tags and filters and so on. So just think double curly brace or curly brace with percent symbols, and we're gonna work with a lot of built-in templates. So that's what we saw here. We're using like the include tag or the extends tag, and we're using those tags to add in dynamic data. So those are Django template tags there. We'll address those as we go. And at this point, let's go ahead and go into our view. So imagine that we have a view here that has some data. So at some point, we're actually gonna render some rooms. So let's create a variable, and this will be a Python list. And we're gonna have some rooms which will, which will just be dictionaries, or uh, they'll represent like objects. And each room, will have a, each room will have an ID. So we'll just have an ID and we'll start at one. And then we'll just have a name to that room and for this first one, let's just say, uh, let's learn Python. So our room is gonna be people posting these kind of requests. So we'll do let's learn Python, add in a closing comma after that, and let's just copy and paste this a couple times, and we'll just do two and three here. Okay, so for the next one, we'll just give it a name. I just wanna make sure that we have something here. So we'll just do design with me. And then we'll just do front end developers. So these are like Discord servers, I guess. So front end developers. Okay, so we want to be able to render this data out inside of the template. So inside of home.html. So let's close out the nav bar. We'll close out room and main and settings. And we want to render this out. So at this point, what we could do is go ahead and take rooms right here. So we have a variable, it's outside of the function, but it is accessible here and we can simply pass in a dictionary and specify the value name. So it's a key value pair, we can add in as many as we want, and we specify how we wanna address it in the template, and then we specify what we're passing in. So if I save that, now we have access to this list right here inside of the template. So this is passed into home, into home.html. So we'll go into home, and let's go ahead and just render this out. So we'll just create some kind of div for our main page and let's create a div that renders out all these items here. So we'll just do um, two curly braces. So we're creating a for loop. So this is gonna allow us to create it with a tag here and we'll just say for uh, room in rooms. And the difference here in uh, regular Python and in this templating engine syntax here, we'll just do end for. So we have to close it instead of just closing out or just writing a simple for loop. So we have to always close our for loops and our if statements. Now on each iteration, what do we wanna do here? So I'm just gonna create a div and if I can type this out, let's go ahead and on each iteration, we wanna pass in some kind of tag here. Let's just do an H5 tag and we wanna pass in the ID. So variables can be passed in with two curly braces 
and we can just do room. So we're getting the room object on each iteration and we're just doing dot ID and then we'll just do two hyphens and then we want to pass in the room name. So we'll just do room dot name. So we're accessing the dictionaries names right here or key value pairs. So if I save this, we can go ahead and refresh it. And there we go. So as I add data, we can render that out. So we pass that through the view and into the template. Now we could just pass it in directly like this. I like to create a context dictionary, so you can call it whatever you want. I just call it context and I set that value right here. And then I pass that in as the third parameter into the render function. So that passes in the data. Now, if I want to create an if else statement, I can go ahead and do that. So we can say something like, uh, age or something like that. And then we can say, if the age is a certain number, render this out, if not render something else out. And that's how it would work. So we'll actually see that in practice. So I won't show that in the demo. And I want to go ahead and show you a few more things with the templates here. So we created a templates folder for all the templates inside of our application. Now in the future, as I mentioned, we have different apps that handle different parts of our website. And what I like to do here is create a templates folder that represents every single template that is going to be available throughout the application or is not specific to a uh, part of our app here. So in this case, main is going to be available everywhere in our application. And so is the nav bar. Now home and room are going to be specific to the base app. Now, if this was a bigger application, this would be an app probably called uh, users and then rooms or something like that. Uh, we would separate it, but for now, let's go ahead and create a new folder inside of our app. So I'm showing you two different ways to do templates and the, I guess the reason to why you would separate them. So we'll create a new folder and we'll call this templates. Now, the weird thing about this is that Django requires us to create another folder inside of this templates folder. So, if I go ahead and do new folder, we're going to call this base. So it has to be named whatever your app is called. So if you call your app something else, make sure you have the app name, which is base templates, and then inside of templates, a folder with your app name. In this case, it's base. So it's a weird structure. Um, it's kind of confusing at first to some people, but there's a reason to why it's like this. Now inside of the templates folder inside of base, we're just going to go ahead and create a new file and we're going to call this home dot HTML. And we're just going to go into the home templates here from the root directory and just copy all of this and paste that into this new home dot HTML file. So we're just going to go ahead and delete home dot HTML from the root directories templates folder. And in order to actually work with this new template, all we need to do is go into the view and we need to specify the app now before and then forward slash. So Django tells us to do things this way. So let's make sure that template is connected. So if I refresh it, we're all good. And at this point, instead of deleting the content, we'll just go into the application. We'll go into the templates folder and we're going to copy room. We'll go into our app, into templates base, and we're going to paste that in here. And then we'll go into the root directories templates folder and we'll go into room and delete that. So don't let that confuse you. It's just this weird prefix stuff that Django does and they do it for a reason, but there we go. So now in order for room to work, we need to go into base forward slash room. So our app templates are inside of our app folder and our main templates are inside of the root templates folder. Okay. So now I also want to talk about dynamic URL routing. So how do we get a specific object of a uh, single room here. So for example, let's say I want to link this up here. I want to be able to click on this and then see information about a specific room. So at this point, the room really has no way of doing that. And the way we're actually going to set this up is by changing up the URL here. So what we can do is pass in a dynamic value here. So we're going to use two angle brackets and we're going to say str for a string and we're going to pass in a value name. So PK is going to be for primary key or ID. It really doesn't matter. Now this value could be an INT, so an integer or a slug, but a lot of people do like to actually have string values. I like to use it. So in this case, uh, I'm just going to do STR, even though I'm using a uh, integer here. So we're passing in the ID into the URL. Now inside of the view, we need to pass in another parameter here. So I can pass in PK right here. So now I have access to whatever value is inside of that parameter inside of the room here. So 
If I go ahead and save this, before I actually render the value out, now I can actually go to room. Let's go ahead and do room and then four slash one. So now this will work. So I can pass in a dynamic value and that'll change. So let's go ahead and go back to our main page and let's finish this up. So from our home page, uh, I'm just gonna add in a link here. So around each H5 tag, we'll add in an A tag and we're just gonna wrap this. So we'll make all of this clickable. Actually, let's just make the room ID clickable or the room name. So we only wanna wrap one section because later on I do wanna add in more links. So we're just gonna do href and then we'll go into forward slash room forward slash and then we're gonna pass in the variable of the room ID. So we'll just do room dot ID like that. And then later on we're actually gonna update this URL too. So we pass in the URL, it's gonna go ahead and set this value and pass in that value into the ID here. So if I refresh it, I can click on this, we see the room ID, if I go to three, we're seeing that value. Okay, so in order to actually get this value, later on we'll actually use this primary key to query the database, but for now we're just gonna use this variable and let's go ahead and actually write in this logic here. So we're just gonna set a value here and we'll just call this room, set that to none, so when we first go to it, it's not gonna have a room, then we're just gonna loop through the rooms value, so we'll do four i, in rooms, so that list of objects or dictionaries, and we'll say if i, and then because it's, an I, uh, because it's a dictionary, we have to access the values this way, so if i.id is equal to, let's see, pk, and I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure that's an integer, so we'll wrap that because I believe it might be a string, so this might not match. So if we find the current room, so we're gonna go ahead and loop through this list here, we're checking all the IDs, Whatever ID matches that primary key that's in the URL, we're just gonna go ahead, find it, and we're just gonna say room is equal to I. Then what we can do is simply set a context dictionary. So we'll do context, and that needs to be a Python dictionary, and we'll just say room, and we'll throw in room here. So we'll bring in context as the third parameter. Make sure you add that in right here paste that in and that should give us our room here. So now in the template, we can pass in the value into the room here. So let's just say, uh, we'll pass in a title, I guess. We'll just do room.name. Because that's passed into the template, we can access it this way. That's gonna be the H1 tag. So let's go to Let's Learn Python. There we go, it finds it. And we see front end developers and design with me. So we're able to get the values. now. I wanna show you how to get dynamic values from our templates here. So let's go ahead and change this up a little bit. So there's a reason why we added in a URL name here. So let's say that at some point we change this to room page or something like that. Like we wanna update it. What's gonna to have to happen is we're gonna to have to go into every single template or anywhere that we access this URL here and we're gonna to have to update all these values and that's gonna be really annoying. So what we can do here is we can update that value all we want, but we can specify or access this value by the name. So if this value doesn't change, then we don't have to update anything. So we can keep this as room name or room, it doesn't matter, but as long as this value is the same, we can keep accessing it that way and it's just gonna point to this URL here. So let's go into the homepage and instead of specifying the path here, so we're not having to update it, we're gonna use the URL tag. So it's a built-in tag into the Django templating or inside of the Django templating engine. And we're gonna specify the tag name, so URL, and then make sure that if you're using double quotes out here, you're using single quotes out here. And if you're using single quotes out here, you're using double quotes in here. So inside of URL, we're passing in the URL name. So that's this value. And we can pass in the dynamic value, so the room ID, I just wanna make sure that I'm not covering that. We're just gonna pass in room dot ID. So make sure that's outside of these quotes, but still in the URL tag. Now if I save this, we can go ahead and refresh it and that's gonna work here. So that tag is just gonna simply generate the URL based on that tag. So we don't write it out that way, but that's how it's seen because we have the tag name. So now if we happen to change that URL path, uh, we don't have to go ahead and update everything. So it's really convenient and it's uh, much faster to deal with things that way. So we just worked with setting up our application. We talked about views and URLs and we worked with templates. We rendered some data out in the templates 
And now what we want to do is actually set up a real database, which is going to be in our SQLite database. And we want to actually query the database and render data from the database out here. So we don't want to use this anymore. So let's go ahead and prep that. So at this point, we have our SQLite database. It's not prepped. It's just sitting there. It's an empty file and we want to work with that. So if I open this up here, we see this alert and it says we have 18 unapplied migrations in our application. Now inside of settings.py, we have apps in our project. So apps are simply, again, different parts of our application. And a lot of these apps have database sections. So basically we have like a database prepped. So we already have a couple of tables that are ready to be migrated. Like Jago builds out a user table for us. Uh, for authentication, they already build out a table to store session IDs, like if a user is logged in. So we have all these tables that Django has already prepped for us. Now, what happens is Django creates these migrations, and these are basically like SQL commands prepped and are ready to be executed. So they're ready to be activated, but they haven't been triggered yet. So once I run these migrations, these commands are going to be activated and they're going to build out all these tables which are inside of here. So we have sessions and then a couple of different uh, items in here and those tables are going to be built out. So we don't even have to configure these. Django is really good at setting this up for us and making this easy. Now we are still going to build out our own tables, but these are just the default ones that Django gives us. So all we need to do is run python manage.py migrate. So it's going to execute these commands. So we're going to see all these migrations being applied. And basically what just happened is that built out our database for us. So it executed those commands. And now if I run my server, so we'll do Python manage.py run server. So if we activate this, now we're no longer seeing those unapplied migrations. So the migrations that we had ready are officially applied and they're ready to go. So we want to add in our own tables and we'll see a few of those tables already. We're going to have something called a Django admin panel that lets us view our database uh, because we're not using like a production database. There are some uh, plugins and extensions that let you view the SQLite database, like the actual tables, but we don't really care about that. We're going to stick to the admin panel. And later on, if we want to use something like Postgres, we can use PG admin, some kind of interface to actually view all the tables and the rows and, and all the items inside of that database. So let's go ahead and close out settings here. We'll close out room.html. I guess we'll close everything. And inside of our app here, so the base app, let's go ahead and go into models.py. So models.py is where we're going to create our database tables. Now I do have a picture that shows you a representation of what a model is going to do. So I'll just go ahead and find that and then explain it here. So uh, I pulled up some pictures from that full Django course and Let's see, we want to work with models here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create Python classes. Now, the class that we create is going to represent the database table. So uh, in this example, let's say we had a project. This would create a table in the database called projects now or project. Uh, now, every single attribute inside of that Python class would represent a column inside of the database. So we would have an ID. We would have a title and a description. Now, every single time we create a new row in that table, that would be like an instance of a class and that's going to add in the row. So the table name or the class name is the table name. The attributes are the columns. So this is what it's going to create. It's a replication. It's in a sense, a model of a table. That's why they're called models. So this concept is not specific to Django. I've seen this in other frameworks here. So it's nothing new as far as the style. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first table we want to create is going to be our table for our room or actually, yeah, we want to create a room first. So we'll create a class here and we're going to create a room and I'm going to capitalize the R that's the tradition for classes and we're going to inherit from models. So this is what's going to change it from a standard Python class to an actual Django model. So we're going into models dot model and model is with a capital M. So there's going to be different attributes here. The first one is going to be the host, like the actual user that's going to be connected until we work with that. I'm going to go ahead and comment that out. We're also going to have a topic until we add that. I'm going to comment that out and we are also going to have a name. So this value I will add. So we're going into models 
dot char field. So it's a character field. And this is simply a text field. So I have to specify the attribute and what type of value is that attribute. So at this point, the character field takes in the value of max length or it needs this parameter. This is something that is required for this value. Now we can also add in a description. So we'll just go ahead and do description. So we'll do description here. And this is going to be models dot text field. So it's the same thing as a character field. In this case, it's just going to be a bigger text field. And what I want to do here is I want to specify a value of null and I'm going to set that to true. So by default, null is set to false. So if I don't set it to true, like a name here, it's set to false here. When what this means is that the database cannot have an instance of this model here without this value having something in it. So it can't be blank. Now, if I set null to true, it means that it can be blank. So saying null is allowed, so it's true. Now, we also have a parameter called blank here. And what this means is that when we run the save method, like when we submit a form, uh, that form can also be empty. So we're gonna set that to true. So this is for the save method. So when we're adding a form, and this is for the database. So we're gonna make sure these two values can be left blank. Maybe someone created a room and they didn't add a description, they wanna add it later. We wanna let them do that and we'll just uh, allow them to update that later. So we have a room or we have a name and description and we also want to add in later participants. So participants, I can never spell this name. I have to like sound it out in my head so I had to be quiet there. So we'll just do participants. I'm gonna comment that out. So what that's gonna do is store all the users that are currently active in a room. So if you comment in a room, you are now a participant, like in a Discord server, you get to join one. And we are gonna add in an updated value. So this is gonna take a snapshot of any time this model instance was updated. So anytime we run the save method to update this model or this specific table or the item, it's gonna take a timestamp. So in this case, we're doing models.date time field so we want the date and the time that it happened and we're going to do auto underscore now and this is going to be set to true so that means every time the the save method is called go ahead and take a timestamp we don't actually have to add in any value it's, it's going to do it itself django already has that built in now we also want to know when this was created so we're going to do created and this will be models dot date time field so it's the same thing as updated and in this case, we're gonna set auto underscore now, and we're, we're gonna do auto now add, excuse me one second. <clears throat> so we're gonna do auto now add, and we're gonna set that to true. So the difference between auto now and auto now add is auto now takes a snapshot on every time we save this uh, item right here. Now, auto now add only takes a timestamp when we first save or create this instance. So if we save it multiple times, this value will never change. It'll just be the initial timestamp. Whereas updated with auto now is going to take a timestamp every single time. And that's going to be very useful depending on how you want to organize and display data. So we want to know when a room was created and maybe every time it was updated and when the last time it was updated. So that's going to be it for our room model at this point. And we're going to create a string representation of this room. So we're going to do str and we're going to pass in self here. So it's a Python class. You should know this if you know Python. And we're just going to return back. Let's see, we'll just do self.name. So this does have to be a string value. So if you do a date or try to concatenate values uh, or any numbers, make sure you wrap around the string method like that. So at this point, name is going to be just like that and we're always gonna require it, so it should be good and we're ready to go. So when we add a model, we're gonna add a few more here. So when we add a model to the database, the first thing we need to do is make migrations. So we have this migrations folder and what it's gonna do essentially is basically create a file that's gonna have like a, a list of SQL commands and how to execute this and add it to the database. So we already uh, migrated our database so we executed built-in migrations and now we are making new migrations so we're just going to do python manage.py make migrations so it's one word so if i hit enter we're going to see a new file here a new one a new file or a new migration is going to get generated every single time so right now it's 001 next migration you're going to see another migration get created 
So here we go, we see this class right here and it's basically showing all the migrations that we're gonna apply and what to add to the database. So it's kind of like a staging area before we actually update the database. So once we make a migration, you're gonna have to do this every single time. So make migrations and then Python, let's see what's going on here, let's clear it. So we'll do Python manage.py migrate. So migrate will go into the latest migrations and it will execute those and then we're gonna see these migrations being applied. So we see apply all migrations and it's applying this migrations file, which is base 001 right there. So it applied those and now that table is in the database. Now let's say we wanna view this. So because we're not adding in any third party package to work with that SQLite database, we're gonna use the built-in Django admin panel. So if I go in here into the URLs file, so we'll go into study bud, into the root directories. Uh, if you go to this file right here, now that we have a database, you can go to that URL and see the built-in Django admin panel. So we'll go to port 8000. If you haven't saved that as a tab, go ahead and do that or just write that in and we'll go to forward slash admin. So here we have an admin panel and Django already has built-in authentication for us. And in order to log in, we need a user and this user specifically has to have admin level permission. So we're just gonna create this from the command prompt here. So we'll generate that user and then we'll make sure that we can actually see this data. So let's just go ahead and run Python manage and then we'll just do dot py create super user. So it's all one word. And by default, it's gonna follow the computer name here or whatever my username is on the computer. I'll just add in Dennis, and then we'll just do Dennis at email.com, and we'll specify some kind of password. So as you're typing it, it will start filling out, but it won't see it. So I'm typing it and you don't see it, that's for security reasons, and there we go. So the password was created or the user was added to the database. Now, my server is still on, so I have two different terminals open. And now I can go to the admin panel and it already has the password saved here. I have dummy passwords I use for tutorials. So we'll go ahead and click login. By the way, am I, is my face blocking the terminal? Okay, good, just thought I might be blocking it. So go ahead and add in the user credentials that you just made with that command. So we'll log in and here we go. So if I go into this admin panel, we are able to work with the database and actually see what we have at this point. So we have a groups table. We also have a users table, which shows us the user that we just created. We can add new users, so I can go ahead and create a user, add in the password, and that'll generate a new user. So I can actually deal with CRUD operations right now. Now, I do wanna build these into my own application, so I typically don't use this in a production environment. I build out my own interface. But if you wanna go ahead and start working with the database right away, it's really good for getting set up really quick. So we added in the room table here, but we don't see it. And the reason for this is that we technically don't have to use the admin panel. So in order to actually see these, what we need to do is go into admin.py inside of your uh, base app, whatever you called it, and let's first import our models. So they're in the same file path. So we'll go into from.models and we're just gonna import room. Now we need to register this model with the admin panel and we're basically saying uh, we're basically saying to the admin panel that we want to be able to view this item and also work with it in the built-in admin panel. So we'll just do admin.site.register. So we're registering it with the admin panel and we wanna specify the model that we want to register. So we'll throw that in. Now if I refresh it, now we see rooms. If I go in here, we see zero rooms. I can go to add room. And let's see, let's just do, let's learn JavaScript like that. We'll add in a few here. Um, I'll also add in a description. So we'll just do lorem ipsum. Just Google this up, grab some dummy text here, some kind of description to a room, paste that in. So I can also delete, I can save. Now we see that's added to the database. We'll add in a new one and let's just do 100 days of code challenge. And we'll just grab some more lorem ipsum text here. So click the dang calendar and there we go. So we have two items inside of that room table here. So now we added those, we're able to work with the CRUD operations and we want to be able to render these out inside of the list and also view the details. So 
We added those to the admin panel. Now we want to see those here. This is still that Python dictionary. So let's go ahead and update this. So we have the model now inside of the view here. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, actually I'll comment this out in a second. So before I do that, we'll just do from dot models. So we're in the same file path of views and models are right here and we're just going to import room. So first we import the model that we want to query. Now there is something called a model manager. So I'm going to set a value here. We're just going to do rooms and we can make queries by going into the model. So we'll just do room and then we have a model manager called objects right here. So I want to show you one more picture. I guess I'll show you two. So I also talked about this in the full course and this is how we can make queries to the database here. So let me move this picture because my face is kind of blocking it or I'll just shrink down the circle here. So we have a variable, we have a model name. So in our case, it's room. Then we go into the objects model manager. So we do dot objects and then we can specify what we want to get. So if we do dot all, it's going to query all the models or all the items inside of that database table. So we specify the method. Now there's a lot of methods here. We have get, we also have filter, which lets us filter data down. We'll work with that. We can also do exclude and that's going to filter items out in like a reverse order. So get right here is to get a single object, whereas all in filter are to get multiple. So this is how it's going to work. And if I open up this picture right here, there's a whole type or a whole list of query sets and how they work. So it's basically the same file you just saw right here, except for this is how we're passing in values. So we can, uh, we can filter by a specific attribute. We can change up like greater than less than filters. So there's a lot that we can do with it. We can also order values by different attributes and so on. And we have different methods that we can call on these objects. So that's all covered in more detail in the full course. So we'll go ahead and close that out and we'll just see it in practice. So let's go ahead and expand this a little bit. So I think it's right here. I'm trying to see where my mouse is. So I think that should be good. All right, so, okay, for some reason the mouse is not being recorded. Okay, so let's just go ahead and uh, work with it and see how this works. So we have our rooms, we're going into rooms.objects and then we'll just do dot all. So that's gonna give us all the rooms in the database. Now, in this case, this variable is the same as this one, but it's gonna overwrite it in one second. Let me try to fix this because my mouse is not showing. So I'll pause it and get back to it. Okay, so I just turned off my computer. I had to restart everything. And for some reason, the mouse is still not showing up. So it shows up in these sections right here and anywhere up here. But as I scroll down, it just disappears. So if I need to show something, I'll try to highlight it. I might have to fix some in editing, maybe to point something out if you don't see it, but I'll try to uh, maybe emphasize what exactly I'm pointing at. So that's kind of annoying. I, don't, I have no idea why it's doing that, but we're just gonna move on here. So. At this point, now that I've restarted my computer, so we wanna just kind of recap a few things here and uh, we have this query for our rooms here. So we're querying the rooms, it's overriding this variable and now we're actually going to the database. So we just imported it and that's what's being passed into the template. So now if I go ahead and go in here and if I refresh it, now we're gonna see the items from the database. So we see the admin panel as opposed to that list of dictionaries. Now, if I click on these, it technically is still gonna work if your ID start with one or two because those are inside of that dictionary. And that's one thing that I forgot to mention is that models by default have an ID generated for them. So the ID value just starts at one and it increments in the database as the instances go on. So we could override this value. You could just specify the ID and then use something like a UUID field or something more advanced. Uh, that is something that I like to do in my projects, but uh, for now, we're just gonna stick to the number value and just use integers. So we have those IDs and we want to do the same for the specific room. So let's go ahead and actually comment this out. I'll probably leave this in for this course for the source code so you can see that. And in the room, let's just get rid of all of this and let's just get the specific room. So we'll just do room and that's gonna be equal to models or the model name. So we're doing room.objects, so the model manager, and then we're doing dot get, which is gonna return back one single item. So we need to get this by a unique value because if this value, uh, let's say we have two items with the same value, like a name or something like that, it's gonna throw an error because it needs to get back a single object. So in this case, we're gonna specify the value that we wanna get it by 
IDs should be unique. You should never have a duplicate ID in the database in a table. And we're just going to pass in the primary key. So if I save this, let's go ahead and refresh it. Click on 100 days of code. Now we see that. So when we go to this page, it goes to that view, queries the database, gets back that single item, and it, then it renders it in the table. So the names are all the same. So we didn't have to change any logic in the front end. And now it's all working well here. So at this point, we want to add in a few more models to the database. So we have rooms here, but each room should have some kind of category. So we want to bring that in. So we'll go ahead and set this up here. So let's go ahead and start with a new model. And we're going to call this, let's see, actually, I want to start with a comment or a message. So each room is going to have a message and I'm going to put that beneath here. So we're going to do a message and we're going into models dot model like that. So we're making this a model and for the values for an actual message, first we want to specify a user. So the user that's sending the message and we're going to build this in in a second. Then we want to specify the room and this is a relationship here. So this is going to be the first type of database relationship that I'm going to talk about. This is a one to many relationship. I go into more detail in the course about this uh, in the full Django 2021 course, but we have a many to one relationship. So in this case, that means you have one model that has many children. So imagine uh, this is Twitter where you have a user and that that user can make multiple tweets. So multiple posts. So that post can only have one user, but the user can have multiple posts. So one to many or many to one. And in the database, they identify each other by the IDs. So we'll close this out and let's build this in. In order to create a many to one to, or a one to many relationship, we specify the attribute. So that's going to be the room and we can do models dot foreign key. And in here we specify the parent name. So in this case it's going to be connected to the room. So that is what's going to establish the relationship in the database. And that's how we know what's connected to what. So in here, we're just going to specify a value here. We're going to do on underscore delete. This is something that we do with many to one relationships and we have a few options here. So the first one is we can do model or models dot set. I believe it's models. Yeah. Models dot set underscore null. And this means that when the parent is deleted, so imagine that someone deletes this room. What do we want to do with all the children here? So all the instances of the children, so all the messages, we could set it to null, which would mean that that message would still stay in the database, or we could do cascade, which is what I want to do here. So when a room is deleted, I want to cascade. So that means that we are simply going to delete all the messages in that room. So if a room gets deleted, all the children will also get deleted. So we just want to get rid of those. Now you can decide how you want to use that, but in this case, I'm just going to keep it that way. So we're going to set that to cascade now. Let's see after the room, we also want the body. So the actual message in this case, we're going to do models dot text field. And we're just going to leave it like that because we do want to force a user to write a message. They shouldn't be allowed to write a message if they don't have a value. And let's see, we'll just take updated and created and bring that in here. So we'll do updated created. We'll create the string version. So we'll do a function str pass in self. And for the return method, we'll just take in the body. So we'll do return self dot body. And in this case, we're going to trim it down and we only want the first 50 characters. Now in the preview, we want the first 50 characters. So that way, if that's a long message, we don't want all the content in it cluttering our Django admin panel. So we have the message value and we created a relationship. And in here, we also want to add in a user. So Django already builds in a user model for us. And this is something that we're going to address a little bit more uh, in the last part of this video. But we're going to start with a default user model. So let's just Google this up really quick. And it looks like I have a spelling error. So Django already has a built in user model. And by the way, I open up the Figma design so we can start following this once we start adding in the items. So we'll just do Django user model. And let's look at this. So this is in the Django documentation and the user model is simply a class. It has things like a username, first name, last name, email, password, uh, different permissions like is this user staff member is it active 
uh, is this a super user? When's the last time this user logged in and so on? So we can use this value and we can also import the user. So we're just gonna look up the import method. I guess it's not in this file. So I'm just gonna go ahead and import this manually. So we're gonna import this user into the file and create a relationship. So in here, we're just gonna do from django.contrib. So this is a different part of Django here, dot auth. And we're gonna import user. So the user with a capital U, and that's what Django already has built into the admin panel. So we're going into auth.model, so it's a model. Okay, so again, later on, we're gonna customize this, and there's a few reasons for why I'm doing it this way without building it in right away. And let's take this user model and let's set the relationship. So in this case, this is gonna be a one-to-many relationship. So a user can have many messages, whereas a message can only have one user. So we're just gonna do models dot foreign key. We already know how to set this. We're gonna paste in the user and on delete, when a user is deleted, we just want to delete all the children here. So we're gonna do models dot cascade. Okay, so we have a room relationship and a user. And now we wanna go up to room. And in this case, because a room is gonna be a child of a topic, I wanna to specify the class above it. So we're just gonna do class here and we'll create it as topic. This is gonna be models.model. And we're just gonna add in one attribute here. So all the topic is gonna to have is a name and this is gonna be a character field. So we'll do models.char field and we need to specify the max length. So this field does require it. There's no need for a topic to have more than 200 characters. And we'll set the string value, underscore, pass in self, and we'll just return. And that's gonna be the name, self.name. So we need to access that value. Okay, so now we wanna specify the relationship to the room. So a topic can have multiple rooms whereas a room can only have one topic. Now we can change that up to a different type of relationship, but for now, a room can only have one topic. So in this case, let's just take this field right here. Let's bring that into room, and we're gonna paste that in, so it's gonna be models.foreign key, and we're gonna connect that to topic. Now, because topic is placed above room in the code, uh, if we happen to bring topic down here somewhere, we can still access this inside of this value, but we would have to wrap that in a string like that. But for now, we specify the topic, so the actual value. And if a topic is deleted, let's see, what do we wanna do with the room? Now, in this case, I don't wanna delete the room. We'll just do set underscore null. Now that might cause some issues in our code later. We can add in some fixes for that, but uh, let's see. Okay, so we're seeing a warning right now, and this basically is saying that if this value is set null, that means that in the database, we have to allow it to be true. So we have to allow it to be empty because when it gets removed and set to null, we need to make sure that the database will allow it. Now for the host, we need to set the user. So I'm gonna copy this value, paste this in, and that's gonna freak out here and throw an error. We're just gonna take this user. I don't know why that got imported. So we're gonna take that user and then change this value. So I'm pointing at it right now. I guess I can't see that in the code, but I'll highlight it. We can see the user here. So on line 15. So now we have a relationship to a host. So somebody has to host the room and then a topic, which is right here. Okay, so what do we do after we add in two models? Well, we're gonna go through that same process that we went through earlier. And we are gonna to have to open up a new terminal here. And we'll just do Python manage.py make migration. So we're gonna prep the migration. So when I execute that inside of the migrations folder, now we're gonna see a second migrations file get prepped. It's gonna prep the migrations for any changes or any new table. So anytime you make a change to a model, specifically to an attribute or uh, add in a new one, we need to run that and then we need to execute that. So python manage.py migrate. Okay, so we're gonna execute that and that's gonna add it to the database and after we run those migrations, we need to register these models with the admin panel. So we're going into here and we're gonna add in topic and message. Now the user model is already registered by default, so let's just go ahead and do admin 
dot site dot register register the topic and then admin dot site dot register and this is going to be the message okay so let's go ahead and check this out so we'll go in here go into the admin panel if i refresh it now we see topics and rooms so we'll go to a topic let's go ahead and add a few so we'll just add in python and let's add in django uh, let's see we'll just do developer or web development so we want to do something more generic so we'll give users plenty of options and at some point we want to customize this go ahead and give users uh, the option of adding their own topics and let's just do java script okay so we have four topics so what we can do is now go to our rooms and in the rooms because we added that uh, the host and the topic value you're going to see this drop down menu and you're going to be able to add in some users so for the topic 100 days of code let's just do web development so that's how many to one relationships are displayed in forms and we can also add in a host so i'm going to specify that as dennis we're going to go ahead and save this so i'll shrink down my face here just to make sure we can see that and let's add that to let's learn javascript so we'll do dennis and then I guess we'll do JavaScript for the topic and we'll hit save. Okay, so I'll expand that a little bit and now that should be good. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure you can see me clicking that save method. So now that we added that, we also want to add in some messages. So let's just go ahead and add in a user and let's just chat inside of the let's learn JavaScript room. We'll just say, hey, and we'll submit that. So now I'm clicking the save button or I guess I can do save and add another. And let me actually add in a user and I'm gonna call this user Tim. We'll add in the password. And we'll do password confirmation. Save that. So now we have two users and the password is by default hashed. So Django takes care of all that. So now we can see two users and we'll add in another message and Tim will say hi. So we'll just do hey hi and that should be good we'll save it and i just want to make sure those are all to the same room so messages hi is let's learn javascript and hey is let's learn javascript okay so we added two messages and we added some topics so we just made some connections there and let's go ahead and update this section here so let's see how do we want to render this out here so uh, we want to go ahead and actually render out the user value so we'll go into the template and let's go into home right now and let's check out the design here. So in the design, we want to render out the username and we also want to render out the topic. So it's not gonna look this good yet. We haven't added the template yet, but I just wanna display more information. So we'll go in here, let's see, down inside of the div here, let's just add in a span tag. So we'll do span and then uh, we'll just do at and then later on this will actually be clickable so we can actually go to a specific user account here so we'll do at and then we'll go into room dot host so we can actually query upwards to the parent item instead of just an attribute so the model does have a value called host so we can actually go to the host object and then we'll just do host dot user name so we can do that with django and that should display the host name so if i refresh that now we can see dennis posted those Let's go ahead and go down here. Let's add in some kind of line break so we can actually see the difference. So we'll do an HR tag and let's just do small and we'll add in the actual topic here. So in this case, we'll just do room.topic.name. Save that and let's take a look. So there we go. That looks a little better. So I can actually click on this and later on we'll just display the actual room information. So. We're done with rendering out the items. I showed you how to query the database for multiple objects, a single object, and also how to render this stuff out inside of the template, like rendering out a parent or two parents here and uh, just working with that data and also the admin panel. So now what I wanna do is show you CRUD operations. So this stands for create, read, update, and delete. It's the core of any uh, functionality on a website. You're gonna wanna view data, that's the detail, uh, you're going to want to update that's the UN crud read this information and delete this so 
Uh, let's go ahead and add that. So we want to learn how to work with a database outside of using the Django admin panel. So in order to do this, the first thing I'm going to do here is create a form for a room. So we're going into the apps templates folder. So in templates inside of base and let's create a template for a room here. So we're just going to go ahead and do room underscore form dot HTML. So we're going to create a template that is going to represent a form for updating and creating a room. So one template for two different views. Now, sorry about the weird breathing there, almost like choked on air. So the first thing we're going to do is do extend and we're going to extend the main template. So main dot HTML and we're going to wrap all the content. So we want to inherit from that main template. This is what we just worked on and we're going to specify the content block. And then we're gonna do end block content. So end block content. Okay, so in this page, let's go ahead and create a div here. So I just kinda wanna wrap the main page even though we're not styling it. I wanna create a form. And in the form, we need to specify the method. So we are gonna be sending data. So this is gonna be a post method for creating and updating. And the action, well, if I don't specify the action, it's gonna send it to the current URL that we're at. So I could send it to a specific URL or I can just say, when we hit post, send it to the same URL except for now send post data instead of get data. Now inside of every form in Django, if we're using this templating engine, we need to add in a CSRF underscore token. So this token will be sent on every form submit. So when we're sending post request in Django, we need to pass in this token and this is going to send it just to make sure that there's no malicious attempts. This is helping us from cross site uh, forgery attacks. I believe that's the term for it. If I got that wrong, sorry. So we're just sending that token along with every request and it's making sure that the user didn't uh, try to do anything mal malicious with that and um, I guess mess with our form input. So now we also want a submit button. So we're going to specify the type here and we're going to say submit and the value is going to be submit. So I'm going to make that lowercase. So that's the value or the type. And then the value, the actual text in that button will say submit. So we have a form and now we can go back to our view here and let's go ahead and create that view for this. So we're going to create the function and we're going to say create room. Pass in request here and inside of or after request, let's just go ahead and do return. And this is going to render out request. Okay, so you can see everything. Just want to make sure. And for the template, we're going into base and we're going into room underscore form dot HTML. So we're just rendering out the template and we're going to pass in context, which we don't have yet. So we'll add that right here. So I'm just doing some prep work, some boilerplate stuff, and we'll pass in the empty dictionary. So I'll save that. We render out the template. Now we need to create a URL here. So we'll just do path, add in a new route, and this is gonna be create room forward slash. The view is gonna be, or views dot create room. Name will be create dash room. Okay, so we have our URL. We have a view that renders a template and let's just go ahead and link this up. So let's go into our home.html page and this is where a user can create a room from. So at this point, just above all our rooms, let's just add in uh, some kind of value here and we'll just add in a link. So we'll just say create room and let's just do href and the value will just go to that URL. So we're gonna use the URL tag and the name of the URL, that's what we want to access. That's gonna be create-room. So we just highlighted that so you can see it. And we're doing create-room. Okay, so let's check this out. So the form is not ready yet, but if I click on it, I should be able to see the template. Let's see, on line three, content inside of create room. Where is that? So room form extends main.html content Oh, this is supposed to be block content. So it's the block and then the block name. So I just got that wrong. If I refresh that, 
there we go. Okay, so I could manually create this form and then submit that to the back end. Now Django has uh, different ways of going about this. Now, if we have class-based views, it's uh, all built in already for us. We really don't even have to do much. We just submit it and it kind of just processes that magically. And now that's also why I don't like class-based views, especially for beginners, because they're hard for people to understand. They're easy to use in basic structures, but once you need, need to uh, customize something or to understand how it actually works, it's hard to make sense of it. So they're useful when you know them, they're really good. For now, we're gonna use function-based views. And for this, instead of writing out that form manually, we're gonna use something called a model form. Now there is a layer of abstraction to this where it, there's kind of some magic under the hood, but it's easier to understand than a class-based view. So let's go ahead and build out a model form. So a model form is like a class-based representation of a form. So we'll just start this and I'll explain what's happening. So let's go ahead and create a new file inside of our base app here. And we're gonna call this forms.py. Now, inside of our forms.py file, first we're gonna import our model form. So we're gonna do from django.forms, and then we're just gonna import model form. So there's different types of forms we can create. So let's go ahead and import our models really quick. We'll just do from dot models, so it's in the same file. Let's just import room. Okay, so we have our model form and we have our room. Now, all we do to create a model form is we create a class and the, tr the tradition here that I like to use is specify the model name and then form. So this is gonna be the form for the room, so I call it room form. And this is gonna inherit from model, model form here. Okay, now, there are two minimum values that we need here. So when we set the metadata here, we're gonna specify the model that we want to create a form for. So that's gonna be the room model. And we have to specify the field. So we could do fields like this. And what this is gonna do is this will create the form based on the data, the metadata of this room right here. So that means that it's gonna create this form field for us, which will be that dropdown list, the topic value, It'll create a text field for our name and then the description and then updated and created. Well, those won't show because those aren't uh, editable fields. So it's creating a form based around these values. So if I specify all here, it's gonna give me all those fields. Now, later on, I am gonna wanna hide values like the user because that should be just auto-generated like the logged in user that creates it. The application should know a user shouldn't be able to specify uh, who they are necessarily in the drop down menu. So later on, we're going to say things like give us the name, then give us the body of the form and so on. So it's just a list and we can also add values that we want to exclude. So for now, we're going to leave that as all. So we're creating a form now inside of our view, we're going to import that form. So we're going to do from dot forms. So it's in the same file path. Let's import room form. I'm kind of losing my voice here. So let's see how long I can record today. So we have the room form and inside of create room, we're just going to do form. That's going to be room form after we import that and we can render this out in the template. So we're going to render that out as form. It's in the context here and we can pass that into room form HTML. So in here, we pass in a variable and we'll just do form because that's how we passed it into the context dictionary. If I refresh that, look at what we have here. So we have this form with all these field values. Now we're gonna work on styling this and making this look a little bit better. But for now, we're gonna use a quick shortcut and we're just gonna do form dot as underscore P. What that's gonna do is it'll wrap a paragraph tag around every input field that the form has and it'll just render those out. Now in the Django course, uh, the full Django course that I have, I do talk about customization and we do work a lot with this. So if you really wanna see how to modify this form, uh, we go into depth there. So now this form looks a little bit better. We see the submit button and we're good to go. So what we need to do now is process this data. So if I go back to this view, we'll go to form and we'll just say if request dot method so remember method is or request is an object so we'll do if request dot method is equal to post so we'll just do post like that 
Then let's go ahead and print out the form value. So we'll just do, or the value that was sent. So we'll just do request.post. And that's gonna be all the data. So if you wanna look into requests, look up the Django documentation, and it's gonna show you that in detail here. So uh, let's just print this out. So if I go ahead and minimize this, I guess, we'll uh, add in some data. We'll specify Dennis as the host, Django as the topic, and we'll just say, let's learn. Okay, so if I submit this data, I'm gonna print out what we send to the backend. So this is just gonna be like a dictionary of key value pairs that's sent to the backend. So if I submit it, let's see, I can do submit like that. And here we go. So we see the dictionary, we see the CSRF token, we see the host with the host ID, the topic ID, the name, which is let's learn right there. I wanna make sure that's not hidden. And then the description, which is empty at this point and so on. So this data is sent. So what I could do is I could process all of this manually. So I could do something like request.post.get and then get me uh, the name and then extract all those values and then run the save method on the model. But in this case, we have a model form that takes care of all this logic for us. So all we have to do is take in this form. So we're just gonna do, let's see, how do I wanna process this? So we're just gonna take in the data. So we're gonna specify the form and we'll just do room form. Then we're gonna pass in request.post. So it's passing in all the post data into the form. So the form already knows which values to extract from that. And then we can check if form.is underscore valid. So these are all methods that the form does have. So if it's valid data, if there's nothing wrong with it, they all match, the types of values are correct. Um, we can just do form.save. That's it. So we're going to save that value and this is going to save that model in the database. So once that's saved, I want to redirect the user back to the home page. So we're just going to add in or import a value called redirect. So redirect, save that and let's bring that down here. So if the form is good, we'll just do return redirect and we're just going to send the user to the home page. So again, because I have the name in the URL, I can access it by the name instead of this value here. So that's what makes that name value so cool. So let's go ahead and check this out. So we have a form, we send the post data, add the data to the form, check if it's valid, if it's good, we save it, and then we redirect a user. So let's try this out again. So we'll go back to the home page. We'll go to create a room, specify Tim as the creator. We'll do web development, and we'll just say, I want to learn HTML, this person's a complete noob. And let's just, uh, I guess we don't need to add a description, we'll submit that. So now I see I want to learn HTML down here. So it's at the bottom. So that value was submitted and, or it was submitted and now we have a create method. Now, before we get into update, I wanna change something here. So I could actually go to the model and render out new items first here. So when someone adds something to the database, I wanna make sure the newest item is first. So we'll go into models here, and there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is uh, we can actually add this to the query set or we can add it directly to the model method here. So let's go ahead and add this in. We'll just do class meta. And we can specify ordering. So there's different values that we can set, and this is gonna be a list. So What's gonna happen here is the first items in this list are gonna be prioritized and then it's gonna chain on that, that way. So uh, what I'm gonna do here is order the value by updated. So the most recently updated value and then we're just gonna order it by created. Okay, so if I do dash, so here's what's gonna happen. So if I do this, like if I do the value like this, it's gonna order it in uh, ascending order. So that means the newest one will be last. So if I go here, if I refresh it, uh, it didn't really change much here. Now, if I want the newest updated item to be first, I could just reverse that. So I can just do a dash and that's gonna invert it and we'll do that for created. So if I save that, now the most newest updated item will be first. So I wanna learn HTML. We'll just do Dennis now, Django, test add it and test is right there. So now it goes in the reverse order. So that's ordering. So now let's go ahead and go into updating a room. So to update this, we already have a template. 
So we have this template that submits that post form or the post request. Now we need to create a view. So we're gonna create a new view and we're gonna call this update room. So it's gonna look a lot like the create room method with a few changes here. So we're gonna pass in request here. Then in re after request, we also need to pass in the primary key. So we need to know what item are we updating? Then what we wanna do here is get the item that we're gonna update. So in this case, we're gonna update the room. That's gonna be room.objects.get. We're gonna get this value by the ID. So that's gonna be the primary key. Then we need to add in the form. So let's actually quickly add in the return method. So return render, we pass in request. If this is getting repetitive, that's good. It means you're understanding it. And we'll go into base. Let's get these notes out of here. I don't know why that's doing that or all that extra stuff. So we'll do room underscore form dot HTML. And then we'll pass in context and we'll set the context dictionary. Okay, so we get the room, then we get the form. So we're gonna do form. This is a lot like the method up here. So let's just copy and paste that. Now, the only difference is when we click to edit a room, we want to be able to actually know what room we're gonna edit. So this is gonna give us an empty form that we're gonna render in the context dictionary. So how do we get that data pre-filled? Now, what we can do here is we can actually add in instance or initial so we can add in initial and we can pass in the room value. So I just wanna make sure I'm doing this correctly. I have some notes that I'm looking at and that's gonna be instance. Okay, so we pass in the instance. So this form will be pre-filled with this room value. Now, if the values don't match, then that's not gonna work. But now we have a form that's pre-filled. So before we actually submit this, let's go ahead and add in an edit value. So we'll go into, let's see, we'll go into our home.html page. And let's go ahead and add in an edit button. So we'll just add this somewhere here. Let's just add it at the top here. So we'll just do a link here. So a tag and we'll say edit. Later we'll add a delete button. So we'll just throw an href and the URL, which we didn't create. So we wanna create that first. The URL is gonna be like create room. And in this case, we're gonna change this to update. And then this will be update room and then update room for the name. So we're gonna access it by this value here. So update room in home, we're just gonna do URL for the URL tag and then we can do update dash room. And then we need to pass in the ID. So this URL right here does need an ID. So we're gonna go ahead and throw that in. So two angle brackets with a closing forward slash, we'll do STR and then we'll pass in PK. So in the view, we do need that ID. So that's looking good inside of home we need to pass in the actual room ID. So on each iteration, we get the room and I can throw in the ID as that parameter. So a little bit of boilerplate there and let's check that out. So we see edit here, so I can click on that. So let's say I wanna edit one of these, we'll edit learn or I wanna learn HTML. I click on that and that data is now pre-filled. So we see that information. Now we need to process this. So it's also gonna look a lot like this right here. So we'll specify the method here. So we'll just do if request dot method, if this is equal to post, so if it's a post method, then what we wanna do is get the form, we'll just do uh, room, room form. And as we're processing this, what we're gonna do is pass in the request dot post, so the post method, all that data, but we need to tell it which room to update because if we process this information, it's just gonna go ahead and add in a new room. So we need to tell it what room to update. In this case, we're gonna set the instance just like we did above and that's gonna be this room value. So we specify that here and down here. So this data is gonna go ahead and replace whatever that room value is. So now the rest here is easy. We just do if form, dot is underscore valid. If that's valid, let's save it form dot save. And let's just do a return redirect, send the user back to the home page. All right, so let's try this out. We'll go back here, go to the home page. Let's say we want to edit test. Now those lines are a little bit close here, but we're going to click edit. And we're just going to do 
updated. We're gonna save this value. And here we go, we see test updated and that value is now updated. So I can click on it and see that here. So that is update functionality. So we have create, update, and we want to close this out with delete, at least the CRUD functionality. So let's go ahead and finish this up. So first, what I'm gonna do is add in a new link here. So we'll go into the edit button. We'll change this to delete. And until we add in the URL tag, I'm just gonna go ahead and clear that so we don't have any issues here. So now we're gonna see a delete link. So we have edit and delete. And for this, let's see, how do we wanna handle this? Now, if a user goes here, we need to send a post method. So we're gonna create another template just to handle deleting. So inside of our app here, inside of the templates base folder, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this delete.html. Now, this is gonna be a dynamic template, meaning that uh, later on when we go to delete a comment, it's gonna be the same template to delete any item inside of our website. So we're gonna make this pretty generic. It's just gonna extend from the main template. So we'll just do extends here. And all it is is gonna be a confirmation. So you click on it, it's gonna say, are you sure you want to delete? And then whatever item we're deleting, then we have a back button that we can click or we can, we can uh, click on confirm and actually delete that item. So we're gonna extend main.html and let's go ahead and do block content. So repetitive stuff here, we're just wrapping all the content. So we have our styling and our navigation bar later on here. So we'll do end block and then content. And let's see, so we're gonna add in a form. This form needs to send a post request. The action, well, we're gonna leave that as an empty string, it's gonna send it to the same URL here. We do need to pass in a CSRF token because we are sending a post request. So CSRF underscore token. And let's just go ahead and ask a question. So in the form, we'll just say, are you sure you want to delete? And then the item. So are you sure you want to delete? And then in quotes, we're gonna pass this in as OBJ like that or object. Let's just do that. Actually, we'll just say OBJ. So OBJ is gonna be short for object and then a question mark. So we're not gonna say room because later on when it's a message, this will have to be message. So we're gonna pass that in. Then down here, we're gonna add in an input button. The type will be submit. So this is gonna submit the form. And again, we'll add styling so it'll look a lot better once this is complete. So the submit button here and let's see, for the value, I just wanna say confirm. Okay, so we're gonna confirm the delete or we can just use an A tag here and we'll just say, go back here. So let's see, how do we wanna do this section? So I wanna make sure that the user goes back to the previous page because if they click on the delete button from a uh, post, it's gonna send them back to the post page if we manually set that URL. But what if they clicked on it from a message? So we wanna be able to redirect the user back to the previous page, not a specific page that they're on. So inside of delete, what we could do is just add in href and we can actually access the request object directly inside of the template. So we can do request dot meta. So we have some data about all the URLs and we're gonna do HTTP underscore refer like that. So that's gonna send the user to where they came from. So Let's go ahead and check this out. So we have the template. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. We ask a question and then we are gonna have two buttons here, or I guess two links. So now that we have the template, let's go into URLs here or into the views and we're just gonna add in a delete view. So we'll do delete or a function, delete. This will be room, pass in the request object and then we're gonna return that template. So we'll do return, render, pass in request here and we're going into base forward slash delete dot html now i'm not going to create the context dictionary or i'm not going to actually specify the variable we'll just add this in here and here's what we'll do so we're going to pass this in so you access it in the template by the name of the key so whatever we named it here so we're going to call it obj and then this will be the actual room so the room will be called object in the template so that's why we did that and now we can go ahead and get that value. So we're gonna pass in the primary key. We wanna know which room are we deleting. First of all, we want to get the room. So we'll do room.objects.delete. 
get that is going to be the id value by the primary key so we pass that primary key in and then we're going to check the method here so we're going to do if request dot post or if request dot method is equal to post so in a string value what do we want to do here so in this case we're going to do room dot delete so there's a lot of different methods we have uh, the save method there's uh, i guess different things i'm not going to go through the list of them but delete is simply going to remove that item from the database and delete it so if it's a post method that means we click confirm that's submitting that form and it's deleting the room so let's go ahead and save that and then where do we want to re redirect the user so we'll just do redirect or return redirect and we're going to send the user back to the home page if they deleted that room all right so let's go ahead and check this out so we're missing the the url here so we're going to copy this one paste that in and we're just going to do delete room this is going to be updated to delete room and then delete for the name so we have the url we have the view we have the template now inside of the home template we need to add in the URL tag to send a user there. So we're gonna do URL in single quotes. We're gonna do delete dash room. That's not gonna delete the user or the room. It's gonna send the user to the confirmation page. So the, the room ID, we'll pass that in. And let's check this out. So if I refresh this, click on delete. Let's try this, let's learn JavaScript. So are you sure you want to delete? Let's learn JavaScript. So we could go back and it doesn't do anything. So it just sends us back to the last page. Let's uh, delete test updated. And if we could confirm, now we see that that's gone here. So we don't see test updated anymore. Let's try to delete, let's see, I guess we deleted it. We know it's working. So we sent that method, it removed it from the database and it sent us back. So that is the delete method. So at this point, I wanna build in some search functionality into our application here. So I wanna do two things here. The first one is to go ahead and build in like a sidebar here. So this is that Figma design, so it's not active. This is gonna be some quick search functionality, which means that we can render out all the topics that we have here. And a user can simply click on one of these and it's gonna filter down by topics. So that's gonna throw this into like the search parameters and these rooms will be filtered. Now, after we have that in the search bar here, so if I go too close to that, it's gonna go ahead and hover over there, but you see that search bar, we're gonna add that in so a user can also type in a certain parameter based on a topic or the actual title of a room, or maybe even buy some contents in that specific room. So we wanna add in some beginner functionality here, and then we'll actually advance that as we go through this section. So what we'll do here first is we're actually gonna add some styling here. Now, as far as the styling goes, it's gonna be uh, very minimalistic. So don't worry about the CSS if you don't understand it. We're gonna add in only a couple of lines here. Once we do that, uh, we're actually gonna add in the template that's gonna make this look better here. So let's go ahead and build this in to start. So we're going back to home.html. And the first thing I wanna do is make sure the entire page is wrapped in a div here. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap that in a div and we're gonna give this the class of home-container. So we're gonna to have to use CSS grids for this. Again, don't worry if you don't know how they work. We're gonna just type it out here and it's gonna be very minimalistic. And inside of this home container, we want to create a div here for our sidebar. So this is gonna be uh, the sidebar that says browse topics here. So we're just, we're just gonna go ahead and add that in here. So we'll just do uh, an H3 tag and we're gonna say browse Wow, we can't spell browse. So browse topics. Okay, so that's gonna be our sidebar. We'll just add in some kind of HR tag there. So a line, and then we also want to wrap all of this right here. So all the rooms, we wanna wrap that in a div here. So we're just gonna go ahead and take everything from this link down to this div, and we're gonna paste that into this container. So we're about to have two columns. One, we have a main container around everything. Then we have a container around our topics and a container around that list of rooms. So let's go ahead and check this out here. So if I refresh it, they're all in line. So we want to create some layouts here. So we'll go ahead and add in some styling right here. So we'll just add in a style tag and we're gonna take that home container. So we're gonna get that class home-container and let's wrap this. So we're just gonna go ahead and create a grid. So we'll just do display grid and we're gonna do grid template columns, and we're gonna do one FR, 
and then three FR. So that's gonna stand for one fraction and three fractions. So technically we created two columns and this is specifying how many fractions of the website or the page that this is gonna take up. So don't worry about the details. Go ahead and create this and make sure you have two columns here. So if I save this, this column on the right should be wider. So if I refresh that, there we go. So we see our topics on the left side and then this section is taking up three fractions. Now, what I wanna do is list out all the topics here. So we're gonna to go to this view and we're first gonna go ahead and make a quick query for all the topics. So we need to go to our models and we need to import these. So this will be the first type of search that we do. And we're just gonna to do topics and this is gonna to be topic dot objects dot all now for now we're just going to list out everything but if we start adding in thousands of topics into our website we want to maybe filter these down by just the top topics or maybe the topics with the most rooms but we'll leave that up to you to figure that out here so that needs to be topics we want to make that plural we're going to throw that into the context dictionary whoops we'll just type that out so we'll do topics and we'll just do topics right here okay so we have all of our topics and we want to render these out in the home page. So we just want to go ahead and loop through all the topics. So we'll do for topic in topics and we're going to create that closing loop. So we'll just do end for not form and in each iteration, we're going to create a wrapper and in here for now, we're just going to do uh, a link here. So we'll add in a link and this is going to be the topic name. So we want to be able to visibly display it. And then what we're going to do is add in a link. Now this link, so we're going to use the URL tag one second here. So we'll do href inside of this link. We're going to send the user back to the home page. So the URL is going to the home page, except for outside of this curly brace, we're going to add in a question mark. Then we're going to pass in the parameter name. So that's going to be Q and we're going to represent query. So it can be whatever you want. And we're going to set that to equals to, and then that's going to be the topic name. So we'll just do topic dot name and here we just want to also list out the name i want to make sure you can see that so the topic dot name and there we go so what's going to happen here is we're going to the same page when we're in this sidebar so we're going to click on this it's going to send the user to the home page and we're throwing in the topic name now if i go ahead and refresh this when we click on that that's going to be added to these parameters right here so we can see python if i go to django web development javascript that's going to be added in in the parameters and we can get this value right here inside of the view here. So we're going to get that value and use that to filter down some data here. Okay, so now that we have that, I also want to make sure that when we're filtering this down, I can also refresh the filter and go back to get all the values. So in this case, we're going back to the main URL and we're just going to specify all. So if I go ahead and refresh that. So if I go to Python and then Django and then back to all, it just gets rid of that and we're back on the home page. So in the view for the actual functionality, we can use the filter method. So if I don't do anything here, it's going to work just like the all method It's just going to go ahead and uh, get back all the rooms because we haven't added any parameters. Now what I'm going to do here is create a variable and this is going to be Q and Q is going to be equal to request dot get. So the get method, and then we're going to use the get function here and we're going to get q here so q is going to be equal to whatever we passed into the url now what i could do is just go ahead and go into the topic so i can go to the model and get the topic and then i can actually query upwards so to the parent so double underscore and then say topic name is equal to q now we're going to get a couple issues here so if i save this let's check this out here so it's going to filter this value down and where we should get back this data so on the first search, we have an issue here, and that is because we don't have any parameters here, and none of the parameters fully match the specific topic that we're looking for, so it just gives us back nothing. But if we go to JavaScript, we can see JavaScript. If we go to web development, we can see back to results here. So we need to create some kind of condition here. So the first thing is we're going to use an inline if statement. So we're going to check if the request method has something, and we're going to say if request dot get dot get and then we're getting q so if q is not equal to none then we're going to go ahead and make sure q is the parameter else we can say q right here q is going to be equal to an empty string 
So we'll throw that in here. And instead of setting the value directly, because at this point it's just gonna set it to nothing if we have nothing in the filter still won't work, we can use a value called double underscore I contains. Well, the value is actually just uh, I contains, not double underscore, but that's how we have to add that in. So what this means is that it's gonna make sure that whatever value we have in the topic name at least contains what's in here. So that means that, uh, let's say we start typing out a, uh, a specific value like Python, and we only add in PY into the search parameter. So it's gonna see that it contains at least those two letters and then it'll run that filter and that will return a positive match. Now the I there just means that we can make that case insensitive. So that means that if it's a capital P or lowercase one, it won't make a difference. We also could do contains like that and that will be case sensitive. Now there's also other options like starts with, ends with and so on. So there's different opportunities here, but we're gonna leave it at that. So let's try this one more time. We'll go ahead and clear that. And here we go. So we get back everything. So that means that we don't have a parameter and technically all of these topic names match that. Now, if I go ahead and go to JavaScript, web development, that still works. And I also could manually start typing this in and say W E and go ahead and search that. And that'll work because we see web development and that matches this query. Now, we want to add in an actual search bar. So you see how I did this manually where I just added in that search? Well, we don't want a user doing that. And we also want a user to be able to do that from their own search bar. So they don't wanna to have to manually do that or be limited to these links right here. So what if a user wants to search by a specific name or maybe by somebody that created the room? Let's say you have a favorite uh, room creator or a host and you wanna be able to find them. So you can say something like, uh, go ahead and find me all rooms made by Dennis. So you'll type in my name and it would display those. So we're about to make this dynamic. So in the header bar here, so we're going back to the nav bar, let's go ahead and create a search form. So just underneath the link right there, we'll create a form here. And this form is gonna go ahead and set the method to get, and the default method is get, so uh, we technically don't have to set that. And the action, well, this is gonna send the user to the home page. So we're specifying the URL, that's going to the home page. And then we want to add in the input field. We don't need a CSRF token because this is a get method. The type here is gonna be submit. So we'll add in submit and then the value. Well, we're not actually gonna have a submit form. I just realized I would rather have the user just hit enter rather than clicking a button. So let's just do this. We'll specify the type as text. So this will actually be the input field, but I do have to give this a name. So we'll specify the name as Q. So it's gonna take whatever we have here and throw it into that URL with Q before that. So that's all we need at this point. So now what we can do is actually run that search. So just before I do that, I actually wanna add in a placeholder and we'll just say search rooms. So we wanna prompt the user and that'll be dot, dot, dot. And let's make that a capital R. So we're gonna search the rooms. Let's check this out here. So if we go back up here, we're gonna see this filter here. So that's in the nav bar. So that means that if I'm on another page here, it will take me back here. So let's try this. Let's go ahead and search for JavaScript room. So we'll just do Java and then we'll start typing in script but we won't finish it. If I hit search, now it's gonna match this right here. And there we go. Now, if I'm inside of a different room, let's say I go to, um, let's go to view a room and I start typing in Java like that or J-A-V, it's gonna go back to the homepage and that filter works. Now. I wanna show you one more thing here and that is how we can make dynamic values here or dynamic searches. So at this point, we're only searching by the topic name. And I mentioned earlier, we wanna search by a name of a user or a room and so on. And technically we could chain these filters down here. So we could say something like a comma there and then we'll just add in, let's see, we'll do name of the room. So now we have name that's going to the room and we can say the room uh, or the name contains whatever value. Now, the only issue with this is that that means this search parameter has to match everything. Now, we do have a method, it's called a QLOOKUP method that Django gives us. And this is gonna allow us to add in things like and or or statements into that search. And I'll show you what I mean by this. So let's add this above here and we're just gonna make a quick import. So we're gonna do from Django dot Let's see, where are we getting this from? We'll do .db.models, 
and then we're going to import Q and that's going to be a capital Q. Now with Q, we can actually wrap these search parameters. So we're going to add in a capital Q, add in the parentheses, and then we can go ahead and just chain this. So I'm going to fix some indentation here and I can add in an and statement. So I can do and, and then go ahead and write in Q down here. So we'll do Q and we'll just say name underscore I contains, and then we'll throw in the search parameter. Now, the only issue here is that both of the values here have to contain that. So I can actually do an or statement. So I can add in a pipe and that means or. So that means the search parameter has to match this one or this one. So I can throw in one more. We'll copy and paste that actually. And let's see, let's go by description. So we'll do description. So description contains the search parameter. So we'll close out that closing one there and that's it. So now we can search by three different values. So if I go here, let's go ahead and clear this. What just happened here? I contains, it looks like I misspelled contains somewhere. Okay, so we need to fix that and let's go back here, refresh that. Okay, so name double underscore and then this one has to be a double underscore. Okay, now that should work. So if I refresh it, it's still um, supported contains. Okay, I just have a bunch of misspells. One second, contains, so description, I contains, name, I contains, that should be good. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so what if we don't wanna search by the topic, we want to search by a title. So we'll just start typing in I wanna, um, let's say we only remember like the star of a room name, but we don't remember the full name here. So we can click that right there. And there we go. So we can search by the room name. And then later on, if I add in a user, we can search by the user. So that's it for the search functionality. I just want to throw in one more thing here. And I want to be able to get the room count here. So the actual count of how many rooms we have here. So if we go back to the Figma design, we see study rooms and then we can see total rooms found near you. In our case, I'm going to change that up a little bit. Um, I actually don't like how that looks. So we'll go ahead and do something like this. So we'll go into the home container and we'll take the container for the feed here. Just above our create room link, we'll go ahead and add in H5 and we'll just do, let's see, we'll just do room underscore count. So we're going to pass this in in a second and we'll just say blank rooms available. Like that. Okay. So in the view, we need to pass this in. So we'll just go ahead and take this room here. So these are going to be filtered down. And in Django, we can just go ahead and do room underscore count, and then we can get rooms. So a room count is equal to rooms dot count. Now in Python, you could use the LEN method and just wrap that. And that's going to give you the length of a list. In this case, we get the length of a query set. And this actually works faster than the Python uh, LEN method or LEN. So we're going to do that. We'll pass that in. And let's check this out here. So if I go ahead and refresh that, now we see we have one room available. If I clear all of those, we see three rooms. So as a user searches, we see two rooms available for this topic right here. And that's exactly how we wanted it to be. So we always see the room count. Now we're gonna talk about authentication. So at this point, I'm gonna build in a user login form, user registration, and also logout functionality. Now, before we get into this, I wanna talk about how Django deals with this. So Django by default has session based authentications and how this works is it's the same as what we have in this Django admin panel. So when we go to this admin panel, when we provide our credentials, this gets sent to the backend and in the backend, there is a database table called sessions here. So if we go to installed apps inside of settings.py, let's see, we'll do settings here. We see our sessions here. And if you go and actually use something like PG admin and Postgres, you'll be able to see this table. So when a user logs in, this is sent to the backend and a session token is created and this stores information about a user. So once that user is authenticated, we now know when this user logged in, who this user is and all this information about them. So at this point, let's go ahead and do inspect element and we're going into application and then we're going to go into cookies here. So depending on what browser you use, it's going to look a little bit different, but we want to go into cookies. So we're going to clear these ones out right here and we're going to log this user in. So that session will get created in the database. And then we're also going to take that session and we're going to store it in the browser. Now, as we navigate through pages on our website, 
we don't have to keep logging in. That session is going to be stored and on each request, it's going to be sent to the back end. And we're going to check, is this user actually someone that's in this website? Are they allowed to be here? Are they authenticated? And what permissions do they have? So if I hit enter here, so if I submit this login form, we're going to see a session get created. I don't know what the heck happened. Okay. So I removed the CSRF token. So that's going to be there by default. Django does that for us. So we're going to hit login and look at this. So I'm logged in now and I see this session ID. So here's the value here is this token right here. So I want to make sure you can see that. And this is now stored inside of the cookies here in the browser. So we went into application and then cookies on each request. We double check this session or Django will take care of that. And then it, lets me persist here. So it lets me go through all the pages. Like when I go to this next page, we quickly check the session and it made sure, Hey, this person's allowed to be here. So Django has that built in by default. And what we're going to do is we're going to build this in ourselves. So we're going to use that authentication system and we're going to log users in here. So let's go ahead and close out the admin panel because we don't want users to uh, have to use that. We want to have our own authentication. So for this, Let's go ahead and start by building out a template and we're going to call this registration login. So we'll just do login underscore registration or register. So login register dot HTML. So we're going to have one template for a login and register form. And then the form itself will change based on uh, what page the user's on, whether they're logging in or trying to register. So we're going to go ahead and do some boilerplate here. I accidentally hit caps lock. We'll just do extends here. And we're going to extend main.html. Trying to type faster and I start messing up here. We need to create the block tags. We've done this a lot. So we'll just do block content and then close that off here. And we'll just do end block content. Okay. So in here, I'm going to create a div here. So I want to wrap the entire website. So we'll do div and it looks like I missed something here. And now let's go ahead and create a form here. So this is going to be our login form. Now Django does have a built-in login form. There's different ways of doing this. And they also have a built-in registration form. What I'm going to do here is just use my own login form. It's going to have two fields of a username and password. Later on, we're going to talk about doing this with an email instead of a username. And uh, we're just going to submit it. Now for the register form, that will just be generated for us. So the method here, well, this has to be a post method. We're going to send data back to our view. And the action, well, we're going to leave that as an empty string and we need to add in a CSRF underscore token. Okay. So now for the input value, we want to go ahead and tell the user to log in. So the type will be submit and then the actual value. Well, we're just going to say login and let's create the two fields here. So we're going to create an input field. This one is going to be the type of Let's see text here. So that's going to be the username. The value is going to be username. So we need to know the name of the field when it's submitted and we'll just say placeholder enter user name here. Okay. I also want to add in a label here. So we'll just do label and we'll just say user name and we'll throw that in and let's just copy this right here. We'll add this down here. So label is going to be password and let me, turn off the fan really quick. It's actually getting cold. I just wanted to turn that off. I'm freezing in here. Okay. So add in a password. The type is going to be a password field, and this is going to make sure that there's the dots instead of actually displaying the value. And then the value itself will be password. So we want to be able to get these in the back end and then enter password. Okay. So we have our form. We just have a simple form, no styling here and extends the main template. Now inside of our views here, we're going back into the views and we're going to create a view for this login page. So let's go ahead and add this above our home page. So it's kind of like the first step in this process. And I'm going to call this login page. Now do not call this view login because we have a function that we're about to use. It's a built-in function called the login. And there's going to be a conflict if you use that name. So try to do something else. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to call it login page. You can call it login view, uh, just not login on its own. So we'll go ahead and return that template render and we'll throw in the request object, render that template. So that's going to go into base and we're going to get login underscore register dot HTML. And let's go ahead and actually pass in the context dictionary and we'll create that in a second. So context 
set that up here. Okay, so we need a URL now. So we'll go ahead and put that up here. So we'll put that at the start and add in the closing comma. And this is going to be login, the closing forward slash, and then views.login page. Now the name, we'll just do login like that. And that's going to work here. So leaving the name like that, it's good. That works here. And at this point, I want to, let's see, I want to render this link at the or inside of the navigation bar. So we'll just go ahead and bring this in. Let's see, we'll just do this above the, or just after the form. Let's just do this right here. So we'll add in a link here. And this is going to be to login. And the URL is going to point to login here. So we'll add in the URL tag here. And we're going to the login page. Okay, so let's check this out here. So we see login. If I click on that, that's going to take me to the login page. I see the username. Uh, not sure why that's the case. Enter username, I guess. Okay, so I just use that value. Let me double check why that's happening. That looks a little bit odd. So the value is username and Okay, so this needs to be the name actually. Sorry, not the value. I don't know why that why I did that. That's the, that's an issue right there. So now I see the username. So if I remove that, there we go. Okay. So we have the form and now we want to be able to log in a user. So at this point, when we send this information, we need to extract these values. So earlier on, we did a model form or we used a model form for this and that kind of took care of everything here. So instead of having that done manually and using the user login form that's already built in, we're going to do all of this by hand. So up here, we're first going to check the method here. So we're going to do if request dot method. If this is equal to post, so that means the user entered their information and logged in here. Well, we want to be able to get the email and we're just going to go ahead and go into request dot post dot get and we're going to get the not email, but the name here or username. Okay, so that's going to be username. So after that, we also want to get the password. So we'll just do password and that's going to get the password. So these two values will be sent from the front end. So we're just getting the values here. And once we get those, I want to first make sure that this user exists. So I'm going to use a try catch block. So we're going to do try and we're going to say user and we'll just try to query that user. So let's see, I need to import that user model. So we'll go into models here and I imported that built-in user right here. We'll bring that into our views and let me close out the navigation bar. So I bring in the user and we're going to check if this user exists. So user.objects.get and we're just going to go ahead and say username is equal to username. So I want to make sure this user exists. If it doesn't, we want to throw some kind of error. So we'll just go ahead and do accept here. And at this point, instead of working with something like flash messages, we're going to go ahead and just render. Uh, let's see, actually, how do I want to do this? I actually might be able to use flash, mes flash messages. So let's try this. Let's actually look up Django flash messages. I wasn't planning to do this, but let's go ahead and try this. So these messages are really cool because they store this uh, inside of Django as far as a, I think they're in the sessions and they only are stored inside of one browser refresh. So we won't go into the details here, but what I'm going to do here is just grab these messages here. So I'm going to grab this import. Actually, let's see. So we're going to import this like that. So from Django.contrib import messages, and we're going to bring this in right here. So just underneath render and redirect, and I'll show you what this means or what this is in a second. So then we need to be able to add in a message here. So we can go ahead and do messages dot, and then we can specify a type of message. So if a user doesn't exist, we want to be able to throw in an error message. So I'm going to take in this one. So we're going into messages dot error. That's going to give us the type of message. We throw in the request and then the actual message that we want to output. So we'll bring this in right here. If a user doesn't exist, we'll throw in an error message and we'll say user does not exist. Okay, so like that. So if a user doesn't exist, we're going to throw in that message. And let's try this really quick. So we're not doing much here. We're just going to go ahead and try this. So let's say we want to throw in a user that isn't in our database. We're going to click that. And I just realized we need to output this flash message. So now to actually output it, 
We're going to go down here inside of the Django documentation and let's copy this entire statement here. So we're going to see if we have any messages in our template. If we do, we're just going to go ahead and output all the messages. So we're going to bring this into, let's see, I'm going to bring this into the main template here. So we'll add this to main.html. Sorry if I'm going a little bit fast. I didn't plan for this part, but I do want to search this or I do want to show you this. So underneath our nav bar, let's add this in. So that means anywhere we have a flash message, it will appear. So messages are going to be passed into our template here, just like that. So we can see the messages here. We can access the messages like this. So we see if we have any messages, then we just output those messages here. And there's that weird if statement. If you just copy and paste it directly, that's what it's going to look like. So let's actually just take out this tag here. And let's just say I'll put the message here and that's it. So that'll clean it up a little bit better. So we have a UL tag. If we have a message, we output it. So we check if we have them. And there we go. So let's try this one more time. So we'll go ahead and try to refresh this. So if I type this in and hit login, it says user does not exist. And then if I try to refresh that, that only appears for that page. So we have a message that gets that tells us what's happening here. And that's a little bit convenient there to be able to actually just output this instead of not knowing what's happening. So we're just going to check if this user exists. If they don't, we're going to output that error. Now, if the user does exist, we're going to go ahead and continue here. So we're going to go ahead and do user and we're going to use the authenticate method. So authenticate like that. And this is a method that we have to import here. So we're just going to go ahead and import this. And this is going to be from Django dot contrib. Misspelled Django there. So Django dot contrib dot auth. And we're going to import authenticate. And we're also going to import the login method. And this is why we couldn't name that specific view login. And we also want to import the logout method. So we're going to use authenticate. And once we make sure that we have a user, we want to uh, authenticate this user. So we want to make sure that whatever the credentials are for this specific user, we want to make sure that they're correct. So we'll just go ahead and do authenticate. We'll pass in request here. And then we're going to pass in the username and we'll throw in the username that we got here. So from here, and we're going to throw in the password. So we're going to authenticate the user. So what Authenticate is going to do is it's either going to give us an error or it's going to return back a user object that matches these credentials. So we have a user now if the user credentials were correct. If they weren't, well, it's going to give us an error. So now we're just going to go ahead and do if user is not none. So that means if we got a user, so it's either a user or none, then let's go ahead and log in this user. So we're going to use the login method. So we'll do login. And for the login method, all we do is pass in the request object and then the user and login. What that's going to do is going to, it's going to go ahead and add in that session in the database and then inside of our browser and the user will be officially logged in. So once the user is logged in, we'll just go ahead and do return redirect and we want to send the user to the home page. So that's going to log in a user. So let's recap this. We get the username and password. We check if the user exists. If the user does exist somewhere, we make sure that the credentials are correct. We get the user object based on the username and password. We log a user in. This creates a session in the database and the browser, and then we redirect a user. Now we want one more thing here. If the user is not logged in, we'll just say else, and we're going to create another flash message. So we're going to write in else and we'll just say username. So user name or password does not exist. So let me scroll up here. So username or password does not exist. Okay. So let's check this out here. So if I go in here, we'll refresh it. We're going to enter in our credentials. Mine are already entered in there. So go ahead and write your stuff in there, log in. And now I'm redirected to the home page. So if I go here, go into application, We'll check out that session. I can just remove the session ID and that's automatically going to log my user out here. So if I go ahead and refresh that, go to the home page, the user is not there. Now we're not doing anything like restricting a user from certain pages like that. So uh, we haven't done that just yet. We'll take care of that in a bit here. So 
If I log a user in, a session gets created and we redirect a user. Now, what if I wanna log out a user? So let's go ahead and add that in here. So we can actually access the request object directly inside of a template. So we'll go into the navigation bar and we're gonna write in a condition here. So we're gonna first gonna check if a user is authenticated. So we'll do if user, so we can access, or if request dot user dot is underscore authenticated. So if a user is authenticated, then let's go ahead and output the log in button or the log out button. So we'll add in another link and we're just gonna say log out and we'll fix out or we'll fix up that URL in a second. So we'll go ahead and close that end if statement or the if statement. So we'll just do end if, and then we're gonna add in an else statement. So we'll just do else. So if a user is authenticated, that means we have a session in the browser, then go ahead and add in the log out button. If the user is logged in or logged out or not authenticated, then go ahead and prompt them to log in. So let's go ahead and refresh that. So we see a log out button right now. So we want to be able to log out a user now. So let's go ahead and go back into our views and we're gonna create a log out view. And this is gonna be just a view. We don't need a template for this. And we already imported the login or the log out function. So we'll go down here just underneath login. We'll create a method here and we'll just say log out user like that. So we'll throw in request. And this method is just gonna be a get request. So we'll just go ahead and return redirect and we're gonna send the user to the homepage. So let's just go ahead and do that. Now, all we need to do here is use the log out method, pass in request, and this is gonna delete that token, therefore deleting that user. So in the URLs here, let's go ahead and bring this in. We'll copy and paste login and we'll just do log out like that. And then we can do log out user. And then the name will be log out. And now we can go to the navigation bar and specify the URL tag to point to log out. So we'll just do URL and then log out. Okay, so let's give this a shot here. So if I go ahead and go to the home page, we're logged in. If I go to log out, it's gonna clear the user information and now we're officially logged out. So I can go to log in. I can log in the user right here and we see that be updated here. So at this point, what I wanna do is restrict some pages here based on the user and their status of whether they're logged in or uh, just a user browsing through the website here. So we have the login log, log out functionality, but it really doesn't do much for us here. So the first thing I wanna do is make a quick import here and actually add in a decorator above a view that I want to restrict. Now with class-based views, we use mixins for this. Uh, we can also use uh, middleware for this. There's a lot of different ways to actually restrict a user, but we're gonna use simple decorators for this functionality. So the first thing I'm gonna do is import this decorator. So we're gonna go into Django.contrib. So from Django.contrib, and we're gonna go into dot auth dot decorators, and then we're gonna import login required. Now, the page that I wanna restrict here is gonna be a create page. So the create room here, uh, at one point, I actually want to remove the button completely if a user is not logged in or maybe just redirect them. I don't know exactly how I wanna figure this out here. So uh, let's just go ahead and do login required. So that's, that's all we have to do here. Now, this doesn't check the type of user, what permissions they have, that's gonna be a little bit more functionality. But at this point, once we add this decorator, a user that is not authenticated, if their uh, session ID is not in the browser and it's not credible, they will be simply redirected. Now we can specify where we want to redirect that user. In this case, I want to redirect the user to the login page. So let's go ahead and try this. What the heck did I do there? So I'm gonna, oh, I clicked on that decorator, okay. So I'm gonna save that. We have the login required decorator above the create view method. So I wanna log out here. And it looks like because of that thing that I just did, had some kind of big error. So let me clear that and restart the server. So login required, let's see, we have a login URL and I need to remove that forward slash. Okay, login required, got an unexpected argument. Uh, this needs to be login URL, sorry about that. 
Okay, so now we have a login URL and that issue goes away. So we'll go back to this page here. We log out a user. And if I try to go to create room, we're redirected back to the login page. And for now, I'm just gonna leave it like this actually. So I actually like this because uh, we want to prompt a user to create a room, but if they're not registered, we want to encourage them to either log in or register, which, which uh, we'll add here in a second. So once we have that, I also want to add in login required to update room. So I don't want just anybody updating a room. And I also wanna make sure that only authenticated users can delete a room. So that's how we can actually restrict users. Now, in this case, in theory, if I know somebody's room ID, I can just log in and I'll be allowed to go ahead and update their room. So I wanna restrict a user. So let's see, how do I wanna do this? So at this point, I'm just gonna write in a condition right here. There's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Uh, we'll just say if request dot user is not equal to let's see so we can do if request dot user is not equal to room dot user then we just want to return we'll just do return um, let's see we'll just do some kind of HTTP response so I'm going to import that really quick I know I removed it but we'll just add that in right here so we'll just do from Django dot HTTP import HTTP response so if a user is not the correct user, meaning they're not the owner here, let's just do return and then we'll just do HTTP response and we'll just say, uh, you are not allowed here. Okay, so if they're not the owner, we're gonna yell at them here. So if they're not the room user, so if they're not equal to that, let's go ahead and stop them. So update room, let's check this out here. So we'll log in, log in as Dennis and let's just try to edit Tim's room. So as a super user, at some point, we will want to add in functionality so an admin can edit this. So let's see, which room does Tim own? So we have Tim right here. So we'll go to edit and room object has no attribute user. So we'll do room dot host like that. So that's what it was. So we just want to check that again. We'll go ahead and see this. So I am not allowed here because that's Tim's room. And let's say I want to edit my own. Well, I'm allowed to do that. So we could do something like that. And we can also say if request.user is not the host or request.user, or we can say maybe and, and we can just say if the user is not a super user. So I won't worry about that. And we're just gonna add in this check here for update and we're gonna add this for delete. Okay, so now only the correct user can update this. Now, let's see, at this point, I should probably hide this button completely here from any user that's not the owner. So we see my rooms right here, I'm logged in as Dennis. We'll go to Tim's and we're gonna remove this stuff right here. So we'll go ahead and go into the home page. So we'll close out the nav bar, all these links that I have open here, we'll close out URLs here and Let's go to home. And I just wanna make sure that if I'm not the user, I don't see the delete and edit button. So I'm just getting rid of this right here. So we'll go up here. Let's see, so that is inside of rooms. And we'll just say, if the user is not authenticated, remove it. So if user dot, or if request dot user is not equal to the owner, let's just do that, let's just do room dot host then let's just make sure we hide this information so let's see if the user is the host so we'll just do if the user is equal to the host then we'll display that information so we'll just do end if like that okay so that should hide that information now so let's try this here so we'll go ahead and refresh it so now tim can only edit his i can only edit mine or delete mine and we are good to go okay so let's see, what else do I want to do here? Now, I also maybe want to restrict a user from going to the login page. So at this point, if I'm already logged in and I try to go manually to this URL, maybe we can just redirect a user here. So um, we don't want a user re-logging in. So we'll just go ahead and add this functionality in here. We'll go into login and we'll just do if request dot user dot is underscore authenticated. So this is a method that really helps us here, authenticated. Okay, can't spell that word. Uh, we'll just do return redirect and let's just send the user to the home page. 
Okay, so if I'm logged in, I shouldn't be allowed to be on this page. Okay, looks good here. All right, so what do we wanna do next here? So only the owner can update and delete their information. We restricted pages here. Uh, only a user can edit their own post. Now let's go ahead and move to registration. So for registration, let's log out here. We'll go to the login button here. And we want to add in a link for that register page. So we'll first go to login register. So that template. And we're just gonna go ahead and add this inside of this div right here. So we'll create another div actually. So we'll just wrap this for the login page and then we'll have a register page. So I'm just gonna copy this div right here. We'll paste that down here and we're just gonna change up the contents here. So we'll just say register for this button. Okay, and then for the actual form fields, we're gonna auto generate that so we don't need that and we want to write a condition. So at this point, both form fields are gonna be rendered here. So we want to hide this in a second. So what we can do here is we can actually pass in like a page name. So we'll just do page and this is gonna be the login page. So we're just gonna specify a variable here in a string value and we'll just say login. Why can't I write that? Login, and there we go. Okay, so we're also gonna take this page, throw this into the context dictionary paste that in right here, that's the login page. And then we're gonna create a register page too. So register will be underneath logout and we're gonna call this register user. Okay, we'll throw in request here. We'll specify the page. The page is gonna be register, return, render, we'll pass in request and then the template. Okay, so we're returning back the same template and we're passing in the page. Now, I just wanna make sure to create a view for this. So we'll copy login and we're just gonna do register. We'll bring in register right here and this is gonna be register page. So did I call the view there? So we'll do register page like that. So I can copy that, save it, bring that to the URL paste that in, save it, and now we have two links. So on or in the template here, we are gonna point the user to the register page here if they're not, or if they want that option here. So in Figma here, we have a design for the register page. So on the login page, we ask, haven't signed up yet, and then we have a signed up or a sign up link. And then on the register page, we'll say already signed up, and we're gonna point the user back to the login page. So. Let's go ahead and ask that question right here. So we'll ask that after the form and we'll say, haven't signed up yet. So we'll ask a question and then we're gonna add in a link here and that's pointing back to this page and we're just gonna say register or sign up. I guess that's two words. And we're gonna create the link itself and we're gonna point that to the register page. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna take this same question and we're gonna put that underneath the register form and we'll say already signed up. So we're asking the question and we're just gonna send the user back to login. And this will be the login page. Okay, so we passed in the page value here for a reason. So in this case, all I'm gonna do is check if the page is login. If it is, we'll render out the login form and if it's not, we'll render out the register form. So we'll just add in the question right here. So we'll just do if page is equal to login, then we'll just do end if, and if we'll close it, and then we'll add in the else statement between the two divs here. So we're just gonna separate those. We'll just do else, and let's save that. So just a little bit of prep work. Let's go back here. And let's check this out. So haven't signed up, we go, to, we go to this page and then already signed up, we can go to the login page. Now, Django has a user creation form that already makes a lot of this easy for us. So we'll go ahead and add this in here. So we'll just go ahead and make an import here really quick. So let's see, I need a second here. Uh, I just need to remember what the actual import was. So we'll go back to the views. So we have the template and the URLs here and let's go back to the views 
or views.py and let's just import this. So this is going to be from Django.contrib.auth.forms and we're just going to import the user creation form. So it works a lot like the model forms that we've already used. So we're actually going to customize this form later, but for now we're just going to work with the defaults here. So we'll copy this and we're going to bring this down into the register view. So we'll go ahead and pass in form and this is going to be user creation form. I just pasted that in and we want to pass this into the template here. So we'll just do form or the context dictionary. So we'll just throw that in right here and we'll throw in form. Okay, so at this point, I guess we don't actually need the register page variable because we already have that for login and register shows in the else statement. So we're just gonna pass in the form into the context dictionary. Now let's take this form value and let's go into this page here and let's just render this out. So underneath our CSRF token in between our submit button, let's just go ahead and pass in form dot as underscore p remember as p wraps the paragraph tags which makes the styling a little bit better so if i save this let's go ahead and check out what this looks like so we'll go to login if i go to sign up now we have an entire registration page now later on i'm going to want the user to submit things like their avatar or their profile picture maybe their name their email here and so on but for now we're going to leave it like this until we get to the customization and now there's a reason why i'm leaving that for later because we're going to have to customize a few things here and i just want to kind of focus on the basics here so we have a registration form here and now we can actually process this so let's go ahead and actually go through this so we'll go ahead and go into the view now we have our form we pass in the token we set the method here and let's continue so we want to check the method here so we'll just do request dot method or request dot method if this is equal to post let's go ahead and process this form so we're going to do form here form and that's going to be user creation form and we want to go ahead and actually pass in the data so we'll do request dot post so that's going to be the password and the username and all the credentials that we send then we want to check if the form is valid so if form dot is underscore valid so this is all pretty uh, redundant here at this point we've done this before so if the form is valid then let's go ahead and process the user now we're going to want to customize this user submission here so we can actually do something like this so we'll just do form and or actually we're going to do user and we're going to do form form dot save and we're going to commit this to false here so commit is going to be equal to false so technically what we're doing is we're actually saving this form and we're like freezing it in time here because we want to be able to access the user that was created meaning if the form is valid the user is going to get created but we want to be able to access the user right away so to do that we have to just add in commit is equal to false so we can actually get that user object so the reason why we want to do this is if for some reason the user added in uh, like a uppercase in there or a, they capitalize their name or maybe their email depending on how they're registering we want to make sure that that's lowercase automatically so we want to be able to clean we actually want to be able to clean this data so let's go ahead and do user dot username so we got the user that was just created and we're just going to do user dot username dot lower so we're getting the current user's name and we're going to update it to a lower case method so we're just making sure that that name is cleaned so once we have that we can actually save this user so we'll just do user dot save and i actually noticed one thing here i want to take this lower case method and i actually want to add this into the login method because what if the username is one way and then when they log in they accidentally capitalize something so in this case we want to take the username and we'll just do dot lower also in the login method so we just want to get rid of that issue here there's different ways of doing that too so once we register a user we can go ahead and just redirect a user so we can just do redirect and we want to send the user back to the home page so we'll just do return redirect and we're going to send the user back to the home page now before we do this i also want to log a user in so let's go ahead and do this we're going to use the login method so we have that method we're just going to throw in request 
and we pass in the user object. So the user that just registered, we're gonna log them in, send them to the, or and send them to the homepage. Now, if something didn't go correct here, let's go ahead and process this. We'll just do else here. And I'm gonna use a flash message here. So we're gonna do messages dot error. So if there was an error, let's see, I think we just need to pass in request. So we're gonna pass in request and then the actual message here. So let's try this, we'll throw in request and then we'll just say uh, an error. So an error occurred during registration. Here, let me just move this down so you can see it during registration. And is that supposed to be two R's? Okay, so yeah, that's supposed to be two. So now we wanna output this error. Now you can add in different types of error handling for maybe uh, if a username already exists in the database, you can do this with JavaScript or in the back end. There's a bunch of different ways that we can actually go about this. But for now, we're just gonna look for any kind of error in registration. So we pass in the user data, we throw that into the user creation form, we check if the form is valid. If it is, we get the username, we make sure that the username is lowercase, we save the user, we log the user in, and then we send the user to the home page. So let's give this a try now. So we'll go ahead and first I wanna throw in that error. So let's just try this. We'll throw in something like this and we'll just make sure the passwords don't match or something like that. So we'll just click register and we see that error. So an error occurred during registration. So we'll go ahead and try that again. Uh, let's see, we'll just do Eric for the name. So we'll throw in Eric, type in a username and password and we'll confirm that. And let's go ahead and hit register. And it looks like we are good to go. So I'm officially logged in. And just to test this out, let's go ahead and uh, add something into the header bar. So we'll go to the navigation bar and we'll just say, if request.user is authenticated, let's just output some text that says, hello, and then the username. So we'll just do hello, and then request.user. So request.user, and let's check this out. So if I refresh this, now I'm logged in as Eric. So there we go, we can add in new users. This user is now in the database. So we just took care of login, logout, restricting pages, and registration. So what I wanna focus on next is gonna be user uh, comment creation here. So if we go to a room here, so let's say I wanna go to, uh, I wanna learn HTML, I'm logged in as Eric at this point. I want to be able to actually make comments and join the conversation here. So let's go ahead and first work on the room page. So we'll close out the nav bar, close out registration and our URLs. And I promise we'll get to styling here in a little bit here, we're almost there. So we'll go ahead and go to templates, we'll go into room, and let's see what we have here. So at this point, I also wanna add in the room description if we have one, so we'll just do room.description. Okay, so we throw in the description, and I also want to output the comments that already exist in this room. So if we have a comment here, I wanna make sure to output that. So uh, let's see. At this point, let's just go ahead and add in another div here. So we'll create a div, and this is gonna to be to output the actual conversation. So we'll just do uh, comment dash wrapper, and let's just add in some kind of H3 tag, and we'll just say conversation. So we wanna be able to output this, throw in some kind of line break, and let's output all the conversation or the comments. So let's see, why is this div? Oh, I didn't close this up here. Okay, so inside of the room view, we'll go down here, room, let's just get all the comments here. So we'll just uh, get all the children of this room. So let's just go ahead and do comments or messages. Let's just do that. So we'll do messages. And this is gonna be equal to room dot message underscore set dot all. And I just realized we haven't talked about this yet. So, or at least I don't think we have. So message underscore set dot all. Uh, this can be tricky for the first time if you just see this. Now we can query child objects of a specific room here. So if we take the parent model, in this case, we have a room to get all the children. All we have to do is specify the model name. And in this case, it's message. 
And we don't put that in a capital letter. We put that in a lowercase value. So message the model name, and then we can do underscore set dot all. So it's basically saying, give us the set of messages that are related to this specific room. So we got the room and now we got all the messages. So let's go ahead and pass those into the context dictionary. We got all the messages and in here, we can just go ahead and loop through and output all of those. So we'll just create the for loop. So for message and messages, close out that loop. So end for, and I'm gonna wrap these inside of a div. So we'll throw in the div right there. And let's see, we just wanna output like the username and the message. So let's see what this is gonna look like in the end here. So we'll go back to the actual room design. So we're gonna output this, we're gonna output the title hosted by, and then the tag, which we won't worry about in detail. So let's just output the username when this was posted or when this comment was posted and then the actual message here. So the username, message, and the time since it was posted. So let's go ahead and do this. So we'll create uh, some kind of span tag. Let's just do small. And at first we wanna output the username. So we'll just go ahead and do message dot user so we're outputting their name then we're going to create some space and we can just do message dot created so message dot created and there is actually a filter that i can add to this so let's go ahead and actually check this out first so we'll refresh that and let's see where we have a conversation so let's see let's learn javascript i think i added in some messages here so i can see these messages right here and we have we have a small issue here because uh those messages inside of the django flash flash messages are showing up here too so we want to rename this actually so let's change this to uh room messages here so in the template that's how they're being output and that's going to give us an issue so we'll just do room and then messages and we'll camel case that actually let's just do underscore m so room messages like that so we'll change this name right here. Let's go back to the room. Let's do for message in room messages. We'll remove that. So we get those removed right there. And now we can see each message. So Dennis and Tim were added or were messaging in this room. And then we can see the time. So I don't wanna actually see the date. What I wanna do is have like a time since stamp here. So if I posted this like a minute ago, I wanna be able to see like posted one minute ago or five days ago, whatever that value is. So to do this, I can actually add in a pipe here. So that's gonna be a filter and we can do time since. I believe that's how it is right there. So if I add that in and refresh that, now I can see 20 hours ago or 20 hours and 10 minutes ago here. So we'll just add in a go like that. So we'll add in a space here and there we go. So Dennis posted 20 hours and 10 minutes ago. Tim commented 20 hours and nine minutes ago. And what I'm gonna do here is filter these down to only get the most recent message. So we'll just go ahead and uh, I can actually add in order underscore by like this. And we're gonna order by the created value. So in this case, I wanna order it by descending order. So the newest will be first and we'll just do created. So the most recent message at this point should be first. So there we go. So those just flip their order. So now we can see the actual message so we'll close this out right here. And I also want to output the actual message value. So for now, the styling is just gonna be pretty rough here. So let's just add in a line break so there is separation. And we'll add in a paragraph tag and we'll just do room dot or message dot body. Okay, so we'll throw that value in and let's check this out. Okay, so we see Hey, hi, and that's the conversation. Now, once we have that, I want to be able to actually create the, the user uh, comment section. So uh, let's do this one thing here. Let's make sure that a user can actually edit their own messages. Actually, we'll do that in a second. So let's first actually add in the form here. So inside of our comment wrapper, we're gonna create another div. So we're gonna create the div, and this is gonna be comment-form. So we're gonna bring that in and we'll just add in the form here. And this form here, the method is gonna be a post method. The action, well, it's gonna be sending a post request to the room view here. So we're good with that. We can send it to the same view. 
and we'll just add in a CSRF token. So we'll do CSRF underscore token. And let's actually add in the comment here. So even though this is a text field here, I'm going to add in an input field here. So I want to try to minimize the length of these messages. I want to uh, maybe encourage users to add in more messages. So in this case, we're just going to do type of text here, because if I add a text area field, it's going to leave us a little bit too much space here. So let's go ahead and set the name. We'll add in the body and placeholder. Let's see, what am I going to write here? So in here, we're just going to say, write your message here. So it's going to be a smaller field. So we'll just go ahead and do write your message here, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let's check this out. And there we go. So we see that and I'm not going to add in like a submit button because when a user hits enter, that's when I want to render that out. Now, I also want to make sure only an authenticated user can write a message. So we'll go ahead and create a condition here. We'll just say, let's see, we'll do if request dot user dot is underscore authenticated. I can never spell that word. So we'll just add in the end if right here. So we'll just do end if let's try this out. Refresh it. If I log out here, go to a room or that's in create. So let's just do uh, let's learn JavaScript. Now I don't see that form if I log in as Eric. So we'll just do Eric here. I'm logged in. We'll go to let's learn JavaScript. And now I can see this form here. So uh, let's go ahead and actually create the message itself here. So we want to submit the post request. So we'll go back to the view. And this is going to send a post request to the room view. So we'll go into room. And we want to create a condition here. So in the room view here, let's go ahead and process this. So we'll scroll down here. And we're just going to say if request dot method is equal to post. So if this is a post method, let's go ahead and set message. And this is going to be message dot object or objects dot create. So we haven't used this method yet. We've been using a model form. And by the way, I need to import message here. So I haven't imported that. So we'll import it, save it, bring it down here. And we'll go back to the room. So we've been using the model form and that kind of auto generates it for us. Now we have a create method so we can use a save method to update something or we can do create and this method does what it kind of sounds like it's just going to go ahead and create the actual message. So what I can do here is go into the model fields here. So we'll go into message, we want to set the user the room and the body here. So let's go ahead and first set the user. And that's going to be the logged in user. So request dot user. So we'll throw that in and then the room. That's going to be the room here. And let's see, we have the body here. So the body is just going to be what we passed in the form here. So we'll just do request dot post dot get and then we're passing in the body and we're passing this body in from here. So whatever we named it here, that's how we're going to get that data. So once we get the data, we're just going to go ahead and do return redirect. So redirect and we're going to send the user back to the room page. And at this point, we do have to pass in a dynamic value. So we need to pass in the primary key and that's going to be the room dot ID. Now, the reason why I'm doing redirect, uh, technically, I could just not do this and it's still going to be on that page, the form will be there and the page will refresh. But the issue is now, this is technically going to be a post request and it's going to mess up some functionality here. So we actually want that page to fully reload in a sense, clear what's going on and make sure that we're back on that page with a get request. So we just want to process that. So let's go ahead and try this out. We're going to test this here. So we'll go into the messages, refresh it and let's add a message. So we'll just say, what's up? We're going to join the conversation. If I hit enter, here we go. And I see Eric's message here that was posted zero minutes ago. So there's a few things that I can do here. I want to add in uh, delete functionality and I also want to add in participants here. So let's see, how do I want to do this? So if I go in here, we see a list of participants right here. So I want to be able to add these. Now for this, 
we're gonna have to add in some more functionality into our database here to actually do this. Now, we haven't talked about many to many relationships. I go over this inside of that course on Udemy, uh, but many to many relationships are just a never, another level of relationships in the database. And what this means is how a many to many or a many to one relationship works where you have one parent and multiple children. A many to many relationship means that multiple objects can be connected to multiple other objects and vice versa. So in this case, think of it this way. We can have a room that's connected to a user, but a user doesn't have to be only in one room. They can go to many other rooms and the rooms can also have many users. So it's like a uh, in interchangeable relationship, I guess. It goes uh, in multiple directions. So I would highly recommend looking that up. I'm not going into what, how many to many relationships work. That's a, a lot of other explanation there. So let's go ahead and actually add in participants here like this. So the first thing I'm going to do before we add that relationship is I'm going to go into this page here and I need to modify a few things. So the first thing is I want to change the layout here to actually add in some columns. So when I go to a room, let's learn JavaScript. Let's go ahead and actually clean this up a bit. So we'll go into room.html. And the first thing I want to do is, is create an entire container for the full room. So we're going to take this div. We need to wrap the entire room so we can actually create a grid. So we'll create the div here, and then we're gonna scroll down to the closing end block, and we're gonna create that there. So it's gonna indent everything for me. And I'm gonna give this a class of room-container. So we have the room container, and at this point, we wanna create two columns here. So I'm gonna create the first column. This will be the wrapper around all the messages and the form. So I'm gonna remove that div, bring that down here, and put that down here. So this div right here encapsulates all the content from the room name all the way down to this end if statement. Now, this column that we have for participants is gonna be on the right side. So I need to go down here and create another div. And let's just go ahead and start writing this out. So we'll create an H3 tag and we'll say participants. Okay, so it's one of those words that I have to like sound out. So we'll create a line break and we're gonna have that right here. So if I refresh that, now we can see participants. So let's go ahead and create the actual layout here. So we'll create some style tags here. And again, our template will fix all of this later. So the theme that we're about to install and we'll just do room dash container. So let's go ahead and do display grid. So we're gonna make this a grid. Keep saying frid, so grid. And then we'll just do grid template columns and we're going to say one FR and then actually we'll just, we'll invert it. So we'll do three FR like the home page here and we're going to do one FR. So fraction. Okay. So if I refresh this, now we see participants, we see the room description, the conversation and the message here. So in order to add the participants, we're going into models here and I commented this out here. So we have our room participants. Now, in order to create a many to many field, all we need to do is models dot many to many field like that. And that's what's going to create that model relationship. So give me one second here to prep. So all we need to do is go ahead and go to that room and we need to specify or we need to specify the actual relationship that we're setting. So we're going to add in the user here. So we already have this imported. That's the relationship and we have one small issue here because we already have a user model connected. We need to specify a related name. Now we can do this regardless, but in this case, because we have it, we need to specify it. And that just means that we can't reference a user because we already have a user up here. So in this case, the related name here is just going to be participants. Okay, so like that. I think, let me just copy and paste this there. So that's the related name. And then I also want to be able to submit a form without having to check something here. So we'll just do blank and that's going to be true. So if I save this, I need to run a migration now. So I'm going to open up my terminal and we're just going to do plus here. Let's go ahead and run these migrations. Make migrations. So we need to go through this process again. We're updating the database manage.py migrate. Okay. So those migrations were just added. I'll close this one out right here. Keep my server on 
and let's check out the admin panel first. So if I go in here, let's just do admin and I'm going to log in as a super user. So I was logged in as Eric. Eric can't be in the admin panel because he doesn't have super user status. So let's go ahead and go to our rooms. And if I go to let's learn JavaScript, we see our many to many fields here now. So I can actually add a few users. So what I can do is click on Dennis and then hit control. So I have to hold it down. It says this in this note right here. And then I can go to Tim and then I can save this. So let me just move my face out of the way. I'll just move myself up here somewhere. So we'll do that. And we're just going to do save. So if I go to, I want to learn HTML or where was that? It was JavaScript. So now I see that relationship. So we have two participants inside of this room. So to get those participants, we can just go ahead and go into the view and we're just going to bring the participants in. So we'll just go ahead and do participants like that. And to get those, we can just do room dot participants. So earlier on for a mini to one relationship, we can do the underscore set method right here for a mini to mini relationship. We can just do dot all, and we can even filter these down if we want. So we got all the participants, then we're going to pass those into the context dictionary. So let me just bring my face down here. So I'm familiar with where I'm at and we're going to throw that into the context dictionary. So we'll throw that in and we'll add in all the participants there. So that's going to indent that for me. And now we can actually access these inside of our room here. So let's see, we have all the participants. We're going to create this loop here. So we'll just do four, let's just say for user in participants. I don't want to keep writing that out. So for user in participants, and we're just going to lowercase that. And then let's just do an end of four. Okay. And then we're going to create a div around these set the, actually, we're not going to set a class name. Let's just go ahead and actually output the user's information. So at this point, we're just going to output a username because we don't have a full name here. So we'll just do um, a P tag here and then we'll just do at, and then we'll add in the user dot username. Okay. So let's check this out now. So later on these profiles will be clickable. So if you want to join a room, check out someone's profile, if they're in it, uh, you'll be able to just click on these. So now we can list these out. Now, what if Eric wants to join the conversation? So at this point, the user is not added in automatically. So let's log in as Eric and let's go ahead and go back to let's learn JavaScript. So Eric commented on here, but he's not in the room here. So we need to add in this functionality. So in the view, we need to go ahead and actually process this. So once the participant is added in this request.post method, before we redirect this, we're going to do room dot participants. And then we're going to do dot add. And we actually have a method like remove. So we can actually do remove later if we want to remove a participant and we'll deal with that later. So we have dot add and then we're just going to pass in the request dot user. So request dot user and this user will be added to that many too many fields. So a little bit of prep work there, but uh, that's how we're able to add a user and then render the user information out or the participants. So let's go ahead and add this. So this is going to be added when I submit that method here for a comment. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's just say, Hey, again, let's say Eric's mad because no one's responding. He submits that message. The message is right there. And Eric is now a participant in that room. So we just added participants and that looks good. Now, what I want to do here is also make sure that a user that's logged in can delete their own method or their own message. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll bring that in here and we'll make sure that a user can delete their own message. We'll go in here and let's go ahead and go into the messages. So we have the conversation for message in room messages. And let's see. So we're going to create two links here, or we'll just create one link. Let's just say we're like Twitter. We don't want to give people uh, editing functionality for whatever reason. It's pretty messed up that they do that, but I guess we're going to do it too. So let's just do delete. So for now we want to do delete. I'll recommend uh, as practice, go ahead and add in edit functionality too. So we're going to set the URL here. So URL, and that's going to be delete message. 
Okay, so we have a delete message link and I'm not gonna save this because this is gonna throw in an error right now because I don't have this URL. So let's go ahead and go to our views and let's first create that view. So at this point, what I'm gonna do here is just copy this entire delete view for deleting the room. So we'll paste that in here and we're gonna change this to delete message. So we need to pass in the ID. We wanna make sure the user is logged in before they can delete it. We're gonna get a message instead of a room. Then we're gonna check if the user is the message owner. So in the message, we have an owner or a user actually. So message has a user here. So inside of here, yeah, so we're going into that. So we have if the request is a request.user is not the message user, then we want to redirect them. Now, if they are, we want to process this. We're going to change this to delete or message dot delete. Okay. And then we're just returning back the delete template. Remember that template is meant to be dynamic, so it can render out that value as OBJ. So we'll change this to message. We just updated everything from room to message. We had to update this value and we just delete it. So we'll go back into the URLs. Now we do need a URL path for this. Let's copy the delete URL here and let's just go ahead and paste this. So delete room is going to be delete message and then delete message. All right. So we have the URL, we have the view, and we can now set that link. And the link has to be to message.id. So let's save that. Let's check this out. Uh, I also don't want to list this link out at all times. So let's do this. Let's make sure that only the owner can see, can see that delete message. So we'll just do, let's see, we'll back this up here and we'll do if request.user is equal to message.user then we can just add in and if and only the owner can see this question right here or this option so we'll do and if all right so we have that if i refresh this let's see we have an error request.user expected empty let's see if request dot, oh if okay so we forgot to add that so if request.user is equal to that let's go ahead and remove that save that and here we go so only eric can delete eric's messages i can't delete tim's or dennis's so let's go ahead and say we want to delete that message where did that send me okay so one second all right so we're going to delete message we'll go to the url that's sending us to the delete message view the delete message view is going to send us here so we are logged in it looks like it redirected us so if the request.user okay let's try this one more time so we'll go in here and that should return back the delete html template okay let's try this again we'll click on delete why am i going back to here so we see delete message for oh okay so it was the right page i just got mixed up by this navigation bar so now we see are you sure you want to delete Hey, again, so that's the message. And that was that object that we threw in there. So I can go back and that's going to take me back to the last page. I can go to delete and I can confirm that. And that message was now deleted and we can work on that URL routing a little bit later. So now we only see Eric or now we see that Eric only has one message here. So we are officially done with the message functionality. So all we had was create and delete functionality. Now, what I want to do is create some kind of activity feed here. So you see how we have this activity feed inside of this template here. So if I go ahead and for some reason I can't zoom out here. So we'll go down here. We'll go back to page one. So on the home page, you can see that we have this activity feed here. So I want to be able to create this full feed. So let's go ahead and build this out here. So we'll go to the home page and we're going to have to change this entire layout. So we're going to have the quick search, we're going to have all the rooms, and then we're going to have the activity feed. So we'll change up this layout. So let's go into home.html and we'll build this out. So we'll go into home.html. And what I'm going to do here is create another column and we'll just do one FR. So that means the two side columns will be one fraction or will take up one fraction while the middle one will take up the most. 
making that the widest one and they'll just auto adjust. Now I do need a column here in order for this to work. So we have our home container. We have our topics. So that's one, con one column. Then we have our center column and we need to create one more in order for those grid template columns to work. So we'll just go ahead and add in a div here and we're going to do class. Um, I guess we can just leave that like that. We don't need a class at this point and we'll just do H3 and we'll do recent, recent activity. So for this, I want to prompt users to actually engage in the website. If they come here, they don't see much activity. Uh, people are less likely to engage, but if they come in and they see an active feed here, they can actually see what's going on. Maybe at some point you want to build in like a social networking feature where you can follow people. You can modify this to only see what your friends are doing or people that you are following uh, are commenting. So if a friend of yours comments on something, it might look interesting. So you click on it, you check it out and it prompts you to engage. So that's what we're trying to do here. So in this case, we have recent activities. And because I created that third column and I updated the grid template column for that main container, let's check this out here. So now we have recent activity. So let's go ahead and see how we're going to do this. So let's see in the view, I think I'm going to have to actually uh, get some activity or some comments here. So we'll go down or go up to the home page. We have topics and then we'll just do, uh, let's see, how do I want to do this? We'll just do, uh, how did I call this inside of the room? I was going to say message conversations, but let's see. That was in the room, room messages. So let's just take this right here. So we'll just call it room messages. So that's going to be our activity. Maybe we can change that name later. We just can't use messages or it's going to mess up the flash messages that we have. So we'll go in here and we'll just do room underscore messages. So in this case, I'm just going to get all of them. So I'll do, I'll do a message dot objects dot all. And this is where you can change it to where only, uh, where, where you can only see maybe people you follow if you happen to build that in. So you'd be able to modify that right here. So we're going to have our room messages. We're getting all of those. Then we're going to go ahead and create our context dictionary. So let me just fix some indentation here and we'll just throw that in here and pass in the room messages. Okay, so we can see those. We queried all of those. So we'll go into the home page and let's output all of those. So that's at the bottom of the page here. We'll create the HR tag and we'll just do for, let's see, for message. I think I can just do message like that because it's a variable inside of the loop for message in room underscore messages. And let's go ahead and output that. I think I actually did that in the room, so it should be fine. So, end four. Okay, so we're gonna create the div. So we're gonna wrap every single message here. At some point, we are gonna wanna have styling here. And what do we wanna do here? So in this design, we want to output eventually the user profile, but for now, let's output the name, when it was posted, who they reply to, and then the message here. So let's see. So we'll go ahead and create a small tag here, and we'll just say at, and then the username. So we'll do message dot user. And then we want to say the time it was posted. So we'll just do message dot created. Let me just move this up. So message dot created. And then we'll just do time since. So we're going to use that filter. And let's take a look at this. So now we should see each message be output. So here we go. We see Dennis. Tim, Eric. So these are all the messages that we have in this entire website. So if Dennis goes to 100 days of code, we'll just say, what's this? Ask a question, go back here. And now we can see Dennis just message right here. So, or actually I'm Eric right now. So we see that it's ordered by, or it's ordered by the uh, oldest to the newest. So what I'm going to do here is actually change up this filter really quick or the ordering. So I can actually add in ordering to the entire class instead of having to do order by. So I'm going to remove that. And I always want to make sure that we get the most recent messages. So we're just going to copy this right here from the room model. And I'm going to paste this in right here and we're just going to order it the same way. So that should fix that. There we go. So the newest message is right there. And now we just want replied to, and then the name. So, We'll go here in home 
and let's just do another small tag. So we'll do small and we'll just do replied to. So we want to show the quote or not the quote, but the room that they're currently talking to later on, maybe you can add a user and we'll do replied to and then message dot room. So it's going to output the room and let's just indent this a little bit. So we'll do style and then here, let's see, is it indented here? Actually, we'll leave it like that. So we won't add in any styling. So we'll remove that reply to and then we also want to output the actual text here. So we'll just do message dot body. So in this case, uh, let's do this. I want to only output the string representation so I can just add in message without the actual uh, full message. So I only, only want to output the first 50 characters so I can actually leave that and that's going to output this value right here. So it's going to trim it down. So if somebody writes a long message, I don't want to have to see everything and then clutter up that sidebar. So here we go. We see Eric replied to 100 days of code and it shows what he replied. And then we see Eric replied to let's learn JavaScript and we can see sort of like an activity feed and a sidebar. So uh, let's go ahead and let's see what do I want to do here. I think I want to add in some delete functionality. So a uh, user should be able to delete their own messages from the activity feed also. So let's go ahead and add that in right here. So technically we can just go to the room and we'll just take this right here. And we already have all this built in. So we're going to the room. We're checking if the user is the current owner of that message. And we'll go back to the activity feed. And let's just put this at the bottom of the message. And let's just create a line break so we can see the difference here. So try this. There we go. So Eric can only delete his messages here. So if we can go here, delete it, confirm it. We're back on the home page. And there we go. So that functionality was mostly built in. Uh, at this point, I guess what we can do is we have the topics and we have the activities inside of the home page. Uh, I want to make them their own component here. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's build those in. So right now I want to be able to actually reuse this activity feed and these topics. And by the way, I can filter these down here. So if I want, what I could do is actually modify these components to filter down by a specific topic. So give me one second to prep this. So let's go ahead and change up the messages here. So what I could do is actually go into the view here and let's see, I actually want to show you this because this is actually pretty cool here. So I can actually use the Q lookup method and I can actually grab this right here and do messages dot filter. And then I can throw in Q and let's just throw in the topic name. So let's see the message model has a room. So we can do room underscore name. And if that is equal to a room underscore name is underscore I contains like that. And we can throw in Q here so we can actually filter that down by the room name. So let's try this. So let's say that the user is on this page and they want to see all the JavaScript rooms here. So if I click on this, now I should be able to only see all the activity for the JavaScript page. So let's go to web development. Let's uh, create a message here. So we'll just say, hey, right there. And then if I go back to here, if I go to web development, I should only see messages related to that. So let's see room, oh, room underscore topic underscore name or double underscore. So that should run that filter. So here we go. Now we only see the activity to this topic. If I go to JavaScript, now I see all the conversations related to JavaScript. If I go to all, now I see all the conversations. Okay, so I want to throw that in and let's make some reusable components now. So in this case, we'll create a new file and we'll just say activity underscore component dot html okay so activity component and what we're going to do here is make sure that we can use the same activity feed right here inside of uh, our profile page later on so when we go to a user's profile we want to be able to see all the activity for that specific user so let's say i go to eric's account i want to be able to see all of eric's activity and what i would have to do here is actually rewrite all this code right here inside of eric's account so i don't want to do that i can actually just make this into its own component
So we're also gonna do this for the feed and the topics here. So let's take all this right here. So everything inside of this div, we'll copy all of this, remove it, leave these two right here, and then go into the activity component. So we have the activity component, and then we can go into our homepage, and let's just include that. So at this point, if I save this and refresh it, all the activity is gone. So I can just simply include it now. So I can go ahead and do include. So we'll do include here and we'll just do activity and then underscore component dot HTML. Okay, so we have our activity component. If I refresh that, Oh, okay, so we need to go into base. So this is inside of the base app. So we need to specify the path and that's how it should work. So now we see recent activity. So I'm gonna do the same for all the rooms here. So let's see, uh, inside of the homepage, we have our activity. If I go to a room, if I actually go to a user's profile, I want to be able to render out the same components. So notice that in the, the user's profile, we still have the same activity component. So in this case, I want to make this its own component too. So let's do that. We're just gonna break things down into little compartments. So we'll just do uh, topics underscore component dot HTML. We'll break that down and let's see, we can go into home dot HTML, go into topics. So we have our home container topics. We'll take everything inside of this div, copy it and remove it go into topics, and then we can bring this in right here. So we're just gonna use include. And we need to go into base forward slash topic underscore component dot HTML. All right, so now if I refresh this, we'll still see our topic, base topic component did I name that wrong? So let's see, we have topics components. So let's just do topics. We'll save that, give that a test. And now we see our topic. So I'm doing this for a reason. So I know it seems a little bit repetitive, but one, it's showing you how this works. And uh, two is it's gonna save us from a lot of extra work here in a second here. So we're gonna go into the feed now and we're gonna do the same thing. So we're gonna do new file, feed underscore component dot HTML. Okay, so now we have a feed component. So we're going into home again, and we're gonna do the same thing here. So we see this div right here that takes in the entire room. Uh, at this point, I don't wanna take everything because I want to be able to save this only for the home page. So we're gonna take the actual items in that feed. So in this case, let's go ahead and go down here. So we're gonna leave the room count and this link, and we're just gonna take this div right here. So that everything that's gonna give us this for statement right here, this for loop. So we'll copy that, we'll bring that into the feed component, save it, and let's see. So back in home. And by the way, so we do have, actually let me just finish this up and I'll explain what's going on here. So we'll just do include, and we can do base feed underscore component dot HTML. So let's save it really quick. And the reason why we have access to all these items because uh, the reason why we have access is because we're passing this data into the context dictionary. Now this component is available inside of that template. So once the template actually sees it, it doesn't notice that they're different components. So that's why we have access to rooms inside of the room component, the topics and the activity. So they're brought into this page here and that information is basically being passed down into them and that's how we have access to them. So as long as they're used in the same page, um, if we just decided to drag this into another page without passing in that information, well, it wouldn't work that way. So that's how we have access to the components, topics, and the actual feed. Okay, so now that that's done, we want to create a user profile and pretty soon we're gonna move on to static files and that template. So let's go ahead and create an actual profile for a user. So we'll just do profile.html and we're gonna extend the main template. So we're gonna do extends here and this is gonna be main.html. Then we can do 
block content. And we can do end block here. So we'll close that off. End block content. Okay, so we have our home template. And at this point, let's just output the user's name. We'll just do an h1 tag and uh, we'll just do user.username. So before we style it, we'll uh, just make sure that we know what user's account we're visiting. So we just have a simple template for a user profile. So let's go into our views now. And inside of our views, we want to create a profile here. So let's just add that above our create room view and underneath our room. So create a new one here. So we'll do, or create a new view. So we'll do user profile, pass in request, return render, pass in request, base, and then we do profile. Profile.html will pass in the context dictionary. Throw that in right here. Okay, so there we go. So we have the context dictionary. Now we need a URL. Let's just take, let's see, I'll put this underneath room. So we'll create a new path here. Make sure you add in the trailing comma. And this is gonna go to profile and then we're getting the actual user's ID. So in this case, we're going into uh, str here and we're gonna pass in the primary key. Close that off, views dot user profile name and that's going to be user dash profile okay so we have a url now and we need to update this in several different areas here so in the home page actually i guess now it's not in the home page it's now inside of the feed component so we'll go into feed and we're going to output the host here so for this host inside of that at symbol uh, let's just actually change this to a link so we'll just wrap that and we'll say href and we're going to point to the URL. So we're going to do URL and then we're going into user dash profile and we're passing in the user ID. So we can go into room dot host dot ID. Okay. So that is inside of the feed component and we want to render the user's name. So this username, if I refresh it, now we should be linked up. If I go to Tim, Let's see, user profile got an unexpected argument PK. So let's go back to the view. We didn't complete this. We want to pass in PK and we want to get the user. So we'll just do user is equal to user dot objects dot get. And then we'll specify the ID, which is the primary key. And we can throw this information out. So let's see in the profile. We're passing that in as the user value and we have that here. Let's try to refresh that. Okay, so there we go. So now we see Tim, if we go back to the homepage, if I go to Dennis, I see Dennis's profile and we have the profile set up. So this is where things get a little bit faster here. So all we need to do for the profile, we're just gonna have three different columns here. So we're gonna have our topics, we're gonna have our, our feed, eventually the user's information and profile picture and the activity. So let's see, so for the user, let's go ahead and get all this user's rooms here. So we'll just do rooms, that's gonna be equal to user dot room underscore set dot all. Remember, we can get all the children of a specific object by doing the model name and then underscore set and then whatever we want there. So in this case, we're getting all of them. So we'll throw that in here. Remember that because we access rooms this way inside of the feed component or not the, yeah, the feed component for room in rooms, we need to access it this way. So now we're gonna pass in these rooms into that feed component once it's used. So we have that, let's go to the user profile and let's see, I wanna create some kind of container here. So we'll do forward slash div and we want to just throw in the three columns here. So we're gonna create three different columns and I'm just gonna copy and paste this. So we'll do one and then two. So this will be our activity, our feed, and then, or the topics, feed, and activity. So let's go ahead and include that now. So now that we have the rooms, we'll just do include base forward slash feed component dot HTML. So if I save this, now we don't have to rewrite that in. And if we make edits, they're just gonna be updated right away. So if I go to Dennis, 
here is all of Dennis's rooms right here. So let's fix the layout here. So we'll just do class profile container. And I'm going to create some styling here now. So we'll just do a style tag, close this out, and we can do profile container. What, what happened here? So style and Okay, so there we go. So we're gonna display this as a grid. So grid, and then we're gonna do grid template columns, and we're gonna do one FR, three FR, and then one FR. So in this case, I'm gonna change that to two. So let's check this out now. So actually, I wanna leave that as three. I wanna, I want it to look the same as the current homepage right now. So if I go ahead and refresh this, I'm on the profile page now. So we see the name and we see the center column right here for the activity. And you notice that if I go here, we only see my post here. So if I go to logo here, we see all of them. If I go to Tim, I see that Tim only has one room here. So we'll go to Dennis right now and let's output the actual activity here for me. So let's see, in this case, we're gonna do messages here. So let's see, how do I wanna do this? In, home, in the home page, I just did room messages. So this is all of my activity. And inside of the profile, I'll just do room messages. So all the messages that I've added in any room, and we'll just do user dot message underscore set dot all. That'll render those out. And at this point, let's also get the topics. So we'll just do topics and that's going to be equal to topic dot objects dot all. So we need that because we need to access all of these inside of that component. And let's see, so we can go to profile and let's just copy this right here. This will be the topic component. Then we can bring this in right here and this is going to be activity. Okay, so now if I refresh this, topics, okay, so that's supposed to be topics. All right, so there we go. We see all the topics for some reason, they are not being rendered out. I think I forgot to pass those into the context dictionary. Yeah, so I need to grab these and I need to bring those in here. So we'll throw those in right here, topics and then topics. Okay, so I save that. Let's check that out. And here we go. So if I filter these, this is going to take me back to the home page. Uh, recent activity. Did I not comment on anything? Let's see. So room messages is user dot message underscore set dot all. That needs to be messages with an S right there. And that should do it. Okay. So now I see all of my activity or all of Dennis's activity. If I go to or Eric's actually. Then if I go to, or no, I'm logged in as Eric, but I see Dennis's activity. If I go to someone else's, let's go to Eric. Let's see, let's check out Tim here. He's only got one message in there. And then if I go to Eric somewhere here, let's see. Oh, Eric never posted a room. Okay, so let's try this. In order to go to Eric's room, let's uh, move my face down here. Let's also update the links inside of the activity. So the cool thing is, is I can just update it in the activity feed and I don't have to update it everywhere. So I can just go to the activity component and I'm just gonna wrap this right here. So I see the user, we're gonna wrap this inside of a link. So we'll do an A tag here and we're gonna take this closing tag and we're gonna put that just after the username. So we'll just do href and that's gonna point to the, that specific user. So I hope you're starting to see how things are becoming more dynamic by creating this uh, or making this reusable here. So we'll just do user dash profile and then the user ID, which is message dot user dot ID. Okay, so now if I go here, refresh it, I can go to Eric's account too. Now I see all of Eric's activity. Eric has two comments here and that's how we can actually link this up to the actual profiles. 
So in this next section, what I want to do is work on static file configuration. So static files are basically any CSS files, any images or JavaScript files. And uh, in definition, they're static. So Django has its own way of configuring this. So right now we've been writing our CSS inside of our templates and we don't want to do this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to eventually move all the CSS outside of our templates and we're going to create our own style sheet. So in Django, we first need to create our static files. We need to let it know where to find these and then we can actually render these out dynamically in a temp template. So there's different types of static files. We can configure images, we can configure CSS and JavaScript files, and they all have their own way of actually doing things. So let's go ahead and create a new folder inside of the root directory. So static files will start off this way. We'll just create a folder called static. And in this folder, we're gonna create another folder for all of our CSS files. So we'll just do styles. And in styles, I want to create a main.css file. So in static, I also want to eventually create a folder to store all of my images. So we're just gonna do images here. And there we have our styles. So we have a static folder. These are our static files. Now to actually let these be used inside of our templates, let me close out all these links because I have a bunch of them open. Let's close everything out and let's go into the settings.py file. And we need to let Django know about these static files now. So it has no idea that this static folder even exists here. So what we're gonna do is create a variable called static underscore files underscore or static files and then underscore dirs. So static files directories. And we can actually host static files in multiple areas just like we did with our templates directory. So up here where we pointed to base dir and templates, well, we can do the same thing for our static files and we can just say uh, base directory and then we'll point to static. So this is gonna let Django know we have static files inside of this folder here. So that's officially connected. Now, in order to actually use these static files, let's go ahead and actually add in some CSS here. So we'll specify a body tag and we'll just say background color and let's just set this to this uh, aquamarine color here. So to make this work, what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna bring this into, let's see, we're gonna bring this into main.html here. So inside of our templates, we'll put this into main.html. And this is why it's good to have this template because I'm gonna apply this style to this template and it's gonna apply it to all the children templates that we have, so all the pages. So in here, what I'm gonna have to do is just do load static here. So that's one thing that we have to do is we have to let this template know that we can actually use the static tag. So once I load that in, I'm just gonna change this right here to double quotes. And we're just gonna add in 2% or two curly braces, the percent symbols, and we're gonna write static. So what this is gonna do is static is gonna tell it to go ahead and find this static folder. Now we need to specify a path for this CSS style sheet. So we have a link here. And now in single quotes, because these two are double quotes, we're just gonna go into the styles folder. So we'll do styles forward slash main dot CSS. So if I save that, that should now apply that static file. So you might have to do control shift R. And now on every single page, we have this background right here for all of our page because or all of our pages because that's inside of here. Now, we can also do images here. So uh, if we wanted to add in an image, we would just add in, let's see. So I'll actually try this right now. So let's go into our project here. I'm gonna go into my desktop and we'll just find a picture here. So we're gonna copy one of these pictures from these diagrams and I'll just take models here. So we'll take models, I'm gonna copy that. You can just grab any image that you have and place this into your project file. So go into static, go into images and paste that in there. So once we have that, in order to use the image inside of your template here, let's go ahead and uh, bring this into our main.html file. So we're just gonna do image, close that off here. And then for the source, we're just gonna do the curly braces. We'll go to static. And I wanna know if you can guess this, what do we do next? Well, we go into the images folder. So we're going into static and then images. And we're going into models and let's see, whatever I call that, whatever picture you're using, so models.jpg. So now that image can be used. So 
if I save that, there we go. And now this picture is inside of my website. So I don't, I don't actually want to have that there. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove that. But that's how we can add in CSS, JavaScript and images. Now there are differences for user uploaded images, which we'll get into like when a user uploads their profile picture, we do have to configure things in a different way for that. We're going to use something called static underscore root. And we'll get into that later. So I'll just comment that out here. So we're going to comment that out. And we also have to configure some URLs for that. And also static files in production are going to be handled a little bit differently than they are in development. Okay, so before we jump into the next section where we'll be installing our theme, I want to fix up a few things with the website that I noticed. So the first thing is inside of main.html, I accidentally added this extra li tag here in the flash messages section. So if you added that, just go ahead and get rid of that and make sure you have an opening and closing li tag. So a small mistake. Uh, if you made it, go ahead and fix it. If not, just ignore this right here and let's move on here. So in this next part, I want to fix the create room form here. So at this point, when we go to create a new room, we have this option to select a host here. Now that was good when I was just showing basic CRUD operations, but at this point, we don't want to be able to select a host. We want this host to automatically be added based on whoever's logged in. So if I'm logged in as Dennis at this point, I want this to be automatically added and this field shouldn't be visible. So the first thing I'm going to do here. Oh, and I also don't want the participants to be visible here either. So we'll get rid of both of these. So what I can do here is go to my base app here. So we'll go into forms.py and typically we could just render out every single field item that we want by specifying all. And we can also add in a list where we select the exact fields that we want to render. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use the exclude method here. So that's also an option. And this is going to be a list here so I can get rid of the host here. And then I'll go to models here. So we'll see. Uh, I also want to exclude participants. So we'll go ahead and add that and we'll exclude these two fields. So if I save this, so if I refresh it, now we don't see host and now we don't see participants. So these should be automatically updated. So the next thing is I also want to make sure that the back end knows how to process this. So in the view now, we're going to have to update a few things here. So we'll go into views and we're going to need to go to the create room view. So in here we have a standard form on the post method. We get that data and we save it. And now we're not submitting a host. So what I'm going to do here is go ahead and get the room value. So we'll set the room to whatever saved on the form. And for this, we need to set commit to false. That's going to give us an instance of this room. So we've already done this and well, we did it in another view here. So now what I can do is just go ahead and do room dot host and we're going to set that to request dot user. So you can only create a room if you're logged in. We already added that functionality. So now we know that a host will be added based on whoever's logged in and we'll just do room dot save. So we just added in one more step here where we set the host and that's it. So now if I save this, let's go ahead and try to add a new room. So I'll refresh it. We'll select a topic. And by the way, with the topic, I'll also add in functionality where you can add a topic if one doesn't already exist. So if you want to select a new topic, let's say uh, one is something like study for backend developers, you will have the option to select and search or just generate your own topic. But we'll add that once we install the theme. So we'll select this and we'll just do uh, study with me and triple exclamation point so we can see that. And if I submit that, here we go. We should see that right here and we see the host as Dennis. So I'm logged in, all that's working. And now we can move on to installing the theme. So our website looks pretty ugly at this point, especially with this blue color. And I want to talk about how theme installation works. So typically you would work with some kind of designer if you're working at a company. Uh, you would work with some kind of design team and they would give you a theme. You would have the designers and front end developers generate all this awesome content for you. And you would write the back end logic and just learn how to install a theme as opposed to writing that all up on your own. Or maybe you are a sole developer. Uh, you might not always want to build out all your own code in the front end. Maybe you just want to focus on one part. This is where buying a theme or getting a free theme online might work better for you. So I want to show you how this installation process works. Um, instead of hand coding all this up, this is an important thing to know how to do. So we're just going to go ahead and install that. Now, how this will work is we have a standard theme with some HTML, some CSS and a little bit of JavaScript. We're not going to worry about the CSS and JavaScript part that's already added into the theme and that's just going to add functionality where we need it. So we don't need to worry about that. 
So we're gonna need to grab these HTML files and we're gonna have to replace a lot of the content that you see. So every single page here, we're basically gonna get those pre-built templates we're gonna add them into our code and then we're gonna to have to do things the Django way. So uh, for example, the theme with the CSS files and the JavaScript files, these are all set uh, with file paths that are already connected to that specific theme. So we're gonna to have to add our static files the Django way, or we're gonna to have to replace all of our images and any other filler content with our Django tags and loops and uh, if and else statements. So we're basically gonna to have to add the templates and then modify the data that's inside of them. So we'll just go ahead and get right to it. So to get this theme, go ahead and go to the GitHub repo. And this is gonna be in the source code and this is gonna be in the theme folder. So if I click on this, we're gonna see all these templates that are already built out for us. We see all the assets, so logos, icons, anything that we're gonna use, that's already in here. So we're just gonna start installing this stuff. So I already have this on my desktop, so to get this, just go ahead and go here, download this entire repo, extract the theme section, and you can start working with that. So I already have that in my desktop right here. So that's the theme folder, and I have my project files right here. So if I open up the theme folder, once you have this installed, go ahead and just open up one of the files here. So this is index.html. So this is all static data right here. This is uh, just rendered out in HTML code, and this is what we're gonna install and then modify here. So let's go ahead and start by adding in the home page here. So what I'm going to do here is go ahead and open up both files here. So this is going to be the theme on the left. So on the left side, that's my theme. And on the right side, this will be my project files. So we're going to open up study bud right here. And this is going to be on the right. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and replace the home page with the theme template here. So let's go ahead and go into base. We'll go into templates, base, and let's take index.html. So in the theme, index.html is gonna represent the home page here. So we'll rename it in a second. So I'm just gonna copy this, or you could just drag it in here and bring that in here. Now my current home page, this is gonna be set to underscore old. So I'm just gonna change the name and I'm also gonna change index right here to home.html. So we want to show the theme files. So we'll do home.html and that view on the home page knows to render this out. So let's go ahead and see what we have here. So if I go in here, if I refresh this, home.html does not exist. Let's see why this is happening. That shouldn't be the case. So we'll see, we have a view here, we have home and we have our templates and home. Okay, so I added in .html there twice by accident. Okay, so now it should exist. So if I refresh this, this is that theme here. So if I open up the theme on its own, we see all the styling. So why is this styling not being output here? So for this, we need to go ahead and add in our themes CSS files. So we're not even gonna bother with, with what's in here. We're just gonna bring that in and let the styling apply. So let's go back into our main project folder and let's go to the static folder. We'll go into styles here and we're just gonna take style, style.css and we're gonna bring that in. And at this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of, actually I'll leave main.css main in there for now. So we dragged in the main.css file. Now to add in the styling, all I need to do is go ahead and go into home.html and you see how the styling is pointed like this with a file path? Well, that's because it works in the theme that way. They're in the same file. So what I need to do here is simply add in static here. So we're gonna load static. So we need to load in this tag and we're just gonna change how this file path points to that CSS file. So we're gonna add in static, add in a single quote around this and we're just gonna go ahead and add in the percent symbols. So now if I save this, the CSS file should be applied here. Actually, I need to go into styles and then style.css. So if I go into static, we can see the file path right here. So again, I'm not worried about the details of that CSS file that should be applied to the theme. So if I refresh that, you might have to do a control shift R. Now we see all the styling being applied here. So this isn't exactly how we want things. I just wanted to show you how to connect that CSS file. So what we need to do is we need to connect this main template to our main.css file. So we're gonna take all of these contents. We're just gonna do control A, select everything from home.html with the theme styles and that new static file. 
and we're just going to go into main.html here. So what I'm going to do is paste this above. So we're going to move all the original contents down. And again, there's different ways in how you can go about this. But for now, because I already have content, I'm just going to slowly move out content and replace it. So everything from home.html is now going to be pasted inside of main.html. So I'll just comment out that JavaScript file. And now we have all this content inside of main.html. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and minimize this header section. And I'm going to take everything inside of main here. So we're going to highlight everything in this opening and closing main tag. So this is the content for the actual home page. So I'm just going to minimize it and I'm going to remove it. So we'll go ahead and take all of this and get rid of that. Now I'm just going to go ahead and take this nav bar and we're going to bring this into this theme here. So underneath the header here. So we'll bring that in like that and we'll take this opening and closing block tag. We'll bring this, let's see, inside of the themes body tag here. So I think we're actually supposed to have a body tag here. So I was supposed to leave that. Let's check this out here. No, I already have that body tag. So that's already there. So body starts and closes right here. Okay, so we have the block tags and we're just going to add in this message right here or the flash messages. So we're just going to bring this in right above or underneath our nav bar and above our block tags here. And let's go ahead and now get rid of all the original content. So we have this section here where we load in that style sheet. There wasn't much, there wasn't too much to it. So let's get rid of all that. And there we go. So I'm scrolling a little bit here, but I hope you see what I'm doing. I'm taking all the content from the theme, pasting it in and adding in the Django stuff. So now if I save this, let's go ahead and also go into home now. So we'll go into home and because we have this main theme wrapping our homepage, we now no longer need the head tag and we no longer need the header here. So let's go ahead and get rid of the header. So I minimize that. This is in the home.html page. So we're gonna get rid of that. Let's take everything from the opening body tag. We'll also remove that. So delete that. And then at the bottom, let's remove HTML all the way to the script tag. So we have our theme styled inside of main.html here. We have these two block tags. So block content and end block. And remember, we're extending the main template. So now in home.html, we're just going to go ahead and extend the main template. Remember, we still have the original home.html that we can refer to. So it's home underscore old. So we'll just go ahead and do extends. And this is going to be main.html. Now, all we need to do is wrap this main tag inside of our block tags. So we'll go ahead and just do block content. And then at the bottom, we just want to wrap all of this here. So this is going to be more tedious. Once you see it applied, you should be able to understand how to finish up the rest here. This entire section is going to be a little bit longer just because we're going to be going line by line and changing up all the contents here. So now we extend the main theme. So let's save main.html and home.html. So we're going to save that. Let's refresh it. And here we go. So we see our original nav bar here. So we're going to fix all this up here. And the home page right now, even though it's in our Django project, is still all static. So we're going to start replacing this section here. So the next thing I want to do before we go to the home page is I want to set this navigation bar. So the reason why we see this is because we're including our nav bar inside of main.html. So we include the nav bar. Now we have a new navigation bar from the theme. It's in this header tag. So we're going to take the bottom header tag all the way to the top here. We're going to copy that and then just delete it. So we have it saved right now. And we're going to go into navbar.html. So again, let's paste this all above the original content and then we'll slowly replace it. So let's go ahead and see what we need to do here. So in this original section, we had a logo that goes to the home page. I can get rid of that. We had this form that sends us to the home page as a get method and it passes in the queue method. So let's go ahead and update the form inside of the theme. So let's see, we have the link here. Let's Django fi this, I guess, if that's the right term. And we'll just make this a Django link. So we'll just do URL. That's for the logo that we're, gonna, that we're about to update. And we're just going to do home. So we update the home link. Then we have our form. 
So for the form, the method is going to be a get method. And we're going to send this to the home page. So we'll just do action. And that's going to send the user to home. Okay, so for the actual search field, so we have an SVG file, I'm going to minimize that just to clean that up. For the search field, we just have to specify the name and that's going to be Q and it says search post in here. So let's see. So we, we set the method, we set the action and we set the name. So I can now get rid of the original search form. So if I save this, everything should still be good. So if I hit enter, we're still seeing that be added right there. And this navigation bar is slowly getting removed. Now, the next thing is I want to update this section right here. So I need to add in some JavaScript. So you see how as I, as I click on this, this section should open up. It should be like a little drop down menu item. So that's not working because our theme also requires a JavaScript file. So we'll open up these two files here. On the left, we have our theme. On the right, we have our Django project. So we'll go back into the static folder. So we're going back into static and let's create a new folder for JavaScript. So we'll just call that JS. And then in our theme here, let's see, we should have a script file. So that's our JavaScript file. Let's just drag that into JS here. So now we have that JavaScript file. Now, in order for that to work, let's go ahead and go back into our main.html and let's bring that in here. So I commented that out and originally it was just pointing to script.js, but now because this is in our static files, this isn't gonna work here. So we need to wrap this inside of a static tag. So we'll do static, single quote, and then a single quote and percent symbol and curly brace. Okay, so now that I added that static tag, I should be able to do a control shift R, just do a refresh. And if I click on this, this should work. Okay, so I actually didn't do that right. This is supposed to point to JS forward slash script.js. So that was the file path based on this structure right here. Okay, so if I refresh that, now if I click on it, here we go. We see this drop down menu with two links. So I want to update the user. So I want to show the currently logged in user. And I also want to implement this condition right here. So in the nav bar, we have if the user is authenticated, show the username. If not, then we want to show the login button. So let's go ahead and take request.user and let's go to this section. So let's see, this is going to be just underneath the form. We're going to bring this in into the header user section. And we're going to worry about the user images later. We haven't done that yet. And I left that for the last section for a specific reason. And I'll explain why later, but we will actually have user images. So for now, let's go ahead and just output the username. And then for the actual name here, uh, let's just output the username again. So we'll just do user dot user name. Okay, so that's the first part here. So let's see, how do I want to update this? So this is the not logged in section. So let's take this little section right here and let's bring this down under the user here. So we'll save that and let's take this condition. So if the user is authenticated, we'll scroll up here. So if the user is authenticated, let's put that above our header user section and let's add an end if underneath this comment here. So we'll just do end if. So this is all this process is, is just simply changing out this information. So I'm going to remove this HR tag. We're going to comment all this out and let's go back to this condition. So we have, if the user is authenticated, show the user section, and then we'll just do else. And let's comment or remove the comments here. So now we have this link right here that takes the user to the login page, which we need to update. So we'll go into URL login. So if the user is not logged in, that's the else statement, take them there and say login. So let's try this. So we're still gonna have to update some images here. So if I refresh that, if I open this up and click log out, let's see in log out, I actually wanna send the user there. So let's see if the user is logged in, we send them to the profile page or we have a log out button here. So let's see, where is that logout button? Does it say logout in the template? It does. I just can't find that text here. So the username. 
Okay, so down here, so underneath that condition. So this is hidden if the user doesn't click on that. So we have this logout link right here. So it opens and closes right here. So let's change this to logout. So URL logout. And then that's going to be in single quotes. Okay, so now if I click on this, I log out. So now it says log in. So the user is logged out and the user can log in now. So if I click log in, it's going to take me to this form and this is all going to be clean in a second. And now I'm logged in and that username will be uploaded or updated. So there is an icon here that we want to add. And we also want to add in a logo right there. So let's open up the theme files on the left and open up our project files on the right. Let's open up the static folder and let's just get rid of this models file. We don't need that. And let's go into assets and let's just take all of this and drag this in right here. So now we see an avatar and we see a logo and a favicon. So we'll go back to the theme here. Let's go back into our static files and let's update that. So for the logo, this needs to point to the static folder. So we're just going to add in that the curly braces and percent symbol. We'll go into static and then we're not going into assets. Now we're going into images. So we'll change this to images and that's going to be logo.svg. We'll wrap that in a single quote percent symbol and curly brace. So that should add the logo. So it looks like I used the static tag and I have not imported that into my navigation bar. So just above header, let's just import the static tag so we can use it. We'll just do load static, save that and let's give this a test. Okay, so now we see our logo. So the logo is done and there needs to be an avatar right here. So I'm just going to copy this section all the way up to this forward slash and let's find that avatar. So the avatar is going to be right here somewhere. So in the login section, we'll just remove assets, paste that section in, and then wrap this in a single quote, and then a percent symbol and the curly brace. And that should complete it for our header section for now. Okay, so there we go. We haven't added in or we haven't added an account section yet. So if I click on this, we can log out. And we still need to work on the settings section and that's where a user can update their information. Now let's go ahead and move on to this section. So this is all static information. This is all hard coded in from the theme and we need to update this because we don't have 553 topics and all these topics for Python. This is not in our system yet. So we need to change all this. So we're going to go back into home.html. So let's close our nav bar and let's close main.html. If I miss anything, there's a good chance that I will because there's a lot of code to update. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and finish out the video and I'll add in uh, like a final section in this video where we clean up anything that I missed. So let's go ahead and go into main or uh, home.html and let's clean this up here. So in home, the first thing I want to do is I want to get the topics here. So here we have a topic section we see this comment right here. This was all done by my designer, Shavir Shuvo. So he put in good comments here so I can find where topics start and end right here. So I can minimize this section and I can see where everything is. So what I'm going to do here is I need to include the topics component. So remember in our original template in the old template, which I named home underscore old, we're going to take this topics component right here. So let's take this, let's copy that. And let's bring that into home.html. So let's go ahead and just paste this in right here. And now what I want to do is do exactly what we did with the navigation bar. So I'm going to take all these topics. So it's minimized. That's going to copy all of them. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to remove it. And then we're going to go into topics here. So depending on how you have your website, it's going to change how you uh, install a theme here. So at this point, you should already start seeing what's going on and start understanding it. So Let's go into the topics component and let's do this again. So let's get rid of browse topics. Uh, let's go ahead and just get rid of this URL here and let's keep this loop. So I'm going to paste in the templates topic section inside of my topics component. Then what I want to do is get rid of all of these topics except for one. So we'll just keep Python here. So now we have Python. 
Uh, for all, we're just gonna set that URL to the home URL. So we're just gonna do URL and that's gonna be home. And let's take this loop right here. So let's copy this loop. Let's put that above our Python li tag and let's close this off here. So we'll just do end for, and we can just go ahead and take this link right here. Let's copy that, paste this in as this link right here. And now I can just get rid of this. Okay, so now I just need to update this a little bit. So we have the topic section included. And in this section, we want to render out all the actual counts here. So the correct numbers. So for this section, we want to output the actual topic name. So this is nothing new. We'll just do topic dot name. And now it's going to be in a styled format. So for the count, we haven't done this, but what I can do here is just do topic. So I can actually do this in the template. So I can do topic dot. Uh, let's see, we're going to do what's the child object. So that's the room underscore set dot all. And I don't need to add in curly braces here. And then I can just do dot count. So in the template, I'm not actually going to add in not the curly braces, but the percent symbols. So I'm just getting all the topics, all the child objects, getting the entire query set, and I'm just going to do dot count. And then I forgot to add in the curly brace. So that will give me the current number. So for all, I also want to get this too. So that's going to be topics. Actually, what I could do is just go to this topics query set. So we'll just do topics dot count. And that's going to give me all the topics. So I updated the count on each topic and the full number. And I also updated all the actual links here. So at this point, let's go ahead and save that. And if I refresh it, there we go. Now the topics component is updated. So if I click on Python, we can see the search bar, JavaScript, web development, and we'll get to the more section later. So that's something I want to do towards the end. I don't want to spend time on that. So for the study room, let's go ahead and actually build in the feed and update this value. So for the study room, we'll go back to home.html. And let's see. Let's go into this section right here. So we're going to go ahead and update this. So we'll just do rooms dot count. I think that's how I had it. So let's open up the original homepage. So old homepage. And that was just room count. So we actually had a full variable with that value. So we'll just change that. That should update the number Four rooms available. That's more like it. And now we want to update the feed here. So for the feed, uh, we don't want to update this entire section. So we have this room list section. So it starts and closes way down there. So we have the mobile version of this. So we're not going to worry about that. There's a search form in here. Don't worry about this form. Let's minimize the mobile version. Then we have our room list header. So that's where we have the count. We're not going to worry about that. So let's minimize it. And then we have our room list item. So room list. Okay. So these are the individual items. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and keep the original room list item. So it starts right here and it closes on line 80 at this point. And then let's take the second one, minimize it and remove it. So we only need one because we're going to loop through them and let's go ahead and take this room list item. So copy it and remove it. And let's go to the feed component. So we'll go ahead and paste this into the feed component. So now let's go back into home and let's just go ahead and include the feed. So we'll just do include and we'll just do base and then feed underscore component dot HTML. Okay. So we include this feed component underneath the header. So there's already technically a container around it. So everything's already wrapping it. So let's go to the feed component and let's check this out here. So in the feed component, we have this room list item. So I want to minimize that, take this value. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and start cleaning this section up. So we're going to get rid of these two divs right here. And let's just take this for loop and let's put this above this item right here. So we're just going to copy this. And we're going to create like a copy of this section down below. So we're just going to copy that. And if you refresh your page, it's going to be a little bit messed up at this point. So we have a for loop and we're outputting each item. So we just want to update with all the contents inside of here. So 
Uh, in the actual template, we decided to, uh, me and my designer, Sharir Shuva, we decided to get rid of these edit and delete buttons and let the user do that from their own profile. So we're gonna get rid of this section and let's just go ahead and update the actual room list item line by line. So the first thing is we have a link to the user profile. So we're just gonna go ahead and add in a URL tag. So we'll just do URL and then user dash profile. And then we'll just take the room.host.id. So we'll add that in for the avatar. Well, that's gonna be updated once we add the user icon here. We'll change the username. We'll just do room.host.username. So we're just going upwards there. And we're gonna change this section for the actual time it was posted. We'll just do room.created. And then we'll just do the time since filter. Okay, so we have the username, we have a link, the created time for the title here. We just wanna change that to the room title. So room or the room name and we wanna update the link to point to the room. So let's just scroll down here and take this link right here to the room. We'll take this, go up here, back to the room name, and we're gonna paste that around the link. And I'm also gonna get rid of the description. I don't like the description in there. For some reason, the more I look at it, it just makes the uh, feed look a little bit more cl uh, cluttered. So I figured if users want to have a description, maybe you can have like the beginning of the description and just trim it. That can also work too, but I feel like it would look better without it. So now in this section, we have some more data about the room or information. Let's just take this URL and this also is gonna wrap this section. So what is this right here? This is the icon of the joined section or the how many people have joined section. So the icon that shows the users. Let's paste in the room link here. And let's see, there's nothing in the room to update. So I'm gonna try going through this section as slow as possible. So we want the room topic. So room dot topic dot name. And let's see, in this section where we have all the participants, we can just, or uh, we can see how many people have joined the room. That's gonna be the participants. So we'll just do room dot participants like that dot all dot count. So we can just get all of those by that many to many field. Now, I think that's it for all the links and all the content. I think we're done. Again, we'll go back and fix it. So I can take this bottom loop right here, get rid of that and all the information should be updated. So let's save that. And let's go back to our feed here, or uh, let's go back to our template, refresh that. And here we go. This is now the rooms that I have. So we can see all the rooms here. All these are linked up here. I can go to the user and I can see how many people have joined. That's also clickable. We see the topic and that looks good. Okay, so we're gonna get to the user profile really soon and the user profile is gonna be really easy because it has the same components. So all we're gonna have to do is update the actual title. So, or not the title, but the, the container. So the last thing I wanna do here on the homepage is update this activity feed. And once we update the activity feed, the activity feed in the user profile will also be updated. So let's go ahead and go back here. We'll go to the activity feed and let's go to the homepage actually. And let's just take a look at this. So we have our homepage. We have the feed component. Then we have this comment that says where the activities start and stop. So we have all this content and we're just gonna go ahead and put this into a component. So the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and add in the activity component. So we'll, we'll use the include tag. So we'll just do include, and this is gonna be base for slash activity underscore component dot HTML. So let's grab all this content right here. So this is all inside of one main div. So we're gonna grab all of that, I'll minimize it and then copy it. So we'll copy this, remove it, and let's go to the activity component now. So. In here, I'm just gonna get rid of this title here. We'll do the same thing like we did with the room component or the, the feed component. We're gonna paste in the activity feed and we're gonna start updating things. So what do we have in here? So we have a link to the actual post here, to the actual room based or the user's profile. So whoever made that comment. So let's take this link right here and let's go back into the styled component and let's see, so we have the profile which we link to. 
So we're gonna paste that over. And let's actually just grab one item. So it looks like there's two items in the activity feed. So I'll minimize the first one. And we'll just grab the second one here. Let's see, is it the activities box? It is, so it's the activities box. So let's minimize that and let's take the second one. We only need one and we're just gonna be looping through these. So we have the link here and we haven't created the for loop yet. We'll create that in a second. We have the logo that's about to be created. Then we have the actual username. So we'll go down here and let's just take the username. So message.username, which we're gonna be outputting through the loop. And we'll take the time since tag here. So the created time, we'll put that in right here. And let's see, so we also want a link here to be able to remove it, to actually remove an item. So let's create the for loop. So let's take this for loop, for message and messages, then we output each activities box. So we put that right there, find the closing tag to the activities box and create the end for loop, so end for. Okay, so in this section, this is where we're gonna have an if statement right here. So this is gonna be the delete icon. We only want users who made the original post to be allowed to delete it. So we're gonna create this condition right here around this item right here. So the room list, the room list room actions. Okay, so blame Shuvo for the CSS convention there for the naming. Okay, so we have the user, we check if it's the user, and if it is, then we just take that delete link and we're gonna throw that in right here. So that's gonna be in this condition right here, throw that in, that's gonna be an X icon here. So that's an SVG image. So we have that right there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this condition from this section, just wanna clean things up. So we'll take everything from here. We also wanna output the message. So where was the message? So the message is right here, so the room content. So we have the remove item. Underneath that, we have the room content. So we'll just do, or the message dot body. So the message body itself. And then we have the reply to, so that's gonna show the original title. So we'll just do message, and let's see, we did message dot room dot title, I think, or name. Just want to make sure so that's supposed to be in curly braces we want to wrap that right there we'll go down to the original so we did message.room so we're just outputting the room name and we don't need to actually do room name like that so we have the room name we have the body and we want to make sure that we link to that room so somebody uh, if somebody sees that message we want them to be able to click on that so in this section right here, let's see, let's just add the link right here. So we'll just do room here. So let's see, we're going into message or uh, this is actually gonna be a URL tag. So let's fix that up. We'll do URL and we're going to room and the link here for the ID is gonna be message.room.id. So we have the body, all the links look good here. Let me just go ahead and remove this. So we have the time since stamp, so I'll remove the original content. Let's save it, let's take a look, see if we have any issues. Let's go back to the home feed. And we're missing a block tag. So invalid block tag on line 29 here. So on line 29, this is supposed to be an end if. So end if, like that. Okay, so here we go. So we have the activity feed. So if I click on the user, I can see the user's profile. If I click on the actual item here, that takes me to the room and I can see the message and the time since is correct. Okay, so I thought maybe I didn't update that. So time since looks good and that creates our home page. Okay, so we took the most time here because we had to work on our main template, the navigation bar, and I had to kind of explain some concepts here. So the next thing I want to do here is jump to the uh, profile. So when we click on a user profile, I want to go here because this is the next section here that uh, is going to be the easiest to update. So let's go ahead and open up our theme and we'll open up our website. So let's go to the main website. Let's go into base, into templates, and then let's find the profile.html file. So let's bring that in. Actually, I want to bring that into the base folder. So the original profile uh, page actually Let's just go ahead and name that to underscore 
old like that. And then let's bring in the new profile. So that's gonna mess up some stuff here. So if I actually refresh, now we see this right here. So we need to update all of this. So let's go into the profile page now. So we'll close out the activity component. Let's keep the home component open because I wanna copy this extends main.html and block tag right here. And we'll go into profile. And because it's a template, there's no dynamic data, the header section and all this information will be on every single page. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take this doc tag and scroll all the way down to the closing header tag. So where main is right here, let's just remove all of that. And let's just paste in this section or write that out. So extend the main template, create the block tag, and then go to the bottom here at the closing main tag. And let's just remove body and HTML. And we'll just do end block. So at this point, I'm gonna move a little bit faster. So we'll just do end block content. So I'm gonna move faster because the, the concept was already explained. Now I'm just gonna be changing out the information. So this is now my profile page. Now it's time to update the actual content here. So this isn't the real content. This is all hard coded. We can see the topics here. That's not the right topics that we have here. So we want to just go ahead and update all of these. So let's do that. So let's see, we have a topics component that we used in the original. So profile underscore old. So I'm just gonna get rid of, well, actually I'll leave that. Let's go ahead and take this include topics component and let's bring that into profile. So in profile.html into the, or inside of the new one, here is the topics wrapper. So I'm gonna minimize that. We can see topics start, topics end. So I can get rid of all of that right there. And I'm just gonna replace that with this component right here. So all I'm doing is just removing that component, updating it, and that should be good. So if I go ahead and refresh this, now we see the real topic. So I can do the same for the activity feed. So if I go back into the homepage, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab the activity component. Let's go back to the new profile page and let's just minimize this room list right here. Let's go into activities and let's just remove all of these two. So we'll get rid of those and paste in this activity component. Save that and there we go. So that's all updated now. And I also need to update the feed here and I'll just update these contents in a second. So Shuvo is being funny here, wrote in Dennis Kardashian Ivanov. That's funny, <laughs> trolling me. So let's go ahead and update that so we see the room list. Here we have a profile. So this is the profile information. So we'll update this in a second. I'll minimize that. Then we have the room list header. So, okay, so that's the header section. Then we have the room item here. So we can see that we have two of these. So room list and room list. Okay, so let's minimize these. I keep forgetting the names here. So room list content, no, it's room list right here. Let's minimize that and minimize that. So we have the two fake components. Let's remove both of those. So let's remove these two divs and let's include this feed component. So we're just gonna update that and this is gonna output each user's feed right here. So that can be pasted in right here. So inside of the room list or underneath the room list header, let's paste that in right here. Okay, so that should be it. So if I refresh it, uh, I can see Dennis is not hosting any rooms. I'm not sure if that's the case. Let's just try this. Let's see if I go to Dennis. Okay, so I am hosting rooms. This just needs to be updated. So we actually need to update the contents here. At this point, we're not gonna update the about section because we haven't added that in. We'll take care of that in a little bit but I do want to update the name here and the username and then the edit and the user icon here will be updated too uh, later once we get to that section. So let's go ahead and go to this right here in the room list tag. We'll go to the profile section. Let's change the name and this is just gonna be user.username and then later on we can actually output a real name. So we'll just go ahead and take that copy that, replace it, and the edit link will be updated once we add that page. So if I refresh it, there we go. So if I go back to the home page, let's click on Eric. Eric doesn't have any rooms hosted, but I can see his information and I can see all of Eric's comments. Let's try one more and let's just go to Tim. There we go. So that's all good here. So let's go to the actual room itself now. So if I click on a room, I wanna style this page now. So let's go ahead and open up the two folders again 
and let's bring in or let's rename the old room page so we'll just rename that to room underscore old and let's grab the new room template and let's just bring that in right here so we have the new room template if i refresh that we need to change out the content so the styling is there let's go to the home page take those same block tags right here these two block tags to extend the template and we'll go into room.html so again we're going to go to the opening doc tag copy all of this all the way to the main tag so right here i guess my mouse isn't showing so we're going to paste that in right here and then we can close that up here so we'll just take this tag and let's remove the closing wow that's a lot of scrolling so we'll fix this up in a second let's remove the closing html and body tag and we'll just do end block so now if i save this you might have to do a control shift r do a hard refresh so now we see the page again the content needs to be updated so let's start with this participant side right here i want to change that because uh, that's just making my html file a little bit obnoxious here so let's start with these participants here so here we go we see a participant the actual link so each participant is wrapped inside of a link so let's take the opening participant and let's just scroll all the way down to the last participant so i see that right here let's go one above and let's keep one so if i save that we should see one participant and we want to go ahead and just loop through so in the original room page we just loop through all the participants like this so we did four user in participants go ahead and output that so here we go we have one participant inside of that section then we'll put in the closing and four tag so N4, save that, and now that should output that information. We need to update the actual contents. So this is gonna be user.username, and we're just gonna repeat this right here, and we'll just do user.username. We want to add in the link here, so we see, oh, we didn't link it up earlier. So let's add in a link to the user's profile. If you see a participant, you wanna go ahead and visit their profile, see what kind of rooms they're hosting, or reach out to them we can just do user dot or dash or hyphen profile and then user dot id okay so we have the link we want to get the count here so let's see we'll just take the participant count let's just take this value because i always have a hard time spelling that word we'll just do dot count so that's a query set so we can just take that value and do dot count refresh it and there we go so three people have joined this room i'll zoom in a little bit that's all taken care of i can click on a user profile that all looks good and now we need to update the actual study room and the css might look a little bit off because i'm so zoomed in right now so we'll work on that if there are any issues i'll make sure that the template is updated by the time uh, you take this course or follow this video so now we need to just update the room information so let's update the name here and let's update the delete and edit links here so we also want to update that backlink too so let's just start by going through line by line here so uh, we'll start at the top here and let's see so we have the room so one second just need to get some notes ready so we have the room uh, this is the back button here. Let's just send the user back to the home page. We're not going to worry about the details here. If you want to send them somewhere else or maybe the previous page, you can do that. For now, I'm just going to send the user back to the home page. That's an arrow left button, study room. Let's see. So in this section, top right, let's see. We have the edit links right here. So top right section, we have the edit and delete links. So let me minimize these. Then we have the delete link so what i want to do is make sure that only the owner of each room can actually modify this so i'm going to update this right here so we'll create a condition and for this top right section let's go ahead and create that so we'll just say if room.host is equal to request.user then we want to output this otherwise we don't want just anybody editing the room so we'll just do n4 save that and let's take a look so let's refresh it what did I do here? So I did that whole thing again where I forgot to make that end if, not end for. Okay, so 
we see the study room. If I go to a room that I'm not hosting, I'm logged in as Dennis here. Um, let's just find a room that Tim is hosting. So I actually wanna to go to the room. I wanna learn HTML. So I can't edit that, but I can edit my own. So if I go to, I wanna learn JavaScript, we can see these two links. So let's update these links. We'll go in here, let's expand these. So this is the edit link. So we'll just go ahead and create the URL tag. So we'll do URL and then this will be update dash room and we want the room ID, so room.id. Okay, and let's just copy this right here and minimize this section and then we'll go to the delete link and we're just gonna add in delete room. Okay, so delete room right there. Refresh it, so if I go X right there, that works. Edit, that gives me the form here. So we'll finish up styling those. Okay, so now we should move on to probably updating the title. So let's just rem remove this comment here. That should be gone by the time you see that. I'll try to make sure that's updated. Uh, here we have the room title. Let's modify all of this. So room.name, not title. Then we have the created time. So we'll just do room.created and then pipe time since. Then hosted by, well, this is gonna be the host URL here. So first we wanna add in the link, so URL, and then user-profile, and then that's gonna be room.host.id, hosted by, and then later on we'll update the user profile, and let's just output room.host.username. Okay, so, Refresh that, let's learn JavaScript, that looks good. We see the host, that link works. Um, at this point, let's also get rid of this description. I don't know why, but I just don't really like the idea of a description. Like on a Discord server, you might have some kind of description there, but it really doesn't just show up there. So what I'm gonna do is just comment that out. I feel like it's gonna look better and it's gonna make this website a little bit more responsive here. So the description the description of a room is gone. We wanna output the topic, so room.topic. We'll save that. Okay, so that's JavaScript. If I go to study with me, that's Python. Okay, so we'll remain here because there are three comments here that we want to output. So these are all the fake comments. We're gonna modify these right now. And again, this footer right here, if it needs to be fixed, we'll fix it later in the template. The HTML should not change, um, but also I'm really zoomed in, so that's why this is probably happening here. So uh, let's go into the contents. So let's see, we're going line by line, uh, author, of a thread here, so I think it's called thread. I think that's what each item here is called. So we see threads. So if I add some space here, minimize this class of thread, I can see another class of thread. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and delete all of them and keep just one and then create the for loop. So I can see three, fre <laughs> three threads right here. <laughs> Can't say that. And uh, let's go ahead and create some space. Let's make sure there's only one. Okay, so I see one thread right here. Now let's go ahead and create that loop. So let's see, in the original room, we just did, when we outputted this content, we just did four message in room messages. So let's paste that loop in or just write that out. And then at the bottom of the thread, let's just do end four. Okay, so in the thread, now we wanna update the content. So we want to link to the user. So we're just adding in a bunch of the same links. This section is gonna be pretty long, probably an hour, maybe even an hour and a half, and I'll just make sure to timestamp it. Uh, but this is all important for making sure this project is nice and styled. So profile, and then we'll just do user.id, or we'll just do message.user.id. Then we'll just take the message user, I'll put that username, the post here, that's gonna be the message with the time since stamp, so message.created, and then pipe time since. Okay, I'm really, oh, did I, oh, I, I blocked that out, sorry about that. So let me just minimize that, so my face blocked that, so there you go, you can see the code right here. Okay. Oops. <laughs> Okay, so there we go. We see the message and we see the username. And we also wanna make sure that this delete method is conditional. So if a user is the owner of this specific message, then we want to output this. So we'll add in an end if statement and then an if statement right here. So we'll just do if 
and then we'll just start with request dot user is equal to message dot user that should output that and this should send the user to the delete section here so i need to add in a link around this i noticed that the link was not built in so if it's not added by the time you see this go ahead and just add this link around here and let's just do href i guess it's not an issue because i showed you as long as i don't miss out on that and we'll just do a url and this will be delete dash message and then message dot id okay so for the actual contents of the message right here we'll just do message dot body paste that in let's check this out we'll refresh it and there we go we see our messages that looks good we see the timestamp we see each user the user is clickable if i go to delete so in this case i am dennis here as a user i'm logged in as dennis i can click on delete and i can confirm that and everything looks good for the room section so let's go ahead and work on the create room form so at this point uh let's see we have this link here or we should have it where the heck did that link go so i'm logged in was that not in the original template or did i get rid of that Okay, so I had to pause for a minute because apparently I deleted this create room link right here. So I'll make sure that it's in the template once you're working with this, but I couldn't find it and we must have accidentally removed it when we we're making edits here. So at this point, inside of your home.html file, go ahead and open up this section right here where we have the study room title and the room count and go ahead and go to this link and just update this to url and then create room so create dash room and that should update our link so if you go to the page here now you should see this section right here so when we go to create room the first thing i'm going to do here is style this page so i want to make sure that it's all styled we'll install the theme and then i'm going to add in some functionality here so a user can actually add in their own topic here so that's going to require a little, a little bit more in the back end to customize that so uh, we'll get to that in a second so the first thing is I want to go ahead and install the theme here. So let's open up the theme and let's open up the original template. So on the right, I have my current project on the left. I have the theme. So this is going to be create room right here. So let's bring that in and let's just do this. I call that room form and this can actually update a room too. So it doesn't only create it. So I see room form right here. Let's just change this to room form underscore old. And we'll change this create room right here to room form. So room underscore form, and that's already an HTML file. So now if I refresh it, I can see this. So we're gonna have to update this information right now. So we'll just go ahead and take these block tags right here where we extend the template. Let's open this up and let's go into the room form. So in the room form, we're gonna take the doc tag all the way to main, remove that, paste in the extends method and take this block tag, go to the bottom and we'll remove everything to body and we'll make sure this is an end block. Okay, so we want to be able to update the room. So we have a form here, so let's go ahead and first uh, fix up some links here and then we'll output the form. So in this section here at the top, Let's go ahead and start here. Let's just kind of read through everything. Start with this first link. And let's see, we'll just go ahead and add in a URL to the home page. So we'll just do home or a URL tag. And then we have create study room. Let's just do create slash update or something like that. Save it like that. And for the form value, the action is going to the original URL. The method is gonna be post. So let's look up the original or the old form room. So we have the action, the post method. We're gonna get that CSRF token. Let's paste that in right here. And let's see. So if I go ahead and look at the fields now. So here we see a form group. We see some information here. So uh, let's just comment this section out right here. So I wanna comment that out. We have a form group right here. So what I could do is just create a for loop around this. So I could just go ahead and do something like for field, field in form, and then just do end for. So if I do something like this and get rid of these fields right here, this will actually work here. So if I save this, let's just see what we have at this point. So let's just make sure the form is working. 
uh, looks like we need a closing block tag. Let's see, end four. So let's refresh that and this should be good once we output the field values. So in this case, we'll just do field, field.label. Let's get rid of that R right there, fix the spelling error, and we'll just output the actual field. So I'm just gonna comment that out. And then let's just go ahead and bring in the field. So we have the label, we can access the label like that, and then we can actually output the field value. So for the most part, it should be styled. Okay, so here we go. So we see our topics. If I select Django, uh, let's just try Python. Let's just do Python and we'll just say, let's keep learning. I'm not really creative with these titles and we'll submit that. So here we go. I see that I created it. The form is officially working and it's styled. Now in this section, we're gonna learn something new if you don't already understand how this works. So we're gonna use uh, an input field that also has a drop down select option here. So let's go ahead and get rid of this for loop right here. So we'll still use the model form, but some of the fields I'll manually render them out and one field in particular for that drop down list, I'll hand code everything. So with a model form, I can actually access the form and then access a specific value here. So this will be form.name and that will be that form field. Now I could also do the same thing with the label here. In this case, I'm just gonna write it out because it's a small field here. So we'll just, or a small form. So we'll just do room name and let's just go ahead and get rid of this. Let's copy this one right here and we'll just do form.description. So we're just gonna get the values manually, room description and let's continue here. Okay, so I already have the code right here in the template, but I wanna manually uh, code it up just so I can explain as I move along here. So the first thing is, I just wanna go ahead and copy this div right here. So let's just copy all of this, paste it in, and I'm gonna get rid of this value here. And for this section in the for attribute here, we'll just do uh, topic. So we'll get the topic and let's actually update this to description. and let's continue. Okay, so this is gonna be a drop-down list, but the first thing we're gonna do is add in the input value. So it's a drop-down list with an input value. The type will be text, and the name needs to be a topic here. So this is how we're gonna get this in the back end. So we're still submitting the same form data. So we have that, and we're also gonna set this to required. So we wanna make sure that a user can't submit it without selecting a topic or adding their own. And then we're gonna add in the list property here. And we're just gonna set this to topic dash list. Okay, so we have a standard input field. The only thing that looks different here at this point is this section right here. So if you're not familiar with it, that's all that's changed here. If you already know this, well, I'm just gonna be going over stuff that you understand. Now, we also have a data list tag here that we can work with. Now a data list is gonna be the options that drop down when the user starts typing something in. And in this section, we need to add the ID and the ID needs to match this section right here. So we're basically, say, we're basically saying, where is this list right here? And we're pointing to topic list and that has the ID right here. So make sure those two match. That's how it knows where to find it. Then let's go ahead and add in the select option. So we'll just do select here and we're gonna give this an ID here. So we'll just do what the heck did I do there? Okay, so we'll do ID and this will be room topic. And then we want the options here. So the option, we'll just use the option tag. These are gonna be the form options. So let's say we just do something like Python and then we set the value here. So the value uh, typically would be something like an ID, but uh, in this case, we're just gonna set the string value. So we'll just do Python. So it would be the ID of like the child objects and then we can throw in Django. So there's a reason why I'm doing things this way. We'll see it in a second. Okay, so now that I did this, we added the data list with the options. Let's go ahead and take a look at this form here. So if I go here, when I click on this, we see this dropdown option and we see these values. So if I start typing in Python, it does a search. If I wanna add in my own, let's say I wanna add in Java, then I can actually submit my own value. So that's just what we need in the front end here. And what I actually need to do here is pass in some more information because I don't wanna hard code this value out. That also needs to be dynamic. 
So we need to go ahead and go into the create form view and let's just go ahead and get the topic. So we'll just do topics. That'll be topic dot objects dot all. So we'll get all the topics. We'll pass those into the template and then we can go into the room form and we're going to create a for loop just to output all the real topics. So as we add them, we obviously want the users to see all of those. So we'll just do for topic in topics. And then let's get rid of this last option or the second one. And we'll just close off the for loop. So we'll do end for, and we're going to pass in the topic values now. So we'll just do topic dot name, take this right here and we'll, we'll bring that in for the value. So I also want to do the same for the update view. So if a user is updating it, we're going to need the same values now. So we want to be able to get the topic. So let's bring that in here, pass that into the context dictionary for the update view. And now if I go here, if I click on this, we see all of our real topics. If I start typing something in, it starts searching automatically and there we go. So that's all we need for the front end. Now in the back end, we're gonna have to process this a little bit differently. So now we have this data list and our form looks a little bit different. So we're not gonna be able to use the standard model form. Now I probably could customize it a lot to work with this, but in this case, I only need to customize this view. So we'll stick with uh, just keeping things simple. So the first thing I wanna do is get the topic name. So we'll just go ahead and go into request.post.get and we're gonna get the topic. Okay, so once I get the topic, we're gonna go ahead and set this value and we're gonna use a method called get or create. So we set topic and created and we're just gonna do, and I'll explain what this is in a second. So we'll just do topics.objects.get or create. So it's a method here. I'll make sure that I'm not covering it. And what's gonna happen here is get or create is gonna return back either an object or it will return an object and created. And what's gonna happen here is if we pass in the topic name for the name value. So let's say we add in JavaScript or Python. We already have Python. So get or create is gonna get the value of Python and it's gonna return it inside of this topic object. Now created will be false because Python wasn't created. We already had this, but let's say I added in a new value like uh, just Java. Now we don't have Java in our database at this point. So what's gonna happen is created will be true and this will simply create the object. So if it can't find it, it will create it. So that's what get or create is doing. So this is how we're gonna be able to customize that form since we are trying to also add this. Now, what I'm gonna do here is get rid of everything in here. So I'm just gonna comment this out right here and I'm gonna change this up here. So we're not gonna be using the form here and I can also comment out this right here. So at this point, underneath this section, we're just gonna go into room.objects dot create and we're going to use the create method because we're customizing that topic section uh, i try to find easier ways to do this and this is actually very easy but i try to find a way to do this with a model form easier and i couldn't find one that wouldn't require um, more explanation so i wanted to keep it simpler so we have the host here and once we get the host and we just finished updating our form so now we're like redoing the same information here or redoing the same thing but now it's going to be a little bit different so uh, we're just gonna do host and that's gonna be request.user. So you still got to at least learn that method if you need that elsewhere. So at least you know how to do that. So now that we got the host, we're gonna get the topic and we're gonna to set the topic to either the newly created topic or what we had in the database. So we're, cre we're creating a room with all this information. And for the name, we're just going into request.post.get and we're passing in the name. So the name will still be passed in from the form value. So we still have it right there. We still have the model form fields. Those will be sent. So we get the name and then we need to get the description if we have a description. So that's not required. So we'll just do a description and we're just getting the description from the front end. So I hope that makes sense. So once we run through this, I'm just gonna go ahead and let's just remove this actually. So we'll just remove that. There's no need for that. So now when we submit this, we create that topic and then we redirect a user. So let's go ahead and save that. And here we go. So let's try this. So let's see, what's a new topic? Let's just do Java. So we'll just do Java and we're gonna create a room and we'll just say calling all Java developers. 
Okay, so now we submit that. Here we go, we see the room and we see a new topic added. Now, if I go to create a new topic, Java is now here. So the next time someone submits this, that's gonna go ahead and create this. So for the update functionality, let's see. So we need to be able to also update a room. And this, I haven't really thought about yet. Actually, I didn't really prep for this in the tutorial, but let's just uh, see how we can figure this out. So let's see. So in the update room functionality, we're rendering out the topics. And in order to pre-fill the room name, I guess that's supposed to be a topic, not a room name. So let's fix that in the form. So we'll go back here. This is supposed to be the topic. Actually, we'll just say enter a topic. So we wanna prompt the user. So we'll do enter a topic. Let's try that one more time. Okay, so first of all, the form needs to be pre-filled. So let's take care of that issue. So we'll go ahead and take the room. We'll pass that into the context dictionary. We'll bring that in. Then we can go into the room itself. And for the value, we'll just set the value here and that will be room.topic. So room.topic.name. Now let's see if that gives us an issue with the create room. So if I go to create room, okay, so it's not giving us an issue, so it's totally fine. Uh, let's try to add in another topic. We'll just say C++. Let's learn C. So I just want to debug on the go. So C is added and there was no issues. Okay, so now we want to edit that. So we see C++. Let's learn C. And I also need to process this too. So when I submit this, this form will not work in the back end. So I'm going to do what we did up here. I'm just going to copy this right here. We're going to take all of this and we're going to bring this into the post method. Then I'm just going to go ahead and remove all of that. And we'll just set the return method back and we're going to get the room. So we'll get the current room and we'll just get the name. We'll get the room name and let's just do room name is equal to request dot post dot get and then we'll get the name value. So we're just simply going to get the model and update all the values. So we'll set that for the topic and the description. So we'll just do topic. And then for the topic, we'll get either that newly created topic because a user can edit something and decide to create a new topic. And we wanna be able to set that. So we'll just do description. And then we'll just do request.post.description. And then we need to save it. So let's try this. Some things I don't plan for in all the tutorials or in these tutorials. So let's try this again. Okay. so. Let's say we decide to change this up and we'll just do C sharp now. So we'll throw that in. I think that's a symbol. So we'll just do let's learn C sharp, exclamation point, add in a description. Let's just say something random here so we know everything's submitting. And let's go ahead and hit create room. Let's learn C sharp. And that was updated. Perfect. Okay, so that's C sharp. We see the topic, C sharp was added and everything looks good. So instead of saying create room, let's just say update too. I want to make sure that form looks good. I could write some kind of condition here, but we'll just say submit. That's going to be a little bit more generic. Okay, so that's it for our create room form. So we're able to update and create with a styled form with the ability to add in multiple topics here. So now you can see all these new topics be added. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is give the user the ability to edit their account. So we don't even have this page here, so we wanna start building this in here. So let's go ahead and do this. And at the bottom here, uh, or let's just go ahead and open up our files here. Let's start with the theme and let's start with, or let's move to our app too. So we'll go into uh, study, study bud. We'll go into base, so in the base app, in templates, in base, let's go ahead and go in the templates here and we're gonna take edit user. Okay, so we're going to drag this in. We have edit user and I'm going to change the name to update user. So we'll do update dash user and that's it. Okay, so now we want to create a view for this. So this is going to be a completely new page. So we're not going to be changing content out. We'll just be building it for the first time. We'll go down here. Let's create a function based view called update user pass in request. I also want to make sure this view right here is restricted so you shouldn't be able to update a view if you're not logged in we'll just do login required and then we'll set the login url and that's going to login let's see how do i set that 
Yeah, so we set the login URL to login. Okay, so we're creating the view. And then we want to return. This is going to be render. We'll pass in request here. And we're passing in base forward slash update dash user dot html okay so that's in here now update user we see the full template and let's pass in the context dictionary well for now we might not even need one i don't even i don't remember how i was going to build this one out so we'll just kind of wing it here and see so we'll take this delete message let's go ahead and move this down here and we'll just say update and then change that to user let's remove this so we don't need an id because the user is going to be the logged in user let's change that to update user and we'll just do update user like that. Okay, so we have a view and we have a URL that returns back the template that needs to be fixed up right now. And inside of our navigation bar, so we want to link to this from a few sections. The first one is gonna be the nav bar. So we'll go into the nav bar here and let's see, in this drop down section, we see the username. And then down here are gonna be the drop down menu items. Let's just change this to update user. So we'll set the URL tag update dash user. Okay, so let's try this out. If I go into the navigation bar, I'm logged in, go to settings. Here we go, here is my update user page. So let's make sure that it's styled. So we'll go ahead and fix that. We'll open up update user in templates. And let's just go ahead and take everything from doc type all the way down to header, extend the main template. I'm sure you guys are getting pretty annoyed at this point, dealing with the same thing but it's just repetitive and we have to do it. So main.html, I think we've done this like 15 times at this point. So we'll just do block tag or block content and then end block content. We'll just copy that, bring that down here, remove body and HTML at the closing main tag. And let's take a look at the page here. Okay, so here is our editor, edit user template. So I also want to link to this from my profile. So if I go, happen to go to uh, a specific profile, so I'm logged in as Dennis, we have an edit profile link here. So we'll create a condition. I think I might have already did that. We'll go to profile here and let's see. So we have the about section, edit user. So we'll just go ahead and write the condition. So if request.user is equal to the currently logged or if the user that we're on is currently matching the logged in user, then we want to render that button and we'll add in the link. So end if, kept messing that one up early or earlier, and we'll add in the URL tag. So we'll just do URL and update dash user. Okay, so we have that information. We have the template. This link should now work. So if I'm on my own profile, I can edit my account if I'm on, let's say, Eric's account, I can't edit that, so that is hidden. So let's work on the functionality. So we want to be able to create a form that we can actually process. So that link also needs to be updated. So that was also one in the navigation bar. It looks like there's two in the nav bar. So let's take this update user link and let's go right here. So that also needs to be updated. So we can click on that without having to go to the drop down menu. Okay, so let's go in here. Let's go ahead and go into update user and let's take a look here. So we have a form here, we have a container, we have a link to the profile, the profile picture here. Oh, so that's the back button. So let's just go ahead and let's just redirect the user back to the home page. For now, we're just gonna stick to that. So if you wanna change that up, I would uh, recommend just going through and updating all of these. So we have our form. This needs to be sent to the same URL. So we're gonna leave action blank. The method needs to be a post method. We need a CSRF token. So we'll just do CSRF underscore token. Now for these form values here, let's go ahead and remove all of these and we'll just leave one. So we're gonna use a model form for this. So we'll take all these and we're gonna leave form action. So we're gonna leave our template with one form. That looks good. And let's see. So we're going to have a file upload field once we're dealing with that profile picture. So that'll be taken care of in a little bit here. So now let's go ahead and create a model form for our user. So we'll go into forms. And what I need to do is actually import my user model. 
So we'll go to models and let's just take this import and we'll go back into forms.py. So we're gonna import the user and we're gonna create a model form based around this user. So we'll just do user form, pass in model form. Then we can throw in class meta, specify the model. And that's gonna be uh, for fields, instead of specifying all of them because a user model has a lot of fields, there's passwords, is super user, all this information. Uh, we don't wanna give them everything. So we'll just specify the username. So that's what's gonna be output and then an email and later on we'll do like a bio and a profile picture but for now uh, that's going to be it so we'll just output the username and email and the user can update that so inside of the view we need to import this so we'll just do user form let's bring this down here let's render this form so we'll just do form that's equal to user form and let's see so the instance well this is going to be the request dot user so we want to make sure to get the initial user value. Actually, let's just set the user value like this so we're not using request.user every time. So we'll set the instance as the user and then we want to send that into the context dictionary. In this case, I won't create a full context dictionary. I'll just pass it in directly like that. And that is gonna be hidden there. So I wanna make sure you can see that. So we pass in the form and we can access that as form. So we'll go into the template and let's create that for loop here. So in update user, we'll create a for loop and we'll just output every single form field. This will help us keep some styling. So we can just do for field in form, add in that end for loop, end for, and let's see, we'll just change this to field.label and then we'll change this to the actual field. So the model form, once we add in the upload field, well, that will manually output it itself. So we'll just do field. So the model form will take care of that for us. So if I refresh this, let's go ahead and, oh, I need to, did I pass that in? For field in form, it says user update. We have our form passed in. Let's save everything. Oh, I didn't specify, wow, I completely butchered this one. So we'll just do fields. Hopefully you notice that. And we need to specify the model. So let's just do model and that's gonna be the user. Okay, so that was the issue. So if I refresh this, let's see what's going on right now. So fields is prohibited with the exclude value. So let's try this, let's just, I can't tell if it's this form or the old form that's having the issue, which I don't fully understand. So it's in user form, we have the user model. Let's try to restart the server. So let's scroll up here, make sure we can all see the issue, start the server and let's see if I still get the issue. Okay, so maybe I spelled something wrong there. So uh, use, update user okay user wow that was a dumb mistake okay so this is why we don't specify all the fields here so it outputs everything my hash password last logged in all this information so let's try this one more time i think the issue occurred because i was uh messing with the wrong form here. So let's try this again. So we'll just do username and email and this should work. Okay, there we go. Now we have a form with my username and my email. So all I wanna do is just be able to process this now. So we'll go into the view and this is gonna be a standard model form. So we'll just do if, or a standard uh, post request. So if dot request or if request dot method, if this is equal to post, you already know what we're gonna do. We're just gonna go ahead and set the form. That's gonna be the user form. Pass in request.post. Set the instance to the user. And then we wanna check if that's valid. So if form.is underscore valid, let's go ahead and process this. So we'll just do form.save. And then we want to redirect our user. In this case, we're gonna send the user back to their profile. So let's just do user dash profile 
and we're going to pass in the argument of primary key and that's going to be the user dot id so user dot id like that okay so let's try this so let's say i want to change my username so i'm just going to change it to dennis ivy and we'll just change the email to dennis ivy at gmail so if i submit that okay so it updated it apparently it didn't redirect me so return redirect wow i don't know why i'm starting to make all these mistakes so let's try dennis iv one submit that and there we go so i'm back at my profile i can edit that let's go back to dennis iv submit that and there we go so we can now edit a user profile so at this point i just want to do some cleanup work here so uh, we want to make sure that our website is completely mobile responsive we also want to make sure that our delete template is uh, filled out here so we're still not using that main template and also the login form here so when i go to login this template needs to be finished up here so we want to use the themes template now there's a few things i noticed here so we'll just keep doing cleanup as we go and i want to try to finish up most of this before we move on to the django rest framework and build an outer api and that custom user model so the first thing i noticed is that when i submit this form it doesn't actually submit anything and I think that's because in the template here in the room.html file, I forgot to update that form. So there's a chance that I'm gonna miss a few of these here. So we'll just keep going back and fixing those. So in that room message form, we see this form tag. The first thing is I wanna make sure action is blank here. So we're sending that to the same URL and we want to add in the post method. So we wanna make sure that's a post method. Anytime we are sending a post method, we want to add in a CSRF token. So CSRF underscore token, and we need to pass in the name here. So this is gonna be the body of the actual form. So let's give that a test here. So if I refresh that, it looks like it added in a search parameter. We'll go ahead and refresh that and we'll just say, looks cool. And there we go. Okay, so that's working now. It just added us to the participants. Everything looks good. And let's go ahead and add in the delete template. So when I go to delete an item, Remember that you need to be logged in as a specific user, so I can't delete anyone. So make sure you find one that you can actually delete here. And let's add in this template here. So we'll go ahead and open up our theme again. So we'll add that to the left side. And then we're going to open up our project here on the right side. So down in the templates folder, we'll go to delete and we're just going to do delete underscore old. So we're just going to replace the content here. Then we're gonna grab delete from here and bring that in here. So if I go to the delete page, actually before I do that, let's go ahead and actually uh, extend the main template. So we'll go to delete.html, take this doc type right here. So this tag all the way down to the main tag, delete all of that, go ahead and extend the main template. So I just wanna make sure to see that before we actually check out the page. And we need to create the block tags here so we just have two more templates, I think, to replace right now. And then we're going to add in a couple more pages here for mobile responsiveness. So this is going to be block content. And then down here, we can get rid of body and HTML and also script. And we'll just do end block content. So end block content. Okay, so now if I go to this template, it looks a little bit better. So we just need to complete this form. So we'll just update this information, make sure that it's actually a real page here. So we'll need to open up the old delete HTML file. We'll just bring that in like this. And we just need to make sure that it's a post method. So we'll take that right here. Let's go to the form. So we see the main tags, a couple of divs here, and we see the form right here. So let's just go ahead and replace action right there with the method and the action with the empty value. So we're just pasting stuff in here. Take that CSRF token bring that in right here and for the back button instead of doing things this way we're just going to take this section right here and we're going to add that to this back arrow so that's just going to send the user back to the previous page so that's going to be on the top here that's this link right here so we'll replace that and let's see so we just have a confirm button so that's going to be it at this point so we have our token, are you sure you want to delete? And then we need to change this value right here with a dynamic object. So we'll take that, throw that in right here. So that needs to be 
replacing the 100 days of code. So that's gonna be our dynamic value and let's give that a test here. So we'll go back here, let's delete a comment. We'll just delete let's, or looks cool here. So we'll just confirm that and now that's gone. So now my comment is gone and that's working. So the delete template looks good. So now we just want to update the login and register page. Okay, so in here, let's go ahead and let's see, how do I wanna do this? What I think I'm gonna do here is just paste in the template well, I guess we'll do the same thing. We'll just start replacing bit by bit here. So we'll just take login, we'll bring that in, and we have a login underscore register. So that's our template name, our original one. Let's see, if I go back into the text editor here, we see login underscore register dot HTML. We'll change this to underscore old, and then we'll change login to login underscore register. So we're gonna change this information. So this is the new template, login underscore register. And let's just go ahead and get those block tags. So I'm just gonna take this from the delete template right here. We'll go, we'll go back to login register. And let's just remove all of this again. So we'll just take this tag right here all the way down to main, remove that, and then paste that in here, extend it, take the block tag here, remove body and HTML and we'll just do end block. Okay, so let's take a look at this template here. So end block is not working. Let's see what we have here. End block content. And let's refresh that. Okay, so here is our new login page. So we wanna make sure that this works and then we're gonna add in that condition to also render the register page. So back in the new template here, so this is the new layout. Let's see, we have a main layout here. Then we have a container. We have the layout box for the login page. Let's just do this here. So let's take this container and we're gonna write our condition around here. So we'll just take this condition and we'll just say, if page is login, then we'll render out the login form. So if page is equal to login, then we'll wrap the end if just before the main tag. So we'll just do end if and then the else statement for the register form. So we'll just do else and that's gonna be the register form. So I'm gonna take this div right here. So all of this content, so then the entire container, let me just minimize that so you can see it. Let's take this entire container and put that also into the else statement. So now we're gonna modify this. So let's open up the old login register page. So we'll move this right here. Let's make sure we can see both of these and let's check this out here. So the login form, we'll scroll up here. Let's see, we see the login page, we see the form. So we wanna make sure the method is post. So let's take action out right there, leave it blank, set the method to post, take this CSRF token from the original page. Let's put that into the form. So we have a username, the name is username, this is a text field, so that looks good. Then we have a password, as long as the name is password, that should be good for the login page. So for this sign up link, we're just gonna send a user to register. So let's just do URL and then register. And I made one mistake here. I accidentally just updated the register page. So this is in the else statement. So let's just go ahead and take this container, if you happen to do this too, and paste it in right here. So we'll update that register one uh, with the register form. So now if login, we just updated this form with a CSRF token, the action, the method, and the input fields look good. So this should now actually make our form work here. So let's go ahead and try this. So I'm gonna refresh that and then we'll just log in as Dennis Ivy. that's a user. If I log in, that's all working so we didn't have that much to update there. And if I log out here, let's go back to login. If I click on sign up, well, it's gonna be the same page here. So this is what we need to change for the register page now. So inside of the L statement, let's minimize this container right here and let's open up the container after the L statement. And let's go ahead and change this to register then we already updated the form so that looks good then we just need to update this section right here so we'll just say already already signed up then we want to prompt the user to log in and let's go back to our original register form so i'll just bring that in here so we can see everything 
and let's check this out here. So we just have form as P here. So what we're gonna do here is just go ahead and do that loop through the form fields and we're just gonna output every single field and that should be it for the form field here or the register form. So let's take the password here, let's get rid of that. So we're gonna take this form group here for the password. We only need one because we are gonna create a loop. Then we have our submit button, so that looks good. We're just gonna go ahead and loop through this field right here. So we're gonna say for or this form. We'll say for field and form, close out that loop right here. We'll just do end for, so end for, and let's just output the field values. So we'll just do field dot label, and then for the field value, well, we don't need to use this input field, we're just gonna do field. So this will be our register form and make sure again, it's in the else statement because I already made that mistake. So um, let's do register here instead of login. And that should be it here. So all the links are good. It says sign up. Let's try to refresh it. So if I go to sign up, it's gonna take me to the login form. If I go to register, now it says register. And let's just register a new user. Let's just say Tom here, we'll add in some kind of password. Make sure that it's actually working. So nothing on the back end needs to change. An error occurred during registration. Let's try that one more time. So let's just say uh, Todd. I don't think I have Todd. Maybe I already had Tom. And let's see here. Okay, so if I hit enter, now I'm officially registered. I'm logged in as Todd. The register form does work. And I have some landscapers outside. So if they get too loud, I'll try to pause this. There they go. So I'm gonna pause it and wait. Okay, the landscaper is done for a minute. That's the thing about landscapers. They always know when you need peace and quiet or when you're filming something like this, and then they just kind of jump out and get you. They'll hide all week and then they come out. And also, if you ever find yourself facing a landscaper, they can also smell fear. So never show fear, they'll get you. So that's my personal vendetta against landscapers. Okay, so where the heck were we? All right, so we finished the login and register page. And what I wanna do now is do some more cleanup here. And I also want to make sure that this is fully mobile responsive. So there's a few things that you should know about. So when we go to the mobile version of the site here, and right now based on my browser and my Zoom, it looks a little bit weird, but you should see something like this here. So let me just expand this really quick. So when we go to the mobile version, the search bar in the header goes away. So this search bar then appears. So these are two different search bars. So I wanna configure this search bar and then these two links right here. So as we expand it, we see this search bar go away. Then the one in the header appears and those two buttons disappear. Now we also have browse topics and recent activities. And the reason why this is here is because we have these two sidebars here. So browse topics and recent activities. And as we go to the mobile version, they disappear. Now there's different ways of doing this. We could make this like a toggle uh, drop down option or something that just appears like a modal. In this case, I'm just gonna make these different pages here. So you'll be able to click on this and you're gonna see all the topics in their own page and so will the recent, recent activities. So these are gonna be their own pages. So let's go ahead and build these in. Also, when we click on more topics, what I'm gonna do is limit these. So we'll limit this to like five topics and then when you click on this, it'll take you to that page even on the desktop version and you can see more topics. So let's go ahead and build in this search bar. So this is already built in, but we want to configure it so it actually works. Like at this point, if I click that, it doesn't do anything. If I try to search for Java script and start trying to type that in, it won't do anything. So in the home page, in index.html, let me just bring in the text editor here. I don't know why the heck that went away. Okay, so we're going back to the templates folder and in index or home.html, we're gonna see a search bar somewhere here. So we see the topics component, we see the room list right here, and we see a mobile menu. This mobile menu contains a form that opens and closes right here. And then we see those two buttons right here. So browse topics and recent activities. I just wanted to move that out of the way so you can see that. So let's start with this form. So the first thing is, is we want to send this form back to the home page. So we'll add in a URL and we're gonna say home. Now the method by default is already get, but I'll just add that in right here. And we just need to add in Q to the name. So that's what's gonna add in that get parameter and it's gonna send it back to the home page, and that should make it work. So if I refresh this and type in Java, now the search bar works. We see calling all Java developers. 
So the search bar is now responding to this here. If I go to C sharp, now we only see C sharp. Okay, so let's start with browse topics. What we're gonna do here is add in a template. This is gonna be a completely brand new template. We'll make a view and URL for it, and we're gonna link up to that. And then we'll add in some dynamic content. Okay, so let's clear this, and let's go back into our two folders. So here we have our theme right here, and here is our Django project. So we're in the templates folder in the base app. Let's go ahead and grab the topics.html page, bring that in. And before we actually start working with it, let's go ahead and uh, take this block and the extension of the main.html file. And let's just open up the topics.html page. So this is the page that we just brought in. And we're just gonna go ahead and start at the doc type again, take everything down to the main tag. So remove everything here, paste in the extension, the block content tag, go down to the bottom here and get rid of everything to scripts and then add in end block. Okay, so we have our topics page here and we need to add in a new view for this. So in the views.py file, let's go down to the bottom here and let's create a view for our topics page. And we'll pass in the request object. We don't need this login required decorator right here. So this is gonna be available on the homepage. So no need to hide this right here. And let's go ahead and do return render and we're going into request we're passing in request and we're going to base forward slash topics dot html okay so we also just want to pass in the dictionary right there for the context data so we'll just pass it in directly like that and now we need a url here so let's just take update user copy and paste this and we're just going to change this to topics so we'll just do topics and then we'll just call this topics page so the view that we just created and we'll just take topics and paste that in right there okay so we have our url we have a view that renders that page and now in the home page we need to go to this mobile menu so this mobile menu right here opens and closes down here we need to update browse topics here so let's go ahead and update this so we'll just do url and we're pointing that to topics and let's test this out so if i refresh this Let's actually also update this more link right here. So we'll update that right away and then we'll test out both. So in the activity component or in the topics component, so not the topics page, but the topics component, we see this link tag at the bottom of the page. So we just wanna update this too. So I'm gonna to paste in, or I guess type in the URL tag right here. So we'll just do URL and topics. So we updated two links and now we can test it. So on the desktop version, if I click on more, topics does not exist. So it looks like I messed up that view. This is supposed to be .html, not forward slash. You probably noticed that. Okay, so here we go. So we see browse topics here, so we need to update this page here. And also in the mobile version here, so as we go to the mobile version, we see browse topics. If I click on that, there we go, we can see the search bar and all the information in here. So let's update the template now. So we wanna update that backlink and then change this content and make sure this search bar actually works. So we're gonna have a search bar for the uh, all the rooms and then one to search all the topics. And again, this will be updated by the time you see that. So we'll go back here and let's go to the topics page. So topics.html. The first thing is I want to make sure that this backlink right here points to the home page. So we want to send the user back to the home page. We'll just do URL and we're sending them home. So this is on the topics page. Then in browse topics, let's just go ahead and get rid of all the topics except for one. So we'll just take everything from Python down to databases, remove those. Actually, let's leave Python here. So we're just going to get rid of these right here. And what I'm going to do here is go ahead and just pass in topics. So we'll do topics. That's gonna to be topics.objects.filter. So I need to change that to a capital T and we're going into topic.objects.filter. So right now, until I add a filter, it's gonna work like the dot all method. So we're gonna add a filter for a specific reason. So then we wanna get these topics and we wanna pass them into the context dictionary. So we pass the topics in, then we're gonna create that for loop and we're gonna render this out in topics. So the first thing is for the all method right here, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, let's see, 
we're just going to send the user back to the topics page here. So we'll just do URL and then we'll just do topics. So that's going to be it. And then we just want to output all the topics here. So we'll just do topics dot, let's see. So we're doing topics dot room underscore set dot all dot count. I think that's how we did it in the original one. So if I refresh that, let's see. So we should have seven rooms. So for some reason that is not updating. So all let's go back to the topics component. I want to see how I did that. I actually forgot at this point. So we just did topics dot count. Okay. It's already a query set, so I can just do dot count. I don't know why I forgot that. So that's a query set. So I don't need to do room set. It's a query set. So I can just do dot count. Now for this one right here, we're just going to loop through all the topics, just like we did in the topics component. We're just going to do for topic in topics and we're going to add in and end four. So let's close that off here and four and let's just grab the topic itself. So we're just going to do topic and let's go ahead and pass in the URL. So that's supposed to be a variable. So we're doing topic name got distracted there. So topic name, topic dot name, and then let's see in the topics component for the actual count. That's where we did topic dot room underscore set dot count. Okay. So let's throw that in right here, paste that in for the count and then the actual URL here, all we're going to do is go ahead and send the user to the homepage. So they're going to go to the homepage and then we're passing in the topic into the get parameter. So we're just doing URL home. And then after the curly brace, we're going ahead, we're going to go ahead and pass in the question mark Q equals, and then topic dot name topic dot name like that. Okay. So let's try this out. If I go to the topics page, we see all the topics. Let me just zoom out. This is all messed up because of my zoom. So don't worry about this overlay. If I go to Django, it sends me back to the homepage. So we don't have any Django topics. Let's try web development. So we'll go back web development and that search is working. Now, what if we have a ton of topics? Now this could happen where we can have, I don't know, hundred, 200 topics here. We want to be able to actually search these topics. So you probably don't have to fix this because I'll update the template. If I forget, we'll just go ahead and go into this section right here in the search bar and just type in search topics. So I'll try to make sure that that's fixed before this video comes out. Now in this search bar, we're also going to pass in the name and the name is going to be Q. So we'll throw in Q and we're going to send this to the same page. So for the action, we're just going to leave that blank. The method is going to be a get request. So this information is going to be sent back to this view here. So what I'm going to do here is scroll up to the top here to the home page. So we're going to take this request right here and we're going to pass this down to the topics view. So we're getting that Q lookup method. We're just making sure that we have something there. And then let's just do name and we'll just do underscore underscore I contains, and then we'll set that to Q. So now if the user searches that Q method will be sent to the topics page because we're sending that to the same URL, and then we should be able to filter down topics. So let's try this. So if I refresh this and let's try to search for Java, search that now I can search topics. Then I can click on JavaScript and that takes me back to the homepage. And that's it for the topics page. So let's quickly just limit these. So let's just do the first five. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and then C plus plus and C sharp will be hidden. So you could try to find a way to organize those by values. There's different ways of doing that. We won't get into that here, but let's just go to the homepage and landscapers prowling right now. I can hear them. So I don't know if you can catch that in the video, but let's hope not. So four topics in the home view here, as we render these out, let's just get the index from zero to five. So that's how we can limit that. And that'll only give us the first five topics in this query set. So if I save this, if we go to the home page, there we go. So that's limited. If I want to see more, I can click on more and now I can see all the topics and I can also search the topics. So that's it for this section. What I want to do is also work on the activities component. So when we're on the phone here, when it's mobile responsive, we want to be able to click on recent activities also. So we have the topics and now we want to click here. 
So this will also be its own page here. So let's go back to the theme. So we'll open up the theme on the left side, our project on the right side, and let's just take activity.html and we'll drag that in here. So now we have an activity component and an activity template. So we need to make a page here. So let's go ahead and start building this out. We'll just minimize this right now. We'll go back to the home page. Let's just take these block tags here again and we'll go back to, or we'll go to the activity page. So activity.html, take this doc type right here. So let's grab all these tags all the way down to main. And let's just paste in the block tags, take the closing one, and let's update this. So end block, we now have the activity page. We want to create a view for this. So we'll close out topics, and let's go to our views file. So we'll go to views and just underneath the topics view, let's just create a new view for activities. Okay, so we'll just do activities page or activity page. So that's gonna store all the information or, so, or all the activities that we, or all the activity on this website, I guess. And then we're just gonna do return, render, pass in request, and then we'll just go to base forward slash activity dot HTML. And we're just gonna pass in some data here. So for the activity, that needs to be a comma, uh, for the activities, we want to query some data. So we'll just do room underscore messages. So that's what's gonna be in the activity feed. And we're just gonna do room messages because of those flash messages. So we don't wanna call them messages in the template. And we're just gonna do message dot objects dot all. So we're getting all the messages, passing those into the template. Then we're going to URLs. Let's go ahead and copy and paste topics here. So let me just make sure my face isn't covering anything. So we're going to topics here, paste that in here, and we're gonna change this to activity. So it looks like my mouse is actually showing, wow, sometimes just restarting your computer works, sometimes it doesn't. I have no idea why that's working and that probably annoys me more than it not working. When you fix something and it works, but you don't know why you fixed it. Okay, so we have the activity URL, we have the activity view that renders the activity page. Now in home, inside of this mobile menu, let's go ahead and add in this URL. So we're gonna take this topics URL, paste this into recent activities, and we'll just do activity. So activity, all right, let's see, let's refresh that, go to recent activities, and now we have the activities page here. So we can go to its own page, and we just need to update this. So we wanna update the back link here. So we wanna change that and then render out real activities. So let's go ahead and go back to the activity page here. And the first thing is, is I wanna set this link right here to go back to the home page. So we'll just add that, set the URL, and that's gonna to go to the home page. Now for the actual activities, we see this activities page layout here. So this div right here is what contains all the contents inside of the page right here. So we just want to update these. Now we already have these activity components inside of the home page. So what I'm going to do here is just take the for loop here and I'm just going to bring that into the activity page here. So let me just zoom back in because that's the only way I can get to this page. We'll go back to this size of a screen and let's go ahead and open this up here. We'll take this activities box. So it looks like that's the name of the wrapper. So we have an opening and closing div right here and one right here. So let's get rid of both of these and let's open up the activity component. So in the activity component, we have this for loop and it's the exact same thing that we're gonna have in this page. So let's scroll all the way down to the closing for loop and let's just copy that and let's paste that in here. So into the activities page. So now if I go ahead and refresh that, we're not gonna see those right now because I haven't passed those in yet. So back in the view here, we need to take these room messages and we're gonna throw those into the dictionary right here, into the context dictionary, and we're just gonna pass those in. So now we have all the messages here for the activities. If I refresh that, there we go, now we see everything. So it looks a little bit weird because it's only supposed to be mobile uh, responsive and also because of my ridiculously zoomed in screen. So now if I go here, I can see all the activities and that's supposed to list everything out for the homepage. If anything, if this is messed up, I'll make sure to fix this with my designer 
but now a user can see activities from the home page. Okay, so topics, we can always go back, activities, we can always go back, and there we go. So that's it for this section. What we're about to do now is move on to building out our API. So we're gonna build out our API and then we're gonna work on a custom user model. So before we get into this next section, I wanna talk about APIs a little bit here. Now, if you don't know what an API is or what they're used for, I don't wanna get into too much detail here because that's something that's a whole topic on its own. I just wanna show you how to make one with Django. Now, with Django, we could build out our own API and uh, work with all this JSON data, but that can be a lot of work. And what we have here is this package called JSON uh, Django REST framework built on top of Django. So it's a package specifically for Django and it makes for building out APIs very easy. Now, uh, just to do a quick summary of APIs, uh, we can use an API to maybe share data with other applications. So in a sense, we can take all this data that we have and we can provide a series of URLs or endpoints that we would call and instructions on how to work with this data. Now, this data would be retrieved usually in JSON format. So uh, if you wanted to work with some kind of uh, front-end framework or maybe you're building out a mobile application, I actually have a video on YouTube where um, I use Django and then Flutter to build out a mobile to-do list. It's on my channel, it's on a live stream that I put together. So this right here needs some kind of API data to work with. We need some kind of JSON data. If you wanna work with React Native, Flutter, uh, maybe you wanna work with uh, React JS or Angular or Vue. These are all front-end frameworks that need APIs. We could use it for that. Uh, we can also use it maybe to share data. For example, Facebook has their own API. Uh, so does YouTube and Twitter. So if you wanna get some data from Twitter but you don't wanna actually go to their website, they have certain APIs that you can go to, read the documentation and call their data and actually view and modify data in the backend within their database using the API to interact with. So it's a means of communication and a format of how we provide data. So my rough explanation of APIs, let's just go ahead and start building this out. So we're gonna start by setting up a simple API and then we're gonna install the Django REST framework and we're gonna get to this. So remember, mobile applications, front-end frameworks, or just sharing data, these are all examples of when you might want to use an API. If you don't know why you need one, uh, just don't worry about it for now and stick to whatever you're building until you either get requested by your boss to build one or you need to build one for yourself for some reason, and then you can look into it. So if this section is not important, just go ahead and jump to the custom user model modification. So let's go ahead and create our API. Now there's different ways of doing this. We could create a new app inside of our Django project. What I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna create a new folder on its own. So we're not gonna run the star app command. I'm just gonna go into my base app because it's the only app that we have in our application and I'm gonna create my API inside of this app. So we're gonna create a folder called API. And in order to make this work, we first need an underscore init double underscore dot py file. So go ahead and do that double underscore init double underscore dot py. Now we are gonna need a urls.py file for our API. Our API will have its own URL routing system. So we're gonna have URLs specifically for this API. And we also need our own views. So we're gonna create a views.py file. And then we're gonna need something called serializers. So serializers, it's a word that I always have a hard time spelling. So serializers, I'll explain what those are in a second. So let's go ahead and actually start working with this API. So let's say we want a view in our API, and let's say we would just wanna respond with some JSON data when someone goes to our URL. So we could just go ahead and import from Django.http and we're just gonna import JSON response. So if you don't know what JSON data is, it's just a format of data. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Uh, and I'd recommend looking into this, but it's a format of how we can provide data here. So we're gonna create a function-based view with a Django REST framework. We can also use class-based views here. We're just gonna create a function-based views or function-based view. And we're gonna create our first view and this is gonna be called get routes. So this is gonna be a view that shows us all the routes in our API. So request, and then let's just return this data. So we'll just do return and then JSON response. Okay, so these URLs or these routes are simply gonna be two get methods here. So we're gonna pass in the method. So it's gonna be a get request. We can also send put, post, delete methods to our API. 
And this route is going to be API forward slash, and we're just getting rooms. So let's say that we want to create an API for people to see all the rooms in our application. So imagine that our website gets huge. It has millions of views. And now people want to access our API and build out their own applications. And maybe they just want to create like a website that just displays rooms on the most popular website in the world, which is uh, study buddy. So they just want to list out all the rooms inside of study buddy. So they make this request to us and we say, sure, we'll make an API for you. So here are the two routes that you can access. This will be like our documentation. So go to API for slash rooms. That's going to give you a JSON array of objects of all the rooms in our database and we can control what kind of data gets shown. Then if you want to get a specific room, let's say you want to create like a page for your project or your website, go to rooms and then just go ahead and add in the ID of the room that you want. And that will get you a single object and information about a single room. So we have a very simple API and this is what we're allowing users to see. Now for this JSON response, we're just going to take this Python array or Python list of strings at this point. And we're just going to throw this into the JSON response. Now for this, we also need to add in a parameter and we're going to set safe to false. And basically safe means that we can use more than just Python dictionaries inside of this response. So safe is going to allow this list to be turned into a JSON list. So this JSON response is going to convert this data into JSON data. So we now need a URL. So we want to be able to hit this endpoint. So we're going to go, we're going into our URLs file. We're going to import from Django dot URLs import path. So we need a path here. We also need our views. So remember that we're in the base app inside of API now, and we're going into views here. So we're going into that directory and we're importing all the views. Now we also need a URLs or URL patterns list here. So URL patterns, and I just want to make sure that it's URL patterns, not URLs. Okay, so that's correct. So we'll close this one out. So we're creating our URL patterns and we're going to set a path here. So this path right here is going to be an empty string. This is going to be for our routes. So we're going to tell the user if you go to forward slash API. In fact, let's just add this into our view. So let me close out all these other pages here or files. And let's just say if you go to get, well, you're going to, get this home page and they obviously know that because they're currently on that page if they're viewing this so we're going to that home page that's going to be forward slash api and we're going into views dot get routes and we're not going to specify a name now we need to connect this url patterns file or this urls apy file to the main project here so django technically doesn't know about this right here so we're going we're going into study bud right here and we're going into urls.py this is now in the root directory so we have three urls files here and we're going to create a new path here and this one's going to be prefixed with api forward slash and then we're going to send the user to base dot api and then we're going into urls dang it I keep hitting forward slash so urls so we're going into base API and we're pointing them to URL. So any URL that starts with an API or with API after the home URL, send them to this file and let this file take care of everything. So this URLs.py file will now handle that. So let me make sure my server's on. The URLs are connected. We have a JSON response and we should see this information. So we'll go into our project here, port 8000 forward slash API. And there we go. So we have a JSON response. This is now JSON data that anybody can make a request to and actually pull this data in. So they can use uh, Python, they can use JavaScript, whatever they want in their side, and they can call this URL if this was a live link. So uh, right now only I can call it because it's on localhost, but imagine if I had this on a domain, anybody can go to this URL, make this request and get this information. Okay, so that's a simple JSON response and a very minimalistic API, and there's not much we can do with it. Now, we can actually make our API work without the Django REST framework, but why do that when we have this awesome package? So let's go ahead and install that, and let's talk about what it can do here. So let's just go ahead and Google up Django REST framework, and let's open up this link right here. So we have the domain, and in the documentation, it shows us how we need to install it before we can use it. So we're gonna pip install Django REST framework, and then we need to add it to installed apps here. So let's go ahead and do that. 
We'll open our terminal up here. Let's open up a new one. And I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger, paste that in. So pip install Django REST framework as one word. And I actually need to do Python dash M first. So if you have that issue, go ahead and do that. And now it's installed. So I actually already had it installed here. So I don't need to worry about that. And now I need to go ahead and take rest framework and add that to installed apps. So that's all I need to do to enact to actually just install it into my project. So very little, we need to run the pip install and then in settings.py, we need to go to installed apps. So I'm going to create some space here. And then we're going to paste in rest underscore framework or write that out in a single quote. And now we are good to go. So at this point, what I'm going to do here is start building out my actual URLs and make sure that they're based off of the Django rest framework. So let's go back to our views here. And in our views, the first thing I want to do is update this. So we don't want to return back a simple JSON response. We want to use what the Django rest framework gives us. So in the Django rest framework, if you want to look at the documentation, I'm going to try to change up my zoom here. So in the documentation, we can see this API guide and these tutorials on how to work with our requests and responses here, how to work with serialization and so on. So I'd highly recommend you check this out here. So at this point with class-based views, we use this mix in right here called API views with a function based view. We add this decorator and that's going to add in extra functionality to our uh, API here. So we're first going to import response right here and API view. So I'm going to copy these right here and we're going to go into our views and let's just remove this and paste this in. So from rest underscore framework dot decorators import API view. So we now have access because we installed it and then we're going to do from rest framework dot responses import response. So the first thing is let's go ahead and add in a decorator. So API view and in here we're going to pass in a list and these are going to be the get or the HTTP methods that are allowed to access this view. So that means at this point, this view can only take in a get request. Now, if we want to allow a put request, we can say put. If we want to allow a post, we would add it like that. So these are the methods that we can specify here. So we just want to allow a get request. Users can only get data. And now we also want to update response here or the JSON response to response, which we just imported. Now we don't need save here, so I can get rid of that. Let's save this and let's take a look here. So if I go back to my API, if I refresh this, we now get this user or this interface that shows more information about our API. And this actually gives us more functionality than it looks right now or than how it looks. Uh, for example, we can actually make post and put requests directly from this interface. So it's like a UI for our API. We can see the methods that are allowed. We can see the content type and we can see this data formatted. So it's not too much, but it just gives us a better interface to work with. Now, what I could do is just go to this section right here, go to JSON, and that's going to allow or add in format right here and give us the standard JSON format. So you don't actually have to add this when you're calling the API, just go to this route and you'll get back this data. Uh, let's say if you were trying to use this in JavaScript, you wouldn't get back anything else here. You would just get back this list right here. So that's not too much more that we added. It just gives us an interface, but we want to go ahead and actually render out some more information and we'll see why this is or why the Django REST framework is so cool. So at this point, we wanna create another view here. So let's create a view here, and this is gonna be called get rooms. So we're creating this route right here that we're gonna allow everyone around the world to access, and we're gonna pass in request, and we're just gonna do return, and we're gonna do response here. So we're getting back a response. So let's throw that in and we're gonna pass in the rooms. So let's go ahead and get the rooms here. We wanna import that, so we're going into base. So now we are one folder outside of it, so we need to go back into base.models, and we're just gonna make a query for the room. So we're getting the rooms, and we're just gonna go ahead and do rooms is equal to room.objects.all, so all the rooms in the database. Now we do need to add in the decorator. So we wanted to use the Django REST framework functionality. So we'll just go ahead and do API underscore view. And we're only gonna allow a get request. So we'll pass that in. And there we go. So at this point, we're gonna have an issue here and I wanna show you what's going on. So before we actually fix it, I wanna show you the issue. So let's quickly get this view. Let's go to the URLs here. So to our API views and we'll create the path. And this is gonna be API forward slash 
rooms and then close that off and then the view is going to be get rooms okay so we have our url and we have our views that return back our rooms and let's try this so if i refresh this we're going to get an issue here and i'm not sure why it's not causing it let me just try to fix this so get rooms we'll save that we have our response our api view and for some reason the url is not working so let's try this one more time i'll do Control shift r oh i need to go to rooms okay so we're going to rooms and here we go so object type of room is not a json serializable so what's happening here is we're making a query set and this is a python list of objects here so it's a python list it's a query set and we need to make sure that we can serialize this data so that means that response cannot return back python objects now it was able to do it with this and we can even pass in dictionaries and that json response method was able to serialize and convert it but objects cannot be converted automatically so what we have here is a file for our serializer so our serializers are going to be classes that take a certain uh, model that we want to serialize or object and it's going to turn it into json data so it's going to basically take our python object turn it into a json object or a javascript object i guess a json object and then we can return that so the serializer is going to work a lot like the model form we're going to import a serializer we're going to create a class specify the model and the fields that we want to serialize and then that will be rendered out so let's go ahead and make a quick import so in our serializers.py file we're going to do from rest framework serializers we're going to import a model serializer so it's a lot like the model form you're going to notice a lot of similarities here so from base.models import room just like we did with the model form i'm going to keep referencing that because you'll see the comparison and then we're going to create a class here and i like to call my serializer the object name and then we're, we just do serializer like that okay so just like we had room form now we have room serializer this inherits from model serializer serializer that's a word that always trips my tongue up so we're going to set the meta and then we need to specify two fields at a minimum we're going to specify the model which will be the room and then we're going to specify the fields that are allowed and this can also be a list but at this point we're, gonna, we're just going to say give us all the fields so take this model right here this room model and serialize it so return back all these fields and turn that into a json object so now that we have our serializer we're going to take this serializer we're going back into our api views we're going to import it so it's in the same file path so we're doing from serializers import and then i'm going to paste that in our room serializer so now we just need to go ahead and add in a variable here we're going to call that serializer and we're just going to use the room serializer so room serializer then we need to pass in the object or objects that we want to serialize and then we need to pass in a parameter called many and this is going to be set to true so many means are there going to be multiple objects that we need to serialize or are we just serializing one in this case we are serializing a query set so many is going to be set to true so there are many objects so serializer is now an object here so what we want to do here is just go ahead and pass in serializer but we don't want to return back the object we want to return back the data attribute so i'll recommend maybe just printing out serializer see all the values in it or look up the documentation but if we access data that's going to give us rooms in a serialized format so if i save that let's go ahead and refresh this and look at this so we have our get rooms value here we can see a array right now so that's now an array and all that data was now serialized so we see the first room right here we see one object then we see another object we can see the id the title all the information about it so now we can officially return it so let's say in our application we don't want to just allow users to get the rooms we want to give them an endpoint to maybe open up a room in their website and view details about it or maybe we're building out that front end so what we can do here is go ahead and copy this view so get rooms paste that down here and we're going to change this up a little bit so we're going to change that to get rooms, so a single room and then we're going to change rooms to room room.objects.get the id is going to be pk so we're going to pass in the primary key so pk like that 
and then the serializer is going to take the room and then mini is going to be false so this means that it's going to return back a single object as opposed to that entire array so we have a view now we just modify that a little bit in our URLs. so if we look at this route right here it's going to be api rooms and then an id so in the urls we're just going to copy this paste this let's make sure to add in that trailing comma and i'll just add it twice here change this one to get room get room right there and then we're going to pass in the dynamic value that's going to be a string value for now pass in the name and there we go so that's going to be the endpoint and let's try this out so if we go here we have a list right here we can see the two square brackets let's say we want a single room let's get room number one right here so with the id of one so we'll throw one in and for some reason that was not configured let's check this out so rooms that needs to be plural sorry about that I just got into the habit of removing all the s's there so now if i refresh that here we go we get back a single room so we have information about the room we see the all part all the participants ids and we can actually nest serializers so we can have children in these and that's not something that we're going to get into i get into that in my full django course and i also talk about authentication with the django rest framework and we use json web tokens there so that's it for our simple api now i want to show you how to use this maybe you see how we put this together but it doesn't fully make sense in what we're trying to do with this so let me just try to give you one example and for this if you want to skip this you can we're just going to use a little bit of javascript here and just make a call here and i want to show you one issue that can occur when someone else tries to call this api so let's give you an example so in our application here let's go ahead and create a new file here and we're going to call this front end or uh, let's just call this cool website okay so somebody from the other side of the world let's just say they're completely across the world here they're creating a new website and all they have at this point is a simple html file so just to really show you separation let's open up study bud here let's grab that file and let's bring that out here so once i'm done with this i'll actually bring it back here but for now we can see our website which will represent our api and then we see cool websites right here so if i go into that website let's actually open up a new text editor so let's go ahead and do new file let's actually close this out we'll do new window open up a completely different text editor remember these two applications do not need to know about each other at all they're two separate applications so we're going to go to new file here or open file we'll go into my desktop and we're just going to grab our cool website okay so let's add in some html so this person is starting to build out their awesome new website that's going to display all these rooms they're just going to go ahead and create that html tag and we'll just call this cool rooms okay so let's get rid of this link right here in that javascript file they're going to start building out their title here and they'll just say cool rooms and they're going to create a div where all these rooms are going to be displayed so we'll just create an id here and this is going to be rooms dash container okay so let's open up this website so i'm going to minimize all of this we'll open up the cool website and here we go this is all we have so they have this part of the website done let's say they're not into css and they want to keep it simple now they need to get some data so they're going to use some javascript and they're going to call our api here so they're going to go into their text editor and they're going to start making requests here so in their website here the first thing they're going to do is create some kind of javascript file here so let's see just underneath our body tag we're going to create a script tag and they're just going to go ahead and create a function called get room so don't worry about the javascript if you don't know this we're going to go quick and i won't explain it uh, just code along or kind of follow for the concept so we're creating a function called get rooms and this is going to be an arrow function so if you don't know what that is don't worry about that so we're creating an arrow function and this function's job is to make an api call to this endpoint so we're going to use the fetch api so they're going to make a request and we tell them okay go to our website here on poor 8000 and go to api forward slash rooms this is the endpoint that you need to call and this will give you this response right here so once you call that data then you can do whatever you want with it so we're going to pass that in into that fetch recall or the fetch request now in this fetch request 
we want to actually pull this data and get some kind of response. So we're going to use async await. Uh, these are going to be uh, the alternative to our promises. It's a different way of working with the fetch API. And we're going to set a variable called response here. And this is going to be a wait. And then we're making that request. So this request right here will get us some data. So what I can do here is go ahead and just do console.log. And we're going to console the response. And we'll just console the response here. So let's go ahead and trigger this function. So we need to call it. And there we go. So that's all the function does right here. So it's a simple function, makes a call, and it's supposed to print out the data. So let's go ahead and check this out. So if I open this up, let's go to our website. Let's open up the console. We want to see this printed out. And oh, crap, we have an issue. So this was planned. So we need to work on something called CORS configuration. So CORS stands for Cross Origin Resource Sharing. And you can see this right here. So if I hover over that, we see this issue. And what's happening here is this person is trying to access our website here. And Django is saying, I don't know who you are. You're accessing this website from a completely different resource and I'm not gonna let you access this. So what we need to do is configure that so Django can either allow all endpoints to make requests to our API or we can even provide a specific set of URLs that are allowed to call our API. So let's go ahead and configure that. So this is a very common issue, the cores issue. So we're gonna go ahead and fix that. And for this, we're going to use something called Django cores headers. So this is going to be a third party package that we can install that takes care of this. So the first thing we're going to do is run this install. So we're going to do Python dash M pip install Django hyphen cores hyphen headers. So we're going to go ahead and install this. So let's open this up. We're going to open up a new terminal and we're going to paste this in. So we just installed it. Then in the documentation, it tells us to add this to installed apps. We'll bring that in. So we'll minimize this now. We'll close that one out, leave the server on, and let's go to settings.py. So underneath the REST framework, let's add in cores headers like that. So you can write that out or just add it. And then after we add that, we need to add in the cores middleware to this middleware's variable inside of settings.py. So we'll go into middleware. Let's bring this in right here. I'll create some space so we can see it. So cores headers, middleware, and then dot cores middleware. So based on the documentation, we can set three different things. So first we have cores allowed origins, and this is going to be a list of specified URLs that we're going to allow. So it's going to look something like this. Go ahead and allow example.com, allow sub.example.com, port 8080, port 90, and so on. So we can allow multiple ports and URLs to access our website. We can also use regex here and specify some kind of regex right here that allows certain types of domains, or we could specify cores allow all origins. So this is going to be what we're going to use. And we're just going to bring this down here at the bottom of our website. And we're just going to say true. So by default, this is false and cores allow all origins means we're going to allow all URLs to access our website. So if I save that, once this configuration is done, I can close out the documentation and let's check this out. So we're having this issue. Now, if I refresh it, boom, the issue goes away and we have our response. Now this response doesn't tell us anything. So, or it does tell us a lot. It tells us information about that. It tells us the status code, but we want to see this data right here. We actually want to see this response. So we need to specifically with our front end here, we need to parse this data. So with a fetch API, that's a way to make requests. You can also use Axios, jQuery, if you're still using that. There's different ways of doing things, but with the fetch API, we can go ahead and get the rooms here and the rooms we'll get using the await right here. And we're just going to do response.json. And before I jumped off on my side tangent, I meant to say that with a fetch API, when we send data, we have to stringify it. When we get it, we have to parse it and turn it back into JSON data. So that's just how it works. So let's just copy and paste rooms here. And now we want to see the rooms information. So we can go back to our front end in our cool website. And here we go. So imagine this is somebody from the other side of the world. They just made an API call and they got this data right here from our API and they're able to see it and actually start working with that data. So that's how that works. We create the API and then somebody can access that. So it's a way of sharing information. It's like a phone call where you're, uh, or I guess sending emails, you're passing data and you're getting data. 
So let's actually just show you how you can render that out. We might as well show that right now. So let's say this person gets this API call, then they just want to add in some data into the rooms container. So they're going to use a query selector. So we're just going to set the rooms container and that's going to be equal to document dot get element by ID. Don't worry about the JavaScript here. So we're not going to focus on that and we're just going to do rooms container. Okay. So we have this div right here. So we have access to this. And after we get the data, what I want to do is create a for loop. So I'm going to remove that console and we're going to create a JavaScript for loop and we're going to set the loop here. So we're going to set I that's going to be equal to zero. And with JavaScript here, we're going to do rooms dot length. So while so we're going to do dot length like that. So while I is less than rooms dot length, we're just going to increment I. So we'll just do I plus plus. So that's a for loop in JavaScript for those of you that don't know that or one of the ways of doing it. Then we're going to set the room variable and this is going to be set to rooms and then we're going to access the index of that. So I know it's a little bit of a side tangent from the Django Rest framework, but a lot of people like this in the course when I showed it this way. So I want to do this again here uh, in the full Django 2021 course that I did. So we're going to create a row now and this is going to be set to these two back ticks here. So these are template literals and template literals allow us to add in more than what we would do inside of a regular quote here. So we're going to create some divs here and it gives us some extra functionality and how we can work with it. So we're going to create like an HTML element using these back ticks. Then we can create an H3 tag. And because of these back ticks or template literals, we can add in variables directly into our content by using a dollar symbol and then these two curly braces. So it's actually a little bit like the Django templating engine uh, syntax that we had. So we can now go ahead and just do room dot name. And that gives us this div with this content. So in the for loop outside of these back ticks, we're just going to do room container. So we're getting this value right here. So this item and we're going to create some space here and we're just going to append all these divs right here with the H3 tag inside of this div. So we're just going to do room container dot inner HTML. So inner HTML plus equals and then we're going to set that to row. So we're passing that in. Let's go ahead and create some space and let's check this out. So undefined. Okay, let's see what's going on here. So we have our room. We're going into rooms. We're getting the request here. Rooms dot name. Okay, that needs to be room dot name. So this variable right here. So we're going into that and there we go. So this is the awesome website that this random person from the other side of the world wanted to build out using our API and regardless of how cool or uncool their website is, we now gave them a way of doing that. Now, if we can tell them, go ahead and access, you know, a certain ID at this endpoint, that's how you would do it. So they would add in links here when they click on these, they can display that information. So sort of a side tangent, but we just took care of that. And I wanted to go ahead and show you how to do that. So let's go ahead and move on to working with a custom user model. And I kind of want to do some explanation here and explain why we left it out in the beginning here and why we're gonna add it the way we'll do it now. So the user model is already built into Django and this is something that gives us, or this is something that contains how a user gets authenticated and it contains very important information about our user and it's a vital part of our application. Now, there's multiple ways of adding to it. For example, in our user model, we don't have a bio, we don't have a profile picture, maybe we want like a full name value we don't have this information in that user model. Now, one thing we could do is add a one-to-one -one relationship. And this is how we do this in my Django 2021 course. We add in a one-to-one -one relationship and we would simply create a profile model. So the profile model would contain all the information like the user's Facebook account, social links, uh, bios, profile pictures, and so on. And we created this one-to-one -one relationship and this one-to-one -one relationship would simply uh, connect to the user model. And that means that a user can only have one profile and a profile can only have one user. So we would connect those and then we would add in things like the profile picture and all that information to the profile model. So this way we never actually have to touch the user model. Now, what I'm going to do here, because I already did that in that course, so you can check out that option if you want. And I also have videos on YouTube for free on that. Uh, instead of using that method, we're going to modify the user model. Now, I typically do not like to use this method. There's downs and ups to both sides with the method where we add the one-to-one -one relationship. It does require a little bit more configuration when you 
uh, register your user or um, update information about the user. It does require some more configuration, but it's safer because the user model is not being touched. Now in here, we're actually gonna override the user model and then we're gonna customize it. So I don't like doing this. So what I'm gonna do here is create a completely new project. It's gonna take a second here. We're gonna create a completely new Django project. I'm gonna show you how to customize it so we can focus on just that part. And then we're going into this project. We're actually gonna to have to clear our database because now once we start messing with that user model, it's gonna really change things up and you'll see why. And then we're gonna to have to re-add in data once that's remigrated. So this is why I saved this part for the very end. So let's go ahead and actually uh, apply this right now. So we're gonna go ahead and close everything out here. So we're gonna cl close out this project right here. We'll close out our Django project, any other projects that I have, I'm gonna leave, uh, or I guess I'm gonna close it out here. And let's just take our cool website and bring that into study button. And in here, I'm just gonna rename that to, uh, we'll just do API example. Okay, so that way when you look into the documentation, you can see how that looks. Okay, so I already have Django installed globally. You could just go ahead and reinstall that. Uh, you could also set up your virtual environment. For now, I'm just gonna go into my desktop here. So CD desktop, uh, just go ahead and run pip install Django. I have it globally, as you can see, I don't have a virtual environment. Make sure that's installed and then just do Django dash admin and we'll just do user model or we'll just do custom user model. Okay, so Django dash admin start project. So let me zoom in here one second, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna try to go as slow as possible here. So Django custom user model, and then we'll just add in start project. Okay, so this is gonna start up our new Django project. We're gonna go ahead and open up a new VS Code terminal here, or new VS Code or uh, file, text editor. So go ahead and open one up. Find this new project, we should see user model right here, custom user model, go ahead and open that up in your desktop. So I have that right here, it looks really small for some reason, but just go ahead and select that file. So now we have a new Django project. So let's go ahead and start customizing this. So the first thing we wanna do is go into that terminal and create a new app. So we'll just do, why the heck is this doing this? Okay, python manage.py start app, and we're gonna call this base. So the same thing that we did in our original project, we have our new app, we're going into settings.py and we're just gonna go ahead and configure installed apps. So we're going into base.apps.base config. Okay, so that's all the prep work. Now, there is documentation on how to modify the user model. So instead of going into that, I'm just gonna start adding this in right here. So we have our new app here and we have this user model and before we start migrating our database, this is why I'm, I'm starting this from scratch so we don't have to redo anything. We're gonna go into the models file. Remember, the user model is already built into Django. So what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and build out my own user model and it's gonna inherit from the original Django user model and then we're just gonna extend it. So we're just gonna go ahead and run an import. So from Django.contrib.auth.models import abstract, so import abstract user. Okay, once we have that, we're gonna create a class here, and this is gonna be called user. So user is gonna inherit from the abstract user, and we're just gonna set pass here. Okay, so that's our new user model, and it's gonna have all the functionality of the original user model. And this is also where I'm gonna show you the example of how to customize like the username to an email field instead of logging in with a username, we can log in with an email. Okay, so we have that new user model. And what I'm gonna do here is tell Django that I want to use this model right here instead of the original Django user model. So we'll go into settings.py and we're gonna set this variable called auth and then we're gonna do underscore user underscore model. And we're gonna tell Django which model is gonna be our new authentication model. So the auth model. So we're gonna point this to base. So that's our app and we're going into user. So this model right here, we're pointing it and we're saying use this model now to actually use our authentication or handle our authentication and everything like that. 
Okay, so we have that. And once we point to it, let's go ahead and run some migrations. So we're gonna do Python manage.py make migrations. So we're gonna run those migrations. We have a user model, Python manage.py migrate. And now that's all migrated. So all the default tables that got migrated, that's all added to the SQLite database. So really quick, let's just go ahead and create a user. So we'll do Python manage.py create super user. We're gonna call this user Dennis and then Dennis at email.com. Set a password, so nothing new here. One second, let me restart the password. Okay, so we have a user created. Now, typically we don't have to register our user with the admin panel, but because we created our own user model, we do need to go into admin.py. And now we're just gonna do from dot models import user. And then we're gonna do admin dot site dot register. Once you see some of the issues that we're gonna run into, you'll thank me for starting it fresh like this because uh, it's actually pretty simple, but it could get tricky for someone that doesn't understand it. And especially with our project at the size that it is, it's gonna be a slight nuisance. It's not gonna to be too hard, but just in case. So let's go ahead and run our server now. So manage.py, run server, and let's check this out. Okay, so all we did was we went ahead and created a new user model. We imported or inherited from this, we added in settings.py, the auth user model, pointed that to base and then user, and then we registered that with the admin panel. So now if I go into the admin panel, let's go to port 8000, let's go to forest slash admin, I can now log in as this user, and you'll notice the users is no longer inside of authentication and authorization. So the app that we've been working in up until now, the user was originally right here. But because we created our own user model, it now says the user model is inside of the base app here. So it looks like the original user, it has all the functionality, the password, all this information, and all the stats about our user. So it's a standard user model, and that's how we can simply customize it. Now let's go ahead and, or that's how we can change what user model we're using. But now let's go ahead and actually customize some of the fields here. So the first thing is, is I wanna make sure I can register with an email value instead of a username. That's a little bit annoying to do. So let's just pull up the admin panel. I just logged out. So we'll just do admin. And we want to log in with an email instead of a username. It's really annoying to have to remember a username for every website. A Little bit easier to remember your own email. So let's go ahead and go back to the user model. And in the model, we're gonna go ahead and remove pass and we're gonna set a few values here. So the first thing is, is we're gonna set a name. So we're actually gonna add in some custom fields. The default field here or the default user model has uh, a first and a last name and then a user, but I want a name value. I don't like the first and last name method. So we'll just do char field here. We'll set the max length. That's gonna be 200. And because we already have a user, we do need to set null to true. Otherwise it's gonna give us an issue. Okay, so we have the name, then we are gonna add in an email field. Even though it has one, we're just gonna override it. This is gonna be models.email field. And we're gonna set this to unique. So unique has to be true in order to actually log in with it. So that means that two users can't have the same email because once they try to log in, Django won't know which user is trying to log in. So this needs to be unique. So make sure you set that. And let's just add in a bio. So we'll just do models. So models.text field and null will be true because we already have a model here. So we just wanna make sure that user doesn't have to add in a bio. So now we're just gonna do username field and we're gonna set that to email. So we're gonna tell Django the username field is now gonna be the email field right here. So use this instead of the username. So just change it right there. Now we're also gonna set required fields. Go ahead and add that and just make that an empty list for now and that's it. So once we make these modifications, we're gonna go ahead and open up our terminal, do python manage.py make migrations. So we're gonna make the migrations first, then we need to migrate them. So python manage.py migrate, and we should be good. So my server is still on, so I'll close out this terminal. And let's check out the admin panel. So if we go here, now we see email. Now, if I try to log in with my username, it doesn't work. I'm gonna do dennis at email.com. 
voila, I'm logged, I'm logged in here. So let's go to the user. We'll go here. We see the first and last name that was already there, but now we see the name value and a bio. So we have customized our user model and we added in the email field. So again, the reason why I started this off blank is because I wanted to show you how to do this without running into any issues. And I didn't do this in the beginning of the project because I didn't want somebody running into these issues and then having to fix it later and then having that be a pain and stopping them from completing the tutorial. So if you're ever doing this, do this early on in your project. Don't do it midway through. Now we are going to do it midway through because if you do happen to want to change your mind and do it, I want to show you a different way of actually uh, being able to actually go through this process and change it because there's a good chance that you might have to do this. I've had to do this before. So now that we've done the easy way, I want to show you the more challenging way. So let's go ahead and close out what we currently have. And let's just open up our original Django project. So we'll go back in here. And for some reason, my text is super small. Okay, so now I'm able to zoom in a little bit. So I guess whatever's on my desktop doesn't really matter. So just go ahead and open up study bud and get that server going. So we're going to add in some profile pictures and things like that. So go ahead and make sure your virtual environments on activate the server. So Python manage.py run server, start that up here. And let's make sure our project is open. Go back here, pour 8,000 and let's go ahead and do this. So the first thing I'm going to do here is go ahead and I'm going to clear my database. So at this point, we already have data in here. And this is why I say do this in the beginning of the project. We already have data in here, so we're going to need to completely clear it. So if you don't want to clear your project and you don't want to use this method, don't do it. But at this point, you could maybe make a duplicate of your project and try this out. That's actually what I would recommend. Go ahead and make a copy of this project so you have a backup you can revert to. So that way you don't lose what we've worked on just in case. So Let's go to the DB SQLite database and let's delete it. So we'll delete it permanently. In fact, my server is on, so you're going to have to turn off your server before you do that. So go ahead and delete that and then go ahead and go into base, go to your migrations and delete all the migrations because you are going to have an issue if you try to migrate with all those previous migrations. So go ahead and clear it as if we've never had a migration and we never had any data in our application. So now that we've cleared all that out, we're going to have to do uh, a few weird things here, I guess, because we're having to basically start from square one. So we'll go into our application. The first thing I want to do here is comment out all the other models. So we're going to act as if these models were never even added into our application, and then we'll have to remigrate them. So I can comment all these out by hitting control and then forward slash. That's a trick to do that. So I'm not sure if that's going to be different on your computer, but go ahead and comment all that out. And let's go ahead and remove this right here. So we're no longer using that default user model that Django gives us. So now we're going to create our new model just like we did. So we're repeating what we did in the last uh, section here. And we're going to use the abstract user model here. So let me go ahead and open up the demo code that I need to view for this. So give me one second. Okay, so, all right, I have that prepped here and I'm gonna continue. So I have that open and we're just gonna go ahead and make that quick import. So before we finish this abstract user, let's make that import. So from Django.contrib.auth.models and we're gonna import abstract user. So we just did this. Then we're gonna take abstract user. We're gonna paste that in here. Let's go ahead and add in pass and that's it. So all we're trying to do is get Django to look at our new user model as opposed to what we originally had. So once we set this in the last step here, what we did was we went into settings.py. Sorry about the outside noises. If you can hear those, I have like construction companies out there now. So now that we have this, we're going into settings.py and we need to go underneath our URLs. Well, technically it doesn't matter where you add it, but uh, I'm going to add it under my URLs and we're going to set the auth underscore user underscore model. And that's going to be pointing to base dot user. So the user model we have in here now. So we just did that. Okay. So we have that taken care of and now let's try to migrate this. So I want to show you the issue before we continue. So I might as well show you this right now. 
So if I try to run a migration, so we'll just do python manage.py make migrations, we're going to see some issues. So at this point, we have all these files. And again, I'm going to do this more manually, but we have all these files and it says, hey, I can't import room and topic and message because I don't know what these what the heck these are. We haven't even ran those migrations. Now, if we didn't comment out our models, when we try to run this migration, Django would give us an issue right here. In fact, let's just try this. So let's uncomment this. And let's try this one more time. So Python manage.py make migrations. So I just cleared that. Okay, never mind. Wow, it actually did work right away. Sorry about that. Okay, well, I guess I'm not sorry because that actually fixes our problem. So go ahead and clear your database or delete the database. Uh, make sure you add in this model, clear all the old migrations. That was important because this will not work. Remigrate it. So re add in all these in the migrations and then just do python manage.py migrate. Boom. Okay, perfect. Wow, that actually really saves us a lot of time. So we just created a new database and new database tables, but now we're using this user model right here. So let's go ahead and create the super user. So Python manage.py create super user. Let's try that one more time. So Python manage.py create super user. And we're just going to add in Dennis. This will be Dennis at email dot com and then the password duplicate that password and there we go okay so let's run the server now so python manage.py run server okay so we're going to see a few issues still here though so at this point if we go to the admin panel we'll just go to forward slash admin i can now log in with this username and we have a clear uh, database here so we have no messages and we have no topics all we have is our user so we need to register the user with the admin panel so we'll go into the admin panel or admin.py file and we're just going to import the user now so it's going to be a little bit weird because now we import user from the models instead of uh, that default import that we had and let's just add this right here so we're going to go ahead and do admin.site.register and we're going to pass in user okay so we register the user now we can see one user here so we're just kind of restarting from the beginning and back in all the pages here we're going into the views now so let's just go ahead and go line by line here we're not line by line but file by file and we're going to change this default import and we're going to change this to user right here so now we're going in here so th this is the difference now that we're allowing uh, our own user model to be uh, or now that we're accessing our own user model so now we're using that. We're not making that original import. Also in forms.py, we also import the user model that way. We're going to change that and change it to this. Okay, so we have that user model. Everything should be good. Views, forms. All right, so let's go ahead and just uh, start changing the login field here. So let's add in our custom fields now. So. We're going into models now, and we're gonna do what we just did in the last section here. So in the last section, we went into that model and we added in the name value. So we added name, that's gonna be models.char field, max length, we're setting that to 200. Null is gonna be set to true. So we're just repeating a few things here. We're adding in an email. So email is gonna be set to models dot email field and null is also going to be true and we want a bio this will be models dot text field so we're going to do a text field for the bio and null will also be set to true so let's also add in blank as true here so actually you know what we're going to leave it like that because i want to require this at some point so we're going to leave it like that and then we're gonna have an avatar. So avatar like that. And this is something we're gonna comment out. So I'm gonna do this in a second because it does require its own configuration. So now we just need the username field. So user username field is gonna be email. So we're just overriding this and I'm doing this step by step. So as we face the issues, I can fix them right away. So we'll just do required and required is gonna be empty. Okay, so let's run these migrations now. So username field 
must be unique. So I forgot about that. So the email field needs to be unique. That's going to be true. And let's try this. Okay, so this issue, this issue should go away. Let's run that migration. Make migrations. Python manage.py migrate. And let's check this out. So let's just make sure this was added. So in the user model, I can now add in a name. So we'll just do Dennis Ivanov. And for the bio, let's just add in some lorem ipsum text here. So we'll just say, actually, we'll go to my website, dennisiv.com. Sorry about that chainsaw outside. So we have that. We're going to add that as a bio. We'll save that. And the user now has some more information. Okay. So that all worked. Now what we want to do is add in a image field. So I'm going to pause it and wait for that chainsaw to be done. All right. So now when we refresh the page, all the content goes away because we have a completely new database. So before we add in the user profile picture, I do want to add in some content. So that way we can actually output it and see what we need to update and actually see those profile pictures rendered. So the only reason why we were seeing that earlier as far as the content was because I didn't refresh the website after we made all those changes. So completely forgot about that. So let's go ahead and just add in some more information. So we'll add in a room and we'll just say, let's learn Python. And then once I save that, I can see what picture I need to update. And once I actually update that part of the code, we'll see that it actually works. So for the room messages, we also do have profile pictures. So we'll just say, looks cool. And then later on, I will register as another user and we'll output that user's profile picture. So back inside of the model here so in the user model in models.py let's go ahead and uncomment the avatar attribute so this is going to be set to models.image field so before we even run the migrations or actually save anything let's go ahead and open up the terminal here and i want to show you why i waited for this so at this point if i hit save here or control s we're going to see this issue here so the image field relies on a third party package called pillow which is simply an image processing library and we need this in order for this field to work here. So I didn't want to deal with that right away when we were still making the user model. So now that we have it, let's go ahead and run this install and we need to configure a few more things here. So we'll go ahead and turn off our server and we'll just do pip or python dash m pip install pillow. So we'll get pillow installed. And once I run the server, that issue should go away. So python manage.py run server and there we go so i haven't run the migrations yet so we want to finish up the actual attribute here and what i want to do next here is set the null value to true so we already have a, a user here so i don't want to have any conflicts in the database and we can actually set the default image so let's say a user registers we don't want to have a, we don't want to have to force them to upload a picture right away they might not have one ready right away so let's just set a default picture with some kind of like avatar picture and that way they can choose to update this later so we're going to set this to an image inside of static and images and if you downloaded that template you should have a picture called avatar.svg so if you don't have this go ahead and get that from the source code or just add in your own image into this file path so static and then images and then set that right here. So we're just gonna do avatar.svg. And I always talk funny when I'm sounding out and typing. Okay, so we're still not migrating yet. We just added in a default. So every single user model by default will have this picture until it gets updated. So for user uploaded content, we talked about static files earlier and these images are static files. Now, there's a different way to handle user uploaded content or user uploaded images. So what's going to happen here is when a user uploads it, we first need to tell Django where to upload this picture to and then how to actually render out the image URL. So let's go into settings.py and we'll go down to where we configured our original static files. So down here we have the static files directory and that works for the standard images on our website and the CSS and JavaScript files. But for user uploaded content, we need to set media underscore root. So media root is going to tell Django where to upload these user profile pictures. So if we later on had some user uploaded content, maybe for a room or maybe a user can add a picture to their message, media root is going to tell Django when that form gets submitted, where this picture is going to go. So Django is going to look at media root and it's going to follow the file path that we give it. So at this point, we're just going to set this to the base directory 
and we're going to tell Django go into the static folder and store this picture inside of the images folder. So we'll go into static and then we'll go into images. So you can store your static files in different ways. Typically in a production environment, you'd use something like an AWS S3 bucket and upload it directly there. But for now in our development environment, this will do just fine. So we're telling Django, put this picture right here. Now, after we have our media root, and we're not gonna worry about static root in this video here. So uh, after we have our media root, we also need to specify a URL for these pictures. So we're gonna do media underscore URL. So in this case, just like we have a URL for the static for all the links here, the links and standard images, well, we're gonna specify a media URL for user uploaded pictures. So now they're gonna be prefixed with images here. So we have a media URL and a media root. So we're not done yet. We also need to configure our root directories URLs.py file. So in here, we need to add in the file path to these URLs. So we first need to make a few imports. So we'll just do from django.conf and we'll import settings. So this will give us access to settings.py, so to this folder. So after that, we need to do from django.conf.urls and we're gonna import or urls.static and we are gonna import the static method. Okay, so we have our URL paths and we're gonna add in one more path, but instead of adding it as a path like this, we're just gonna do URL patterns and we're just gonna append to it. So plus equals, we're gonna use the static method and we're just gonna tell Django, go ahead and set a URL path to settings.media underscore URL. Then we're gonna set that to document underscore root. And I wanna make sure my face isn't covering this. And document root is gonna to point to settings. And I'll explain what's going on here in a second. So settings dot media underscore root. So we're setting a URL and the file path is gonna be media URL from settings. So this is the URL. So we set this URL right here and we're telling it set the URL and get the file from media root. So settings dot media root. So we just connected these two right here. So in settings.py, we connected media root to media URL. So let's save all of this. And now let's run our mi migration. So the default model that we have already should be attached to this avatar when we run this migration. So let's go ahead and open up our terminal. And we're just gonna open up a new terminal here. Our server is still running and I'm just gonna run python manage.py make migrations. So that's gonna prep the migrations for the avatar in that user model. Then we need to run that migration. So we'll just do python manage.py migrate. So we ran the migration and let's take a look at what we have here. So if I go into the admin panel, let's go ahead and do forward slash admin. If I go to users, go to Dennis right here, I should now see avatar here. So if I click on this, we can see the file path. So that's the domain images. That's what we set in media URL. And then we see the picture. So when I ran that migration by default, this was added to Dennis. So let's go ahead and change that picture. So we'll go back to the admin panel. I shouldn't have closed that. And we'll just go into users. And let's actually update this profile picture. So you can't do this from the form on the front end because we have not configured that form yet. So I added some pictures of myself here. We'll just take this one right here and we'll just do open, submit that. And Django already knows how to process this. So we'll take care of that form submission in a second. For now, we'll just do it from the admin panel. So let's render this picture out now. So we'll go back to our homepage and I wanna render this out right here and anywhere I make a comment or anywhere I set up a room here. So we'll go back into our template and we wanna start with our index.html file or our home.html, so the home page. So that's actually in the feed component or the room component. Let's see, what the heck did I call that? I'm like starting to lose all this. Okay, so we have the feed component. Okay, so in the feed component, we're looping through all the rooms and we want to output the user profile picture. So let's see, let's just go ahead and do a search for the image tag. So here we go, we see the avatar and right now it's a link to this random picture generator. And we're gonna remove all of that and we're gonna get the profile picture. So in this case, I'm gonna go into the room, 
Then we're going into the host, which is the user. Then we're going into avatar. And instead of just specifying the avatar, I need to specify the URL here. So we'll do avatar.url. So now if I refresh this, now I see my picture right here. So we're rendering out the profile picture and that looks a lot better. So I can also do that for the header section. So we'll go into the navigation bar. We'll just update this in a few pictures and then eventually I'll leave this up to you to make all these updates. I don't wanna spend time on the tutorial, just uploading or updating pictures. So we'll go into templates in the nav bar. Let's see, in the nav bar, where do we have the image tag? So we have the logo. Then we have the avatar right here. So we wanna update this. So if the user is authenticated, output the avatar. So in this case, we're going into user or we'll just do request.user. So we're getting the user based on the request.user model. And then we're going into avatar.url. So we're specifying the URL. So if I refresh that, there we go, I see my profile picture. So I'm just gonna go ahead and update this in a few different areas here. And I wanna show you one little issue. So if we delete this user picture, uh, we are gonna get an error. So I guess I won't show it to you, but if you delete that picture, you're gonna get an error because we're accessing the avatar URL attribute. So make sure users cannot not have a picture. So if they delete it, have some kind of default picture go in there. So we'll make a few more updates. So we'll add this to the activity feed. So we'll do that right here. And then we'll add in a new user and we'll show you how to submit that form. So we'll go into activity and let's see. So we have the avatar right here. We'll update this. So message.user.avatar.url and we'll also do this in the chat. So we'll refresh that. That should have updated it. Or was that in the avatar or the activity page? So I guess that works, but we need to go to the activity component and update this right here. So let's see up here in the activity component. Let's update this guy right here. Refresh that and let's go to the message. We'll update this host information. So what I'm going to do is just update the host and the chat and then I'll leave it to you to update all the participants and any other areas where I may have missed this. So I got my point across as far as showing you how to do it. Now it's up to you to apply that. So let's go to the room here. We'll go to room and let's see. So we have the room. The host should be somewhere right here. So if the request user, that's the update method. The room header right here hosted by and here we go. So we see the avatar. Let's update this. So we'll just do room dot host dot avatar dot url and we'll also update the conversation so down here let's see random user okay so the avatar right here let's take this value and in this case we're going into the message dot user dot avatar dot url okay so Let's test this out right here. So now we see the host. Uh, let's say I register as another user. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, actually, before we do that, I want to update the user update form. So I want to fix that first. So let's go ahead and fix it. So we'll go ahead and go into settings. So in this area, now this form needs to be updated. So we just have a username and an email, but it doesn't represent our new user model. So for this, Let's go ahead and create a new form and render that out. So we'll close everything out. We'll go into forms.py and let's actually go to views. So we'll go into views. We'll take this user creation form and then we'll open up forms.py and we'll just paste that in here. So what I need to do is go away from the default user creation form on registration. And then I also need to create an updated user form to represent these fields here. So we'll import that for now and let's go to our user form. So in our user form, we now have a name, then we're gonna have a username, email, and let's just add in avatar. So avatar, and then we'll add in bio. So I'll make sure that I'm not covering this. So this is inside of the user form. So remember that. So we'll just do bio. 
Okay, so you can still see that. So if I refresh this, now we see all of this. And again, I'm all messed up here because I'm so zoomed in. My screen is just weird. I'm at 175% here, plus zooming in on this too. So now we see the current picture, we see this file, and we see all this information. So I can actually update and process this right now. This will all work fine. But the only issue is that the image right here will not work. So we need to fix up the front end and the back end to actually process this. So from the front end, inside of this form, we're gonna go into the create user form. I have so many files here, but I'll leave them just so you can have the originals. So update user, we'll go in here and what I need to do is add in multi-part, or we need to specify the ink type and this is gonna be multi-part forward slash form data. So this is gonna tell us that we're actually submitting files with this form and not just content in the original field. So we specify the ink type and then in the back end to process this, we do need to update the views. So we'll go to the edit user page. So we have the register page, user profile, create room, update room, delete. Okay, update user. So in here, all we're gonna do is also pass in request.files and that's all we need to do and this will send the files with it and actually process that. So update the form, update the update user method, and anytime you're submitting files, you want to make sure that the form takes that in. So I'll refresh this now. So I'll just do a hard refresh, Control Shift R, and let's go ahead and add in some information. We'll just say the bio was now updated. So we'll just say updated. We'll take a new profile picture, and let's say I wanna revert back to this picture, so we'll add that in. If I submit that, now my profile picture was updated. And you can go in and update the bio, update the profile picture inside of the user form, and just make sure all that's modified. So we added that in, we updated the user, the user update form, and now we just want to update the registration form. So I wanna register as a new user. So if I go to login and then sign up, we have new attributes here, so I want to represent those attributes. So we'll go in here, Let's go into the forms file. So we imported the user creation form. So in here, let's just go ahead and do class and we'll just do my user creation form. So we're gonna create a form that's gonna inherit from this user creation form. So it's gonna have all the same attributes here. So we're gonna go ahead and add this in. That's our user creation form. And then in this user creation form, we need to specify class of the, or class meta pass in the model, that's gonna be the user, then we need to add in the fields. So when a user is registering, what fields do we want to render out? So we just want to render out the name, so I wanna get the name right away. We wanna get the username, then let's get the email. We also wanna get the password, so we have a password and the password confirmation. So in this section and in the form by default, they're called password one and then password two. Okay, so my user creation form. So inside of views, I can actually remove this user creation form and I'm, I'm gonna paste in the new form that I just created. So I already copied that and I'm gonna paste in my user creation form. So now back in the registration view, we're just gonna change this to my user creation form and then paste that in right here too. So right here and right here. So now if I refresh this, now I see more form fields. So let's say uh, we wanna have someone named Tim register. Tim will register with the username of Tim and we'll just do Tim at email.com. That's what he's gonna log in with. We'll just add in the password, confirm that, and let's register. So now if I register, I'm registered as Tim. I can see that default avatar, that looks good. I can join a room and comment. So we'll just say, I'll check it out. Okay, so now we see Tim's comment. And again, update the participants there. And if Tim wants to update his avatar, let's go ahead and just say, Tim's gonna take my old picture. We'll update that and we'll add in a bio and we'll just say, I like to code and that should be good. Okay, so there we go. So Tim is now part of this room right here, and we can see Tim's information and my information 
and that's it for the registration page. So the last thing I'm gonna do in this tutorial here is gonna to be to update the login form. So typically a user logs in with a username and it will still actually work like this. We can still log in with this user. So let's actually log out and I'll log in as Tim here. So we'll just do Tim at email.com and we'll just let the password autofill. So that works here. So that works at this point, but I also want to update the login form to say email instead of username. And I want to make sure that it's just more precise in the back end here. So in the login form, we'll just do login register and we'll just change this to, let's see. So in the form, that's the registration form. So we need to open up this container. We're just going to say email. So we want to prompt the user for the right name. We'll just say email. And again, the username was working because Django still sees the email as the user, the username value. So at this point, we'll just update the name. So we're sending an email back and we updated the label. So in the back end, we're just gonna go ahead and get the email value. And I'm just gonna go ahead and replace all of these. So email, and then we're gonna get the user by the email. So that has to be unique now. So we have the email here, the email updated here. This will now be email, email, and that should be it. So we just wanted to clean that up, make sure it looks a little bit better, and we'll just do Dennis at email.com and we'll log in. Okay, perfect, I'm logged in as Dennis now. I can see all this stuff right here, I can see my account. So that is gonna be it for the entire course. So go ahead and update all these sections. I notice a few things here, like if I go to create a room and if I hit cancel, well, it's gonna take me to this template. So just update that URL. These are little things here. Uh, update all the participants. So in the room here, we see participants. Update these values. Go ahead and make sure that the user has their name here, the profile picture, and just make sure all this is rendered out with things like the bio and so on, and make the customizations you need. So. I'm super excited. If you got this far, you finished the course, you probably learned a lot in this process and that's going to be it for this tutorial. I highly recommend you check out my full Django course, check out my YouTube channel. I have a lot of free content, a lot of premium content also on Udemy and on my own website. I'm so happy that you made it through this course and I hope to hear about this in the comment section. Let me know how this was.